Number one. My parents have lived in the same house for the past 25 years. I spent more than half my life living there. I'm 34 now, with children of my own, and currently living about an hour away, but I visit as much as I can. This story happened when I was 24. I had two children, and was going through a rough spot with my partner. As such, I was staying with my folks for a few months. My mum, dad, 19-year-old sister, and 26-year-old brother all lived there. I stayed in a bedroom with my kids. My sister had her own room, as did my parents, obviously. My brother was staying in a room in the basement. My mother is probably the sweetest and most honest woman you'll ever meet. Now, when I say she's honest, I mean that she hates lying. She's really bad at it, and she's just a very serious person. I can't tell you how many times I tried to get her to lie for me when I was growing up, and she just couldn't. Whenever she tried to lie to my dad about me getting suspended or caught smoking or whatever, her lying was always so horrible he never believed her. She always ended up telling him the truth. The reason I'm saying this is because my mum told me something that I know is true, simply because of how my mum is. One day, she and I were in the kitchen. I was talking to her about something while eating at the table. She was washing the dishes. I remember her looking over towards the den door. In the den is the door to the backyard. The stairs heading down to the basement are also in there. Back in the 80s, there was a fire in the den and half the basement. The man who lived there died. He was burned alive. His family ended up rebuilding the den and basement. The basement was pretty typical. Hard concrete floor and walls. It had two rooms. One we kept the washer-dryer in. The other had a big freezer and a small space. That was my brother's room. Anyway, I see my mum looking towards the den. She dropped her glass cup in the sink and just kind of stared. I asked my mum what was wrong. She quickly looked away and said, Nothing. I didn't think anything of it. That is, until a few days later. I entered the house and saw my mum praying on her deceased mother's rosaries. My parents aren't religious. My dad is an atheist, and though my mum is technically a Christian, she doesn't go to church or read the Bible. Rarely does she pray. To see her praying on my grandma's rosaries surprised me to say the least. Hey, you okay? I asked. My mum then smiled and said something to the effect of, you ever see anything in this house? I had told her no, which was true. I knew what she was getting at, but I'd never experienced any paranormal presences in my mum's house. Sure, it has its bumps and creaks, but what older house doesn't? I asked her why. She then told me what had been happening to her. She told me that she could smell matches every so often, especially when she was in the den or basement. No one smokes in our house. We aren't big on candles either, so it was kind of weird. What she told me next terrified me. She told me that she'd been seeing a man with burned, melted skin. No hair, skin just a glossy red and black. She said he had a hunch like back, like he walked bending over a bit. Said he was naked, but that she never saw any genitals. She just felt like it was a man. She told me she saw him sometimes. At first, she thought it was her mind playing tricks. The sightings happened almost immediately after we first moved in. She only saw him a couple of times throughout my childhood and teen years, but recently she had been seeing him more, and it wasn't just a brief out-of-the-corner-of-her-eye thing. He would stand in full view and just to look at her. She said maybe for a minute, but it felt like longer. She didn't know why he was showing himself more now. I didn't believe her at first. I was like, yeah, okay, mum. But she insisted, 
And then she started crying. I had to believe her. She asked me again if I had noticed anything strange, and again I told her no. After my mum told me this, I was very uncomfortable in that house. Every time my then eight-month-old baby would babble or stare at a wall, I thought she could see him. I believe in the paranormal, although I've never experienced anything personally. A few months passed, and my mum was still smelling matches, although she hadn't seen the burned man since that day in the kitchen. I started to forget all about it, and made plans to move into a new house with my partner. We had since reconciled. One night, my 19-year-old sister Megan had her friend Cassie over. I was in my room with my kids. My parents were reading in their bed, and Megan and Cassie were hanging out in Megan's room. I was laying in my bed, watching TV. Must have been around midnight. My kids were asleep. Then, I heard this scream. A scream that turned my blood cold. It sounded horrifying. I jumped out of bed and opened my door around the same time my mum and dad opened theirs. We looked over into Megan's room. Her door was open, and we saw Cassie sobbing hysterically, sitting in Megan's lap. Megan looked confused. She was stroking Cassie's hair, asking, What's happened? What's wrong? My dad went back into his room, assuming it was just girl problems. My mum went into Megan's room to talk to the girls. She shut the door behind her. I went to the kitchen and got a drink, then sat in the living room to wait for my mum. About twenty minutes later, my mum came out of Megan's room, shutting the door behind her. I asked her what happened. My mum sat next to me and told me this. Cassie was reading a magazine on Megan's bed, laying towards the foot. The position she was in, if she looked up, she was looking out into the hallway. She happened to look up. She said she saw a bloody-looking, melted, bald man dragging himself down the hallway. He was using his arms to pull his body and his legs down the hall. His legs and torso were dragging as he made his way to Megan's room. Cassie then screamed and jumped into Megan's lap. Megan saw nothing. My sister was very skeptical and laughed at Cassie, but she swore on her mother, who had recently passed away, that it was true. I remember the goosebumps I got after hearing that. I didn't even want to look down the hall. Megan's door opened and out came the swollen-eyed, tear-stained face of Cassie, with a coat and her backpack on. Her and Megan left, I assume back to her home. I never saw Cassie again. She refused to ever come back over. And that was it. I ended up moving a month later, and my mum saw the burned man no more. But what made me want to tell this story, though, is something that happened last week. I went to my parents to visit, and only my brother was there. Out of the blue, he says, Hey, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but I think there's something in the basement. I keep seeing flashes of red out of the corner of my eye. So, as of right now, I told my mum what my brother said, and those two are sharing their stories with each other. My mum never told anyone except me about the burned man. My plan is to do some investigating, look into the house and the previous owner who died in the fire. I wonder what he wants, why he only shows himself to certain people, and why he does it so sporadically. I'll make sure to thank him for not showing himself to me. Number 2 So, before we start, some background. I have a group of friends, and we've all known each other since kindergarten. There's four of us, me and three more guys. We're all 29 or 30 at the time of writing, and we're 28 or 29 at the time of the event. We're all really close, even though ever since college we meet up very rarely. 
All of us were in long-lasting and steady relationships, either married or the modern equivalent. That is, except for the main subject in this story, who had just come out of a pretty messy divorce. This friend, Andy, had been having a really rough time of life, as his ex-wife decided to leave him right as his mother was dying of cancer. So it was understandable that we were all a bit worried about him. Well, one of my friends has a pretty nice country house that's far away from civilization, far enough to allow for a nice weekend retreat every once in a while. At the start of this story, we had one of those trips scheduled. The week before, as we were all planning the retreat, Andy decided he wasn't going to go because he didn't want to be the only one without a significant other for the entire weekend. We all insisted, but we kind of understood his feelings, and since he had another event lined up during that weekend, we left it alone. Still, I wasn't really satisfied with that, as I felt he could really use the change of scenery, so I decided to give him a call on Saturday morning, right before I left for the country house, offer him a ride, and give him one last chance to show up. I called him from the door of my house, and he sounded kind of weird on the phone like he was sluggish or something. I even joked with him about it. It was kind of early, and I assumed I had just woken him up. He didn't laugh or anything, so I figured he was pissed. When I offered to pick him up and give him a ride, he simply replied, Okay. I told him to pack up a change of clothes and meet me in front of his house. Then off we went. It was me, the wife, and him in the car for a nice 45-minute drive. I started noticing things were off just as he got into the car. He was acting really stupid. I have no other way to put it. He didn't get any of the jokes, had trouble understanding simple questions, and kept replying with either a simple yes or no, or with a really slurred, short phrase at the most. At this point, me and the wife had every reason to be worried about him. We started thinking maybe he'd fallen into some weird state of depression or started doing drugs. He refused to acknowledge that anything was wrong with him, and so we simply drove on, hoping he'd maybe open up later on. So, we all arrived. There was food and drinks and video games. Yes, we get away from civilization to play video games, and since we'd all been friends for over 20 years, there was lots of fun to be had. It quickly became obvious to all of us that Andy wasn't acting right. He wasn't playing any games, wasn't talking at all, and spent most of the time just looking at us or outside. As time went on, I noticed he wasn't eating or drinking anything at all, and one of the guys swears that he kept tabs on Andy and never once saw him go to the bathroom the entire trip. We tried to get him to talk, but he'd just give the exact same response every time. I'm okay. He ended up winning the patience game, and so we all just left him to his own devices. The night went on. He sat on a bench outside, looking at a stretch of woods near the house. We all stayed indoors talking, and then we decided to sleep. Andy said he'd go soon, he just wanted to chill for a bit outside. We all let him be. The next morning, he was sitting outside, in the exact same place we left him, in the exact same position. And that was it. I was completely freaked out, and decided it was time to go back home. We packed our stuff and said our goodbyes. Everyone was really worried about Andy, but we all felt creeped out so we just called it a weekend and left. I drove him home, dropped him off, and went back home myself. Later that night, we ended up all meeting each other again in a restaurant for a birthday get-together of a common friend. I noticed Andy was being himself again, and my other two friends looked really puzzled. I sat down and asked him, Hey man, what the fuck happened yesterday? He replied with something like, yeah, my car broke down, and Peter here had to pick me up in the middle of the night after the bar. Well, that made no sense, and so we all started asking questions and trying to piece everything together. Turns out, he was at the bar with a couple of the other guys at the exact same time he was with us at the country house. 
when we kept insisting, in a kind of panic, that that was impossible. Multiple people showed us pictures of him at said event. Yeah, there were fucking pictures. So we all freaked out, and noticing that we weren't joking, Andy freaked out as well. We confirmed via phone history that his phone in fact got my call that Saturday morning, but he doesn't remember answering it. After this, the talk did continue, but we really couldn't get anywhere, and that was it. As the months passed by, the three of us all got really afraid of Andy and who he could be. We still have no idea who was with us at the house, and Andy has gotten really sick of hearing about this, to the point of getting really mad when the subject comes up. He says that the most rational explanation is that we all got confused and thought this up. I'm still nervous about that to this day, especially because I dropped him off at his home and saw him enter. Where the fuck did fake Andy go? Did he do anything while we were all asleep? Do any of you guys know anything like this? I asked around, and nothing really fits. I'm not really a believer in the paranormal, but I don't have any other explanation. I felt like writing this to get it out, as the other guys and my wife don't really like talking about it. It gets everyone real nervous. Number three. I'm not entirely sure whether you'd consider this strictly paranormal, but it's creepy and generally unsettling. Last week, I answered an Ask Reddit thread about the creepiest thing you'd ever seen driving. My story got unexpectedly popular. My inbox was assaulted for a couple of days afterwards, and everyone wanted to know the same thing. Where did this happen? I'll get to that, but first, I'll retell my story. Haven't posted here in a million years, but this seems like a good place to share this. A couple of friends and I drove into a horror movie once, totally by accident. It was either late November or early December, five or six years ago. I was deeply religious at the time and we were headed to one of those living nativity things, where they have actors pretend to be the Virgin Mary and Joseph, the wise men and all that, and they kind of put on a show outdoors. It was held at a Christian campground outside of a nearby city, and we didn't know the area very well, so we had someone give us directions. This was winter in the US, so it was already getting dark when we set out. We got to the area just fine, but we forgot the name of the exit we were supposed to take to actually reach the grounds. Luckily, the campgrounds had a big sign right next to an exit, so we assumed this was the way to go. We took this road and thought nothing of it. Crisis averted. The city next to these campgrounds is actually pretty large, and the exit we took is very close to a shopping district, so it wasn't like we started in the middle of nowhere. Very abruptly, however, this exit turned from civilization to deep woods. We figured, well, it's a campground, so that's about right, and we kept on driving. Pretty soon, we passed a clearing on the right. The clearing was maybe 50 foot, and then woods again. At the very edge of these woods was this huge stone gate with raw iron doors. It looked like a cemetery gate, but it didn't lead to a path or anything just more trees. Had no fence around it either, just the gate. We kept on going, remarking to each other that it was kind of creepy, but still, we didn't think much of it. It was starting to get foggy at this point. A little while later, we came to some houses. This is where things got weird. The first house was just a standard, white, suburban home, but in the driveway, which was very short, was a van with all its doors open. The hazard lights were on too, like the car was on, but nobody was in it or around it. The house was completely dark. We were a little nervous now, wondering if maybe something bad had happened, like an accident or something like that, 
and the driver of our car slowed down to look. Then, my other friend in the front pointed ahead. As it turns out, all of the houses in this street were like this, on both sides of the road. Lights out, cars in the driveways, all of the car doors open, and the hazard lights on. At this point, we're more than a little freaked out, thinking we've driven straight into Silent Hill, or a particularly mean prank if nothing else. Though it seems a little strange for there to just be a community-wide prank in the middle of winter, nowhere close to Halloween. We still haven't seen any people. For whatever reason, we continued to drive, maybe to get out of there faster. There was a little bend in the road, and the instant we started through it, this massive black dog, sort of a German shepherd looking thing, came out of nowhere and ran full tilt at the driver's side of the car. I'm still not sure if the dog actually made contact with the car, but if not, it came incredibly close. After charging us, it didn't retreat. It stayed in the road, barking its head off. Our driver did a quick U-turn, and we got out of there as fast as we could. Just ditched the nativity thing and never tried to go back. We found out when we got home and talked to the person who gave us directions that it wasn't even the right exit we were on. And now, several years later, we're not exactly sure which exit we took that night. All I know is I'm glad we chose to get out of there when we did. I don't want any part of what was going on over there that night. No thanks. Hi, pause. As I said, most people wanted to know where this happened, but I also got messages telling me it was obviously fake or that I made it up. That kind of grated on me, and I started to question it myself. I wondered if I'd somehow dreamed it up, or confused it with a movie or something, even though other people were there with me. So, Thursday this week, when I had to pass by that area again, I decided on a whim to go looking. I didn't have a certain time I needed to be anywhere, so I just popped down all the exits along that stretch. The first one just took me to a pretty normal little town. The next one was pay dirt. I'll go ahead and start by saying that some things are different from how I laid them out in the story. For example, it's not as heavily wooded as I recall, though there are still lots and lots of trees. I'll chalk that up to the passage of time and it being foggy and dark when the incident happened. Anyway, here's that gate I talked about. The wrought iron parts are gone, but I'm pretty sure I saw them in the brush nearby, dismantled. There does seem to be a road through it. Not sure if that was overgrown, or I just didn't see it before. I didn't see a house or any buildings. There's a rock face and trees back there, so I'm not sure where one would be. I'll assume that the name on the gate is the name of the property owners. Here's the house we first came to, the one that had the van in the driveway. It's actually right across from the gate, but otherwise it looks the same. Also, it's abandoned. Next to it is this even creepier abandoned house. Further up the road are more houses, many of which are empty or for sale. There's a bend in the road that isn't the one I described, but then, a little further on, is this one. That's where we got charged by the black dog. The hedges still look the same. As a side note, I encountered maybe two cars the whole time I was down there, which was roughly around 20 minutes. For being one exit past a town, this place is pretty secluded and empty. So, there you go. On one front at least, I didn't imagine this. The place is real, and I found it. It's just outside of Springfield, Ohio, if you take the Lower Valley Pike exit off of Route 4. I do ask that anyone who decides to go adventuring be respectful of the people who live there, and of the general property laws. Try going on a foggy night midwinter. Let me know what happens. Hi guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. Sorry there's been such a long gap between uploads recently, 
There's been a lot going on in life, uh, and needless to say, it's slowing me down a bit. But uh, hopefully things will get back on track very soon. I've also got a couple of uh, good video ideas in the works. Ones that I don't think have been covered in a while, if ever. So uh, yeah, we'll see how those play out. And leave any suggestions you might have for video ideas down below if you have any that are interesting, shall we say. Anyway, if you did enjoy this video, then please smash that like button or I'll smash you. And I'll be back again, hopefully very, very soon. Stay spooky, Lazy Legion. And remember, the best things happen in the dark. These stories and photographs have been collected from various threads on Reddit, where users have shared their own paranormal experiences. Some have also been submitted by subscribers. All of those who posted their experiences maintain they are 100% true. Number 1 I was a police officer when this happened. I had a call to a residence for a mental evaluation, or a 5150. Anyway, I get there, and I speak to a 50-something-year-old woman, who states that her 20-something-year-old son is under the influence of an unknown drug, and kept repeating that he can't go into his bedroom because there was an old man hanging in his room. She stated that she was too scared to go into his room and investigate it herself, because he constantly brings over friends that are drug addicts and is unsure if his claims were true or not. I then go and speak to the son, who is clearly under the influence of a stimulant. He goes on to tell me that he was told by a spirit not to enter the bedroom, because her father, dressed in his military Class A uniform, was hanging in his bedroom. I check the room out, and of course, there was no body hanging in the room. As I'm in the middle of explaining to the mother that there was no body in the bedroom, a veteran officer arrives at the scene to assist me. He pulls me aside, and stated that earlier in his career, he responded to this exact residence, and in that exact bedroom, he had to investigate a suicide by hanging of an older male subject. He couldn't remember all the details, so I looked it up in our report management system in my patrol car. And sure enough, the officer was correct. The subject who died was a World War II veteran, and had dressed in his military uniform before he hung himself. Number 2 A Reddit user took this photo of his uncle at the Grand Canyon, at a spot where both men were sure that they were alone. Neither the photographer nor the uncle noticed the man standing in the bushes until after the photo was developed. Here is an enhanced version of this image. The man appears to be unnaturally large, though this may just be the result of a forced perspective. This image isn't necessarily supernatural, and it could just be that the man was simply hidden in the bushes and neither of the other men noticed him. Either way, there's something extremely eerie about this photo, and even if this is an image of an ordinary man rather than a ghost, the photo captures a moment of profound vulnerability. What were his intentions? As one Reddit user puts it, I think it makes people uneasy, because all of us could be this vulnerable without ever knowing it. Number 3 One year, when I was younger, I was in Taiwan, and had travelled to a busy night market. These are very popular gatherings that usually operate in the evening. Nearby, I spotted a sign for a net cafe in a five to six storey tall building. Thinking I'd fire off some quick emails, I walked into the dark, small entrance of the building. The building was old, and hadn't been well maintained, but it's not out of the ordinary in Taiwan. The entrance just had a dark hallway that led to a small elevator. 
I press the elevator call button and enter. The elevator was uncharacteristically new compared to the rest of the building, but I didn't think too much of it. Like most Chinese buildings, there wasn't a fourth floor. It's considered bad luck, since four sounds like death in Chinese. So the elevator buttons just read one, two, three, five, six, which was usual. I looked for the floor that the net cafe was on. That was the sixth floor. I pressed the button. It lurched into action quietly and began the ascent. When it stopped, I figured it was my floor, so I instinctively began to step out. Right before stepping out, however, the sight outside the elevator stopped me. It was pitch dark, only lit by the light of the elevator. It appeared as if it hadn't been occupied for decades, with some random pieces of furniture covered with white cloths. It was a small building, so each floor was single occupancy. As such, I could see pretty much the entire floor from the elevator. Thinking I must have gotten the wrong floor, I checked the light which indicates which floor you're on. Strangely, there was nothing. None of the indicators were on, but the floor button to the net cafe was still lit, so I know I haven't gotten there yet. All this happened within a couple of seconds. That's when I noticed a figure moving in the distance of the floor. It wasn't very visible, but I could make out what looked like a person, dressed in some kind of gown, moving slowly towards the elevator. I was thoroughly creeped out, so I started pressing the button to close the door. As soon as I pressed it, the elevator light flickered off. I am this close to pissing my pants, and it's actually kind of freaking me out thinking back to it. The lights flickered back on in under a second, and the door closed. The elevator jolted back to life. A few moments later, and I was at the net cafe. I am beyond relieved at this point. I walk out immediately, and I sat down at a computer. After gathering my wits a bit, I walked over to the cashier's desk and I told them what I saw. The girl working there listened, and her face turned a bit ashen, so I asked her if she had heard of similar experiences. She told me that she's never experienced it, but some co-workers and occasionally customers have brought this up. Basically, the building has six floors, and the fourth floor had a history. Apparently, the floor used to be a hair salon of sorts, until one of the employees killed herself there. She slit her wrists over the hair wash station and died. The store continued operations, despite stories of weird appearances. A couple of people reported seeing someone's figure walking away in the mirror. Naturally, the business closed down a few months later. The building owner tried to re-rent the place out, but never had any luck. Most businesses are quite superstitious, and no one wanted to rent the fourth floor, especially after someone had died in it, even at a very cheap price. Finally, after dropping the price to nearly nothing, a stationary supply store wanted to rent. During the renovations of the store, however, several accidents would happen. Work supplies would end up in strange places, a mirror from the previous business shattered when no one was near it, and finally, a worker had his hand jammed in between the elevator doors when it closed on him unexpectedly. The workers refused to continue working there, and eventually, the business left, and the building owner finally gave up and shut down the floor. He then had the elevator company come in and replace the panel, so that the elevator could not go to the fourth floor. Let me repeat that. The elevator was programmed to never go to the fourth floor. It doesn't even have a button. But for some reason, sometimes when people take the elevator, it would go to the fourth floor, and the doors would open, and some, like myself, would see a figure walking around in the dark. Number four. My mum told me this story about my brother's encounter 
from when he was little. When we were young, we lived in Virginia. We lived in a medium-sized, two-story house, nothing fancy. We lived there for around three years. It would have been longer, if not for this. After about two years of living there, my brother came downstairs and said to my mum, Hey, mummy, who's the man upstairs? What man, she said. He took my mother upstairs to show her, but whoever it was was gone. He looked all over, and then said, Oh, I guess he had to leave. My mum dismissed this as a five-year-old's mind just making things up, or even just playing pretend. Here's when things started getting weird. My mother would hear him upstairs having a conversation. Now, it wasn't with me, because I wasn't allowed upstairs. I was so small, my parents were afraid that I would hurt myself if I wasn't watched over. Anyway, after a while, my brother eventually stopped talking about him. My mum, out of curiosity, asked him, Hey, Aiden, what happened to your friend? He said, Oh, he's not coming back. Why's that? my mum asked. Because Grandma Stone told him to leave us alone. This made my mum freak out. Why? Because my Grandma Stone died a week before my brother was even born. There's no way he could have known who she was. We later found out that behind our house in the field was a Civil War burial ground. We promptly moved after that. Number 5 I grew up in a small rural town in between mountains. A couple of years ago, they were tearing down an old elementary school. A guy my mum knew went in and took a few pictures with his cell phone. When he uploaded them, this was one of the pictures. I don't believe in stuff like this at all. I just really don't know how to explain this, since it was a cell phone picture, and I'm pretty sure no one in my small hometown knows how to make fake pictures. Number 6 So, I work in a sandwich shop. I was getting ready to close at 10pm, and I'm pretty meticulous about closing on time, because I'm usually ready to go home by then. Anyway, it's 9.55pm, and the bell rings, letting me know that someone has just come in the store. I grumble to myself a little because I'm tired, and I head to the front. This little boy, who must be about seven or eight years old, is standing in front of the counter. He's wearing this old-fashioned tweed jacket and a red baseball cap. I say, hello, what can I do for you tonight, like I usually do? He just stares at me, like I grew a second head. I stare back, confused. I have to use the restroom he says, and runs back to where the restrooms are. I hear the door squeal open and slam shut. At this point, I'm a little aggravated, because I'm getting ready to close, and I don't want to have to wait for this little brat whose parents couldn't even be bothered to come into the store with him. So, I start to close. I turn off the open sign, and I head to the back to do some quick dishes, thinking, I'll just lock the door behind the little boy when he leaves. I finish the dishes, and I start to put the food into the refrigerator. I'm starting to get pissed. All I have to do is put the food away, count the bread, and count the drawer. I finish all this, and still no little boy. I put on my coat and get ready to leave, gathering receipts and such. I go to knock on the door of the boy's restroom. Hey, I'm closing. You need to leave. Nothing. Hey, kid. Come on. Still nothing. If you don't at least answer me, I'm going to open the door. The lock was broken, so I knew I would be able to open it. I stood there, worrying that maybe something happened to him. I jiggle the handle until it opens. I kind of cover my eyes, because I didn't want to see the little boy on the toilet. I expected him to scream, or at the very least say something. When all there was was silence, 
I opened my eyes, and I looked into the restroom, which was the size of a small closet. There was no one, no sign of anything. The lid was still lifted from when I had cleaned it earlier. There was no trash in the bin either, nothing. I checked the girls' restroom, the entire lobby, nothing, and there is absolutely no way that he could have left. It's impossible, because I've worked there long enough that the doorbell is a Pavlovian response, and you can hear it clearly everywhere in the store. I went into work a little early the next morning, and I got my check. My close friend was there, and she and I talked for a little about her boyfriend and gossip that she had and whatever. Then she says, Dude, there was the creepiest little kid standing outside the front door this morning when I came in. I reply, Really? Yeah, he was just standing there, staring in the window. But when I went to open the door, he ran off. What'd he look like? I asked, trying not to freak out. Young boy, green coat and a red hat. Neither I nor anyone else has seen or heard from him since. Number 7 I was a kid when this happened. My uncle and I were finishing up chopping and gathering firewood for my grandmother because it was getting dark. Driving back on a dirt road at about 30 miles an hour, I had this awful sense of being watched. Before I could turn to look out of the passenger side window, my uncle quickly shouted, Don't. I completely froze. My heart felt like it was beating out of my chest, and then completely stopped when I heard a tapping on my window. My uncle sped up and was loudly praying in my native language. I didn't know what was going on, and I thought it was all over, until our truck suddenly dipped from the bed. My uncle then started saying, Look at me, and don't turn away. He kept saying that over and over. Then I heard it again. Tap. Tap. It was getting harder for me to breathe, and I wanted to cry. A minute or two passed, and the truck dipped again. My uncle looked around and sighed. It was quiet besides the truck on the road. He looked at me, and then, in Navajo, said, We'll ask your father to do a prayer in the morning, so the evil will forget our faces. I remember curling up on my seat, and just staring at the radio watching the time, and listening to my uncle sing an old prayer until we got to my grandmother's house. To this day, my uncle has never talked about it. Any type of window tapping still scares the shit out of me. Hi guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed these ghost stories. I had quite a few of them stored up, so I just thought I'd share a few of them. I know I don't usually do paranormal theme stories, but it's, it's fun to delve into that sometimes. Anyway, don't forget to check out Anthony's artwork, and I'll have another video for you guys on Saturday, which will be Halloween themed again. Stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark. I won't be using my name, or revealing exactly where I live, in case this comes back to bite me. But I will say this took place in California. Not so long ago now, I started using this site that catered to pretty much every fetish you can think of. Some obviously more popular than others. But if you could think of it, there were probably at least a few people in the community who were interested in it too. I came across a lot of these different groups on the site. S&M, that's a given. 
guys who got off to girls stuck in fake quicksand. That one I'll never understand. Adults pretending to be babies, eyeball licking, vor, sex with the elderly, sex with clowns, and of course, the dreaded furries. The one that really tickled my pickle though was leather. I ended up meeting a girl on the site who was into the same thing, and we actually met for coffee. It went well. So well, in fact, that we met up for a few drinks later that week. Her name was Zoe. She looked a little older in real life than in her pictures, but that's usually the case, and she was still very much my type. During the second date, I noticed this table of four guys who kept staring over at the two of us. I mentioned this to Zoe, but she didn't seem to think it was a big deal. They looked a little rough around the edges, but I put it to the back of my mind. Anyway, we both ended up getting a little drunk, and she offered for me to go back to her place. Frankly, I was too far gone at that point, and wouldn't have been able to do anything even if I wanted to. So, to her surprise, I actually declined. She seemed aggravated by the fact I said no. I guess she just thought all guys said yes to an invitation like that. In hindsight, she got a bit too angry about the whole thing, but she cooled off pretty quickly and I selectively forgot about it. The glory of alcohol. In all honesty, I was surprised that this fetish website had led to me sort of dating a girl. I figured it would all be about hookups and one night flings. But Zoe and I actually organized a third date. I sent her a message about getting dinner, but she messaged me saying we should skip it and get straight to the drinks. Alright, fine by me. The night started well enough. I arrived late, but Zoe looked particularly happy to see me. You smooth dog, I thought to myself. She was wearing a pair of tight leather pants. Very nice, if I do say so myself. I planned on pacing my alcohol consumption better that night, expecting another invitation from Zoe to head back to her place. I didn't plan on whiskey dicking two times in a row. I order a beer and drink it slowly. Around ten minutes in, I spot those same four guys from last time over in the corner. I'm sure it was them. This was a completely different bar in a different part of town. Could have just been a coincidence, but I didn't like the way they kept throwing the occasional glance our way, just like the time before. Sometimes you just know something isn't right, and this was one of those times. I mentioned it again to Zoe, and we shared a laugh that those guys must be stalking us or something. We chat and flirt for around an hour, when I start to feel a little lightheaded. That's strange. At this point, I've barely drunk anything. This woozy feeling intensifies little by little, and I start to realize something's wrong. I excuse myself, and by the time I make it to the bathroom, the stalls are spinning. I fumble my way inside one of them, and force myself to vomit in the toilet. I knew what had happened. I'd been drugged. But when, and with what? I managed to call the only person I knew would help me without question, my pal Jeff. Slurring my words, I'd tell him the bar name and say I need an evac pronto. I count my lucky stars that I made that call when I did, because a few minutes later, I was so far gone I don't remember a thing. Jeff relayed to me what happened next. When Jeff arrived, I was being carried out of the bar by Zoe and some random guy. Neither appeared concerned. They were more like determined, on a mission. According to Jeff, they led me over to a van where a few other guys were waiting and were preparing to put me in the back of it. When he described the guys to me as best he could, I knew who he was talking about. Those same rough-looking guys who had been staring at Zoe and I the entire evening and the time before. These hadn't been a set of dates, they'd been a set of traps. 
Zoe and the glancers were in cahoots. That explains her anger on the second meetup. She must have told those guys where she was going to take me, and was planning on leading me into an ambush. This time, she wasn't taking any risks, and wanted to make sure I went along with them. She must have spiked my drink when I went to the bathroom or something. The bitch. Jeff gets out of the vehicle and rushes over, telling them he knows exactly what's going on and that he's going to call the police. He took their license plate number and pictures of the whole group with his phone. A couple of the guys start to get aggressive towards him, and Zoe's there screaming at him to fuck off, but Jeff manages to keep his cool. When a couple of late night passers-by come along, the group lost their nerve and dumped me in the middle of the road, leaving it to Jeff to scoop me up and get me to a hospital. They took off in the other direction. I woke up in the morning with the worst headache of my life, but other than that, I was going to be fine. I gave the cops as much information as I could about Zoe, but they couldn't find a trace of her on the site, and nothing ever came of it. Knowing Jeff, I'm sure he made it sound more heroic than it really was, but I have to be honest, he really saved my ass that night. I mean, what would have happened to me if he arrived just one or two minutes later? Jeff thinks human trafficking, but I'm not so sure that happens to guys all too often. I guess it's a possibility. Another friend of mine thinks they wanted to make a snuff movie. In theory, it could have been any number of things, especially when you consider they found me through a fetish website. Personally, I don't like to think too much about it. Guys, I think I fucked up. I could use some advice. It all started when I broke up with my ex one year ago. Her name was Haruka. Haruka was really kind, which was why I started dating her in the first place. But she was also really pessimistic, and as such, it was no fun to hang around with her. She was the kind of low spirit that made everyone around her depressed too including me. You know the type of person I'm talking about. I think she had a borderline personality disorder. I only really noticed her weird traits when we started dating. Every time I'd finish talking on the phone, she'd keep asking me whom I'd been talking to. If ever I didn't respond straight away, she'd ask me over and over again, and wouldn't stop querying me until I answered. Most times I said it was my parents, and it really was. I could see it in her eyes that she didn't really believe me though. During the weekends, it was a given that I would have to spend my time with her. I'm talking every minute of it. When I was away from town due to work, she'd call me up every hour on the hour. She'd also request evidence that I'd actually been at work. Essentially, Haruka was a control freak. She made sure I had no privacy whatsoever. I think she would have controlled the way I shit and piss if she had the chance. She also started saying really disturbing things to me. Things like, If you ever leave me for another girl, you know that I'd kill you, right? I realized that this wasn't normal, but I was still in love with her at the time. At one point, though, I decided enough was enough. I went to see her parents without telling her to try and sort out her problem, but before I could even discuss it with them, they started saying things like, Our daughter's been really depressed over the past few years. She's been in such a bad place ever since she was dumped by her last boyfriend. I'm glad she managed to find a good young man like you. She's in a much better place now. I hadn't even seen her laughing until these past few months. Thank you so much. Her mother was seriously in tears before I could bring it up. It was surreal. I ended up saying everything was fine, and left with a newfound enthusiasm to make it work with her. But it didn't last. Her need for control got worse as the days passed by. Towards the end, 
any conversation with other girls became completely forbidden. When I mentioned I was arranging a work get-together with some female colleagues, she deleted their phone numbers off my phone. Even casual greetings with neighbours was disallowed if they were a female. At restaurants, if the person bringing out the menus was a waitress, Haruka would be the one to order. She wouldn't even let me look in the girl's direction. I couldn't do this anymore. It didn't matter if she had come from a bad place or not. This just wasn't how human beings were meant to live. I think I would have gone mad if I stayed with her any longer. I went to Haruka's apartment early one weekend. Maybe you'll think I'm a freak when I say this, but I actually scripted out how I was going to break the news to her. I made sure the breakup would be as kind as possible. I sighed a breath of relief when I finished talking. I looked up to see her staring at the floor. I couldn't see the expression on her face at all. Not wanting to make her cry, I turned to leave with an, I'm really sorry. But as I got up, she suddenly reared her head upwards and with a massive shriek shouted, How dare you? Her face had contorted into a devilish sneer. It wasn't sadness in her eyes at all. It was fury. She looked at me as though she was looking at a cockroach, her contempt for me as clear as day. Before I had a chance to even open my mouth, she grabbed hold of my shirt and threw me to the ground with an almost otherworldly strength. She then ran off into the kitchen, shrieking all the way. Terrified and lost for words, I bolted out of the door, leaving my shoes behind, all the while hearing her shout things like, You don't deserve to live, you disgusting degenerate. I'm going to cut your fucking throat. And the ever-reliable, if I can't have you, no one can. I realized that the situation was dire. She had entered the kitchen to fetch herself a weapon. She most likely just wanted to threaten me, but of course I couldn't be sure. Biting my lips in the hallway, I waited for the elevator doors to open. But as they were about to, with a soft groan, I saw Haruka burst out from her room just ten meters away. Her door opened with such speed and force, it was almost as if she had broken right through the damn thing without opening it. The intensity in her eyes. She was like a woman possessed. As soon as I saw that, I knew that she didn't simply want to threaten me with the knife in her hand. She really did want to slit my throat. Crying out in shock, I left the elevator and stumbled for the stairs to my left. Her apartment was on the fifth floor, but I had no choice. She would have killed me if I waited there for the elevator to open. I know that much for certain. I ran down the stairs as fast as I could, but somehow her voice behind me seemed to be getting louder and louder. Screams of, I'll kill you, mixed in with unintelligible shouting. I got to the ground floor and was about to bolt for my car when I stopped. I looked behind me and back at my car. In a split-second decision, I instead hid behind the shadow of the stairs and waited for her. A decision that, to this day, I believe saved my life. Instinctively, I realized that by the time I got to my car, opened the door and turned on the ignition, I would have been pounced on. She had been catching up with me and I could tell by the volume of her screams that she was only one floor away. So, terrified, I waited. I heard the screams and thumping of feet getting louder and louder. I bided my time, and wished with all my heart that this plan would work. I then jolted my leg forward in front of the stairs. I felt my leg connect with her shin with a painful crack. With a yell of surprise, she tripped, or more accurately, flew into the air in front of her. 
She crashed face first into the ground with a resounding thud, which seemed to echo around the foyer. My god, I didn't think she'd fall into the trap that well. She must have really lost her mind. So much so that she wasn't paying much attention to her surroundings. I quickly shuffled to the safety of my car and peered at her cautiously. She was still on the ground. Maybe I should call an ambulance, I thought to myself. I could see her moving, however, and I distinctly saw other doors opening as the neighbours peered out to see what the commotion was. No doubt that if she told them what happened, they'd now take her side. Honestly, I didn't want to have anything to do with her at that stage. I just wanted her out of my life as soon as possible. I know it was a dick move, but I left her there. I drove to the entrance and floored it. I moved apartments after that. I told all of my colleagues at work not to give my new address away to anyone, and explained the full details of what had happened. I didn't notify the police, though. I was afraid she might sue me for what I had done, or even press criminal charges of her own. No doubt I'd come away looking like the bad guy, but you have to believe me when I say I know she would have killed me in that building if given the chance. Anyway, all's well that ends well, right? Wrong. A few days ago, I got a letter in the mail. There was nothing written on the envelope, and there was no stamp. It was clear that someone had posted the letter by hand. I opened the letter to find a single, folded piece of A4 paper. On it was only one sentence. I will always be waiting for you. At the bottom was a kiss mark in red lipstick. And there it is. She's found me. What do you think I should do? Was that letter a threat? A promise? I know it's her, and I'm scared. When I was about 12, my great-uncle John came from Ukraine to visit us in Canada. He had a lot of stories, but this was the one that stood out. In the late 1960s, John was travelling by train from his village to another to visit family. He had to change trains at one point, and was dropped off at what amounted to a platform and a hut in the middle of nowhere. There was no one else at the station and other than a dirt road that led off into the surrounding woods, there was nothing there. He waited for some time, but no train came. It was winter, and getting colder and darker, and just about the time he started worrying about having a place to stay and some food to eat, an old woman appeared out of the twilight. She asked if he was waiting for such and such a train, and when he said he was, she said it wouldn't be along until the following day. She asked if he needed a bed for the night, and offered him a meal and a room at her place, which she said was about an hour's walk from the station. Lodging with locals was more or less the standard when travelling in this part of the USSR, and Great Uncle John wasn't looking forward to a hungry night on a cold platform, so he was glad to accept her offer. He took his suitcase, and they set off together down the dark road into the forest. It was more than an hour away, more like two, and by the time they arrived at the woman's small two-story house, John was tired and hungry. They went inside, and the woman lit some oil lamps and warmed some borscht for them. It was the first time John was able to see the woman clearly and he was a bit startled to realize that the old woman was actually a man. Not wanting to pry, and too tired to care, John finished his soup and asked where he would be sleeping. She led him up the stairs to a tiny room with a window that contained a single bed and nothing else. He thanked her, they said goodnight, and she closed the door. Then she locked it leaving him in the dark. Somewhat creeped out by this, 
Zhang called to her, but she didn't answer, and he heard nothing. Figuring he would deal with it in the morning, and that she had probably done it by mistake, John set his suitcase down and laid on the bed, deciding to make the best of it and get some sleep. Before he could fall asleep though, he felt the urge to pee, and got out of bed, hoping to find a chamber pot or something he could pee in. He got onto his hands and knees, and began to feel under the bed in the darkness, thinking that's where the pot would be if there was one. Instead, he found a body. Great Uncle John went right to the window to see if he could exit the room that way. It was nailed shut. He knew that if he remained in the room, he was probably a dead man. But if he broke the window and tried to get out that way, there was a good chance that the old woman, and who knows who else was there, would hear him and come into the room before he could get away. So he did the only thing he could do. He pulled the body from under the bed, heaved it onto the mattress, and covered it with the blanket. Then he got under the bed and waited. Sure enough, about an hour later, he heard footsteps coming slowly up the stairs, and then towards the room. The lock clicked, and the knob turned slowly. In the gloom, John saw someone move towards the bed. He heard several terrific and sickening thuds. The person had bashed the body on the bed with a large crowbar, which they had then dropped on the floor right in front of John. There was silence. Then the person went out of the room, and the door was shut again. The footsteps went down the stairs, and then once more, silence. John moved out from under the bed, took the crowbar, and was able to slowly pry the window open. He didn't say, but I imagine he was shitting bricks the entire time. When the window was up, he threw his suitcase out, then dove through himself, not caring what was below him, only worried about what was behind. He landed without too much injury, and began to run into a field behind the house, towards some lights in the far distance. It turned out to be a highway, with some military and transport trucks on it, and John was able to get a ride to another village where he could catch a train. He didn't bother reporting what happened to the authorities, since at that time in the USSR, there was a distinct chance he would be the one who got into trouble. He just thanked God that he escaped, and decided that the next time he travelled to visit relatives, he'd take another way. Hidden away in the rich part of town is my cafe. The luscious interior of the cafe, along with the relaxing jazz music that we play, make this a popular joint for students and housewives with too much free time on their hands. There's even a terrace, which is often filled with people reading books, chatting and drinking coffee. Sometimes something a little stronger. It was November, and a trio of young girls entered the cafe. They'd been allowed to leave school early due to finishing their midterm exams that day. They were complaining about how they went. Well, this is shit. Jesus, I'm gonna have to repeat a year. Oh, come on, you couldn't have done that badly. I've never heard of a student repeating a year at 14. A fresh batch of squabbling ignited, fueled by the stress of exams and the annoying air of confidence one of the girls was giving off. She was obviously the smarter of the bunch. The nattering subsided after ten minutes, and eventually, the girls settled on a new topic of conversation. Namely, what schools they were planning to progress to. In the Japanese schooling system, high schools are commonly split between Chugaku, which is lower secondary, and Kou Kou, upper secondary. What Kou Kou you attend can greatly affect your chances of getting into a good university. Still eavesdropping in on their conversation, the two, well, less gifted students, started teasing the smarter one, telling her how the best school in the district, 
the one she would likely be going to, was haunted. The rumour was a famous one. Apparently, after a student committed suicide at the school, other pupils started to die horrible deaths on the school premises. Witnesses often swore that they saw the dead student at the scene of the crimes. What a load of shit. It wasn't uncommon that people claim places where suicides occurred were haunted. In fact, in Japan, you can find an apartment at a comparatively cheaper price if uh, misfortunes occurred there. Losing interest, I was about to turn away and tend to my duties, when I heard a shout. Now wait just a minute, the voice said. Turning towards its source, I realized it was one of the ladies sitting on the opposite end of the cafe. The woman left her book on the table and walked over to the three young girls. Sitting down with a grunt, she scratched at her long dark hair rigorously. For that brief interval, everything in the cafe seemed to revolve around this little strange woman in a red dress. Then she opened her mouth to speak. I am sick and tired of all of these lies about my old school being haunted. If you three would be so kind as to stop spreading such idiotic rumours, I'd be more than happy to tell you what actually happened there. I couldn't help but listen in to this whole story from behind my counter. I was just as interested in finding out the truth behind the rumours as these three young girls. The story itself wasn't about this quirky woman in the red dress though. It was about another girl that she knew at the school called Akasuki. For the purposes of this video, I'll retell the story I overheard from Akasuki's perspective. I have an older twin sister. I sometimes get asked things like, do you feel pain when your sister gets hurt? Do your parents get confused between the two of you? Stuff like that. People seem to have this idea that twins are connected somehow on a deeper level, more so than regular siblings. But not us two. We didn't hate each other per se, but we didn't really care for one another either. We never argued talked, or interfered with each other's affairs. We might as well have been thin air to each other. Now, my sister was much more able than me when it came to, well, pretty much anything. Athletics, academics. Okay, it wasn't like she was miles ahead of me, but she was always slightly better. Even when the difference was so small, from a young age I was constantly deemed as the less able one. Sometimes even the simpleton. During childhood, my arsehole parents would always say things like, Your sister can already ride her bike. Why can't you? I probably learnt it about 20 minutes after her, but this small amount might as well have been the difference between heaven and earth. If I scored 95% on a math test, I never got a pat on my back from the teacher, or even just a reassuring, well done. No. I'd be sitting by myself with my paper, staring at my sister, being championed by the class for getting 98%. But then again, I didn't really envy my sister, and she didn't brag about being better. Like I said, we were pretty much just heir to each other. As implied by my past grades in school, we were both top of the league. There were times where our exam results were first and second in the whole school, so it was only natural that we ended up going to the same high school. That was the best high school in the district. Our relationship didn't change during high school. I actually enjoyed it there, but only for the first semester. Even in a school full of students who scored top grades, there were bullies and rebels. Problem was, these bullies were smart. Whenever they carried out their evil deeds, they'd make sure it wouldn't be found out by their peers or by faculty members. Even when they were found out, they generally got off the hook due to their excellent grades. Because obviously, straight A students can't be evil, can they? It started when I came back from the summer break. The bullying, that is. For some reason, they started paying attention to me at school. I don't know what I'd done, but there was nothing that I could do. 
During lunch or after school, they'd come to my classroom. Then they'd take me to some inconspicuous location and punch me, kick me, hit me. Like I said, they were clever. They made sure to avoid bruising my face or arms. There were five bullies in total. One of them was a girl with chestnut-coloured hair who just watched as three others pummeled me senseless. She just pointed and laughed while giving the other girls orders. She was obviously the leader. There was also one other girl who came along to watch the show. My sister. It didn't make sense to me. My sister hated these types of girls just as much as I did. After ignoring each other for so long, why would she try and break me now? I'd only known the friends I'd made at the school for three months. As soon as they found out I was being attacked by the rogues of the school, they almost immediately stopped hanging out with me, fearful that they'd be targeted simply for associating with me. In the end, I found myself alone at school. The violence continued for months and months. They started getting more creative in the ways they'd hurt and humiliate me. The worst days were when their chestnut-haired leader was in a bad mood. Sometimes I was stripped naked and thrown into a pond. When I fell to my knees out of breath, she'd grab me by the hair and pull me up to my feet. Not yet, Chestnut would say, and the violence would continue. All the while, my sister would be staring at me coldly, without a flicker of emotion on her face. It was as if she was staring at a rat or a cockroach. I couldn't tell what she was thinking. I thought about telling my parents, but they already had plenty to worry about with their work. Besides, they'd almost certainly take the side of their favoured daughter. My sister must have started bullying me in the first place because she knew I wouldn't talk. There was nothing I could do about the situation. If I told my teachers, there was a chance the bullying would just get worse. It was possible the teacher would think I was lying particularly considering that the bullies were perfect students during lessons. There was absolutely nothing, nothing that I could do. Every day when I got home, I'd desperately try and clean the bloodstains off my shirt before my parents came home. I sobbed as I furiously rubbed my shirt. What had I done to deserve this? One time, while I was scrubbing, I heard my sister coming up the stairs. She must have got back from her part-time job early. I pictured her face, cold as ice, staring at me as the bullies beat me over and over again. How could it be that she was enjoying her life at school so much when I was in this state? She was part of the tennis club, had a part-time job, and lots of friends. Why did my life have to be so terrible? We were twins. I ended up hating my sister more than the other bullies, simply because she was enjoying her life so much. The violence just kept on intensifying. One time I nearly died from drowning, because I was just too tired and injured to resist as they dunked my head underwater. I was tired. I could only think of one way out. I began my preparations. I wrote a note with just four words. Mum, Dad, I'm sorry. Slowly, step by step, I walked up the stairs of the school. Nobody was allowed to be there after 9pm, so there were no teachers or other students around. But since I knew the school well, it wasn't difficult to break inside. I finally got to the top of the stairs. There was a metal door leading to the rooftop. I swung it wide open. It was winter at this point, and a cold breeze hit me straight away and chilled me to the bone. There was a full moon, and I could clearly see the whole rooftop area. My sister was already there, just as I had asked her to be, waiting with her back to the door. I hadn't expected her to come. She was leaning on the rails of the roof, staring down at the school grounds below. I walked towards her. I wanted to talk to you in private, 
I figured school would be the best place. Surprisingly, my sister replied straight away. I guess. This was the closest thing we'd had to a conversation for as long as I could remember. I stepped closer to my sister as she continued to talk. So, what did you want to talk about? Without hesitation, I threw myself at her. She had her back to me, and I caught her completely off guard. My sister flew into midair and fell downwards off the roof. Down and out of sight. After seeing the suicide note that I'd placed in my sister's room, nobody suspected foul play. My sister hardly ever spoke to anyone, hardly ever laughed. It seemed perfectly plausible that she had been depressed and taken her own life. That was the beauty of my plan. Maybe with my sister gone, the four other bitches who'd been making my life hell would now lose interest in tormenting me. If that happened, I'd finally be able to get on with my life go back to being a normal student again. From the time of my sister's death and her funeral, it had already been a few weeks. Feeling nervous, I stepped back into my classroom. All of my classmates ignored me, except for one girl, the leader of the bullies, the girl with chestnut hair. She smiled and winked at me. Hey, are you alright? She asked. I was taken aback by this display of compassion from her. Although my heart was now beating faster than it ever had, I made sure not to show it. I remained expressionless. I'm fine. It's not like I cared about her. Even though I said this, I had been feeling extremely remorseful. Yes, we were like heir to each other, but she had been my twin sister. The bully nodded and smiled again. Hey, that's great. So you're gonna find a part-time job now, I guess. That was strange. Why was she talking about a part-time job all of a sudden? I couldn't hide my surprise, and she laughed when she saw my confusion. <laughs> what? Did you think we'd take pity on you? If you want us to stop, you're gonna have to make a contract, just like your sister did. What the hell was she talking about? The bully looked genuinely surprised that I didn't know what she meant, that my sister had never told me what she had done. She really never told you, huh? <laughs> we were bullying your sister at the start. Had nothing to do with you. We only stopped fucking with her because she agreed to pay us off, and told her we'd find a new victim instead. Oh, I still remember her face when we said we'd picked you. She told me how much I'd have to pay her and her lackeys to stop this torment. Then she patted me on the shoulder, and with another wink said, Good luck from today. We've already found a new target instead of you, provided you pay us on time, that is. Now I understood everything. Why the girls had started to bully me when I hadn't even met them before. Why my sister was always with them why my sister had been leaning against the rooftop rails with her back to me, as if she was asking me to push her. Maybe she had been in greater pain than me all along. In that moment, I blanked out. Next thing I remember, I'm being hauled into a police car by two armed cops. I was absolutely covered in blood. The human body is a very fragile thing, it's amazing the damage you can do to somebody with just one pen. And that was the story of Akasuki, as told by the woman in the red dress. I couldn't help but interrupt the story as I brought her another cup of coffee. How did she know all of this? It turned out that the woman in red had been a friend of Akasuki's, at least before she started getting bullied. To avoid unnecessary trouble, she had stopped hanging out with her, but after she found out what had happened, she felt extremely guilty. Akasuki had been placed in a psych ward after being deemed mentally unstable. The woman in red paid her a visit, and heard the whole story from Akasuki's own mouth. The woman sipped at her coffee. Ever since that incident, all reports of bullying were taken extremely seriously. 
and anyone bound to be a bully was punished severely. But anyway, my whole point is this. It's stupid to say that the school's haunted. With a pale face, one of the young girls pointed out that what had happened there was as good a reason as any for the school to become haunted. I had to agree. This was one of the most gruesome tales I'd ever heard in my life. But to that, the woman simply snapped. If you ask me, what Akasuki did was perfectly natural, given what happened at least. I mean, wouldn't you have done the same in her shoes? This is my parents' story, and it took place in Colorado many years ago, back before I was even born. They're both natives, and have always been a very superstitious pair. That might just have saved their lives that night. They were traveling along Million Dollar Highway through Red Mountain Pass after a long road trip. It was around 2 or 3 a.m., and my dad was behind the wheel while my mum slept in the passenger seat. They both knew the road well, and dad was driving cautiously. The road is notoriously dangerous for its lack of guardrails and sheer steep drops over the edge. At one point, dad nudges my mum awake. There's something not quite right about the road up ahead. After letting her eyes adjust for a moment, she too could see that the road ahead was different than usual. After having driven that road so many times, they both knew that the sharp left curve they were fast approaching was going the opposite way it should have been. This part of the road was meant to curve right around the mountain. Always had, always would. Even the sign they just passed said so. Neither of them knew what to say as they approached the bend in the road. They both rubbed their eyes, but they're not seeing things. The road really is turning left, not right. But that was impossible. The silence was killing them, and as they reached the point of no return, Mum screamed to turn right instead. She needn't have bothered, as Dad was already spinning the wheel in that direction knowing that was how the road was supposed to go. As he turned, the actual road seemed to appear before them, just how it had always been. The road that turned left was now just gone, as if it had never been there to begin with, and all that was left in its place was a sheer drop. Had they followed the illusionary road they both saw, they would have plunged over the side of the mountain. Dad maintains that this was some sort of trickster trying to force them off the side of the cliff and in to an early grave. This took place back in the summer of 2014 when I was 25 years old. I live in Germany, and at the time I had just become interested in BDSM. Basically, the whole whips and chains deal. It's not for everyone, but more people are into it than you'd think. Something like 20% of people fantasize about it. So, if you have four other friends, chances are one of you is a secret sadomasochist. If it isn't you, then you can have some fun speculating about which of your pals it might be. The problem for me at the time was that it's not the easiest thing to experiment with. Especially when you're not in an established relationship. I don't think there's any smooth way to bring it up on a date or with girls at the bar. Unless it's some sort of sex bar or something like that. That's when I had the bright idea to become a member of a fairly well-known BDSM website. Just so I could finally chat about the subject with other like-minded people. And who knows, maybe see where things went from there. It was a surprisingly positive experience right off the bat. Everyone I chatted to was so friendly and welcoming. And I have to tell you, I learned more than a thing or two that doesn't bear repeating here. Like I said, I talked to quite a few people on the site. But one stood out. 
a redhead with a username that translates into Mistress Honey. She messaged me about two weeks into me becoming a member, saying that I was just her type and that she wanted to get to know me better. Scrolling through her photos, I was pleasantly surprised. Rocking body, pretty face, and from the thing she'd type, kinky as all hell. Jackpot. Over the course of a day or two, Mistress Honey told me that her real name was Yasmin, and that she thought I'd make a perfect subordinate. Someone she could dominate in the bedroom. Well, I don't know about you guys, but to me that sounded pretty good. Just what I was into. But I confessed that I wasn't really experienced with the whole BDSM thing, and since she seemed like she'd been around the block a few times, I might not be what she's looking for. She seemed to be really understanding, and eager to teach me all she knew. It genuinely was quite surprising how all the sadomasochists were actually really nice and welcoming, at least online. I tried to organize a meetup between the two of us, but she was either never available or had to cancel last minute. She suggested one night that I should go over to her place for a night of fun instead skip the pleasantries, and get straight down to business. In hindsight, it was a stupid idea, but I replied to her message, asking for her address. I knew she lived close by, but didn't know exactly where. She sends it over, and it's only a 30 minute drive away. Perfect. Not so far as to be impractical, but far enough that if it goes awkwardly, it's not like I'm going to bump into her in the streets afterwards. I message her back, saying that I'll be at her place in the next hour or so. She replied with a winky face. Hopping in my car and tapping her details into my GPS, I'll admit that I was a little bit nervous about the upcoming encounter. Not because I foresaw trouble or anything, but because, honestly, it had been a while since I'd last been with a woman, and now I was diving headfirst into a world of latex. Still, I guess this was sink or swim time. And besides, she was going to be the dominant one during the course of the evening, which had to be the harder job in practice, right? All I had to do was enjoy a little whipping, a bit of handcuff burn, and just enjoy the ride. This and other thoughts were swirling in my head as I drove the route highlighted on the machine, until I was nearing my destination. It was a lot more rural than I had first anticipated. I carefully drove down this thin, country road, engulfed by trees so thick they blocked out all of the moonlight, my headlights the only thing illuminating my path. You have reached your destination. I pulled up outside this tatty-looking farmhouse. Now, this really wasn't what I was expecting. It was so secluded and abandoned-looking. There was still a fair amount of distance from my vehicle to the house, so still time to pull out. But something compelled me to stay. No prizes for guessing what that thing was. A three-letter word ending in X. A light was on in what I presumed was the bedroom, the top right window of the house. Looking up, I saw that the window blinds were parted ever so slightly, and a pair of female eyes were peering down at me through the slats. Well, she knows I'm here, I figured. Can't turn back now. Checking my phone one last time, she had dropped me a message, saying that the door was open and to just come on inside. Like all her messages, he had ended in that winky face. Against my better judgement, I stepped out of the car and approached her front door. Sure enough, it was open, and with a push, I stepped into the small entranceway. It was almost pitch black inside. I could barely see a damn thing. Immediately, I was hit by the faint smell of latex. Whoa, she really was hardcore into this stuff. Not knowing whether it was breaking the roleplay immersion or not, I called out to Yasmin. 
silence. Uh, Yasmin? I called out again, a little louder this time. Still, nothing. I fondled the wall in search of a light switch, but couldn't seem to find anything. Was she expecting me to just head to the bedroom right away? I paused, and stood motionless for a moment, listening intently for any signs of movement in the house. From what I could tell, there was a slight moaning coming from upstairs. My mind was running wild with what she might be doing up there. Using the phone in my pocket as a light source, I slowly made my way up the stairs with trepidation, up to where I believed Yasmin was. I reached the top of the stairs. To my left, the hallway was completely black, and could have gone on forever for all I could tell. To my right was the door to Yasmin's bedroom, light seeping out from a crack in the slightly open door. This was definitely where the sounds were coming from, a tad louder now, and strangely distorted. I composed myself, let out an excited breath, and walked into the room. As soon as I entered, I knew I had made a massive mistake. By the window, strategically positioned, was a cardboard cutout of a female, made to look as if it was peering out of the window shades. The walls were covered in magazine pages, calendars, and cutouts of scantily clad or naked women. All that was in the room was a massive bed, large straps and chains attached to the posts, a large camera on a tripod aimed at it. Next to it, a table, holding a various selection of tools, ranging from sex toys to knives and other blades. The moaning was coming from a porn movie, playing on a television set. What the actual fuck was this? Certainly not what I'd signed up for. I jumped like someone had lit a candle up my arse and one eighty'd. As I left the bedroom and made for the stairs, I looked down the world's darkest hallway dead ahead of me, and stopped dead in my tracks. Frozen to the spot, I noticed something I hadn't when I first glanced down there before. The outline of a figure. A male figure, hiding in the darkness and creeping closer. No, not one. Two. There were two people in the shadows. One standing upright, the other crawling on its knees. I could just about make them out now that they were closer to the light seeping out of the bedroom. As I stopped and stared at them, they both froze too. Who the fuck's there? I shouted. A thick male voice replied with one word. Yasmin. I bolted down the stairs and out the front door at lightning speed, praying not to fall on my way to the car, and that there were no other surprises waiting for me outside. In what felt like a heartbeat, I was there and scrambling for my keys. I opened the driver's side door and threw myself in, flicking on the headlights and preparing to make my getaway. My lights hit the house as I turned. In the doorway was a broad man who looked like Buffalo Bill, wearing a dress and holding a hammer. And I fuck you not, next to him was a gimp. A fucking gimp in one of those terrifying masks, charging out towards my vehicle as I reversed out of there, his hands bound behind his back like he was some sort of animal. The other guy, Yasmin, was clearly the master. He stood in the doorway watching, as if he had just released the hounds on me, screaming for the gimp to not let me get away. He rammed into the side of my vehicle, his face up against the window. I could just about make out the whites of his crazed eyes behind the mask, and hear his muffled yells and laughing. He sounded like an absolute maniac. Dear God, I floored it. 
That gimp in full latex sprinted after me as I drove down the country road, heart beating a thousand times a second. Thankfully, he really was only human, underneath all that skin-tight black clothing, and he soon faded out of view in my mirrors as I put pedal to the metal. I drove home faster than was legal, cracked open a beer to take the edge off, and, after some thinking, decided to call the police. They eventually got around to checking the place out. Turns out, the gimp was a living slave. He allowed the other guy to keep him in a cage, feed him scraps, and treat him like crap, all by choice. He had been there for months. All of the footage on the video camera in the bedroom had conveniently been deleted. God knows what those guys were recording. They played dumb to the cops about the whole thing, saying that nobody had been over that night, and that I must be lying. The cops bought their story and let them be. I know for a fact that if I hadn't hightailed it out of there when I did, I would likely have found myself in the gimp's position, only against my will. Perhaps an even worse fate would have befallen me. Who knows? The whole scenario was just so sketchy. Two movies I can no longer watch? The Silence of the Lambs and Pulp Fiction. Damn, love those movies too. This is a story given to me by a friend of mine. He's a psychiatrist in Tokyo, and has helped, or at least tried to help, a lot of truly disturbed people. We were at a school reunion when he told me about a case he was working on. His subject was a woman who had recently been charged with assault. She was locked up, and it was my friend's job to analyse her mental condition. I think he only told me because we're really close friends, and because he was very, very drunk. I won't be revealing any names or anything, you know, confidentiality and whatnot, but he didn't technically say to me that I shouldn't tell the story to anyone either. Maybe it's because it's rather unbelievable. Honestly, I didn't really believe it either, but I asked him about it again when he was sober, and he confirmed that everything he said was true. Now, I've known this guy for 30 years, and he's never lied to me before, even when we've both been intoxicated out of our minds. But I asked for some written proof, which he actually provided me. This story comes from a written account that the woman made. She was either unable or unwilling to talk at the time, so had to write down her side of the story. It's highly unethical, but regardless... I've transcribed as much as I could, as best as I could, here. What? In that instant, I was stunned. I couldn't understand what he was saying. Break up? What did he mean, break up? I'd devoted the last few years of my life entirely to him. But why? I asked him. You're too heavy. Heavy? What do you mean by heavy? That I'm fat? I asked him. No, you're not fat. I mean, you're emotionally heavy. You're a mental burden. A mental burden? Everything I did with my time was for him. My cooking, my money, all of it was for him. How could that be a mental burden on him? I don't know how to say it. You're so clingy, so overprotective. You don't let me do anything myself. Sometimes I think you'd wipe my ass for me if I asked you to. What's wrong with that, Doctor? So many people would dream to have someone like that in their lives. A second mother. Someone who will always look out for them and provide them their every need. It was all for him. Everything was for him. I'm sorry, darling, I cried. I'll do whatever it is you want me to do, please. All right then, get out of my sight. What? 
then get out of my sight as fast as possible. I was astounded. Is that what he wanted? I'd do anything to grant his wish, but then I wouldn't be able to see him ever again. No, no, that can't happen. I don't want that to happen, I thought to myself. I couldn't bear it any more, and ran out of his room, crying. I sat outside in the park, swinging aimlessly on the swing set. I'm not very smart, but I racked my brain as hard as I could to work out how I could avoid the breakup. The best thing to do would be respect his wishes, but that would mean I'd have to leave him. That just couldn't happen. So, after some deep thinking, I came up with an idea. This was the only solution. No time like the present. I went to the local convenience store to buy what I needed. When I pressed the buzzer to his apartment, he almost immediately opened the door for me. Oh, what do you want? He asked. I want to make it up with you. I told you to stay out of my sight, he bellowed at me. I know. I'll fulfill your wish. I'd do anything for you. And with that, I quickly drew the screwdriver out of my pocket and plunged it into his right eye. At that point, he was rolling on the floor with agony. The poor little thing. I didn't want him to suffer for too long. It was easier the second time. He was on the floor after all. I perched on top of him and brought down the screwdriver again. It narrowly missed his left eye and slid into his left cheek, but it wasn't too difficult to slide the tool along his face and into the socket. Squelch is the sound I think it made. A cute sound, just like him. So, that's her account. Not all of it. Quite a lot of it was uninterpretable, according to my friend. Difficult to believe, right? Like I said, I didn't really believe him either. Not until I read this, at least. Then again, the fact he showed me this doesn't mean it's 100% true, either. This could have just been the ramblings of an imaginative but insane woman. But like I said, my friend's not much of a liar. Either way... I can kind of see her logic. The man asked her to get out of his sight, and technically, I suppose she did. This has haunted me for a long time. I was about 19 or 20 at the time, and I was living in Savannah, Georgia. I had a crappy fake ID, and I drank a lot. I worked this terrible job as a grunt laborer, the kind where you go to those temp labor agencies like Ablebody or Labor Finders. I'd show up at 4am, work until 5pm, and drink myself to sleep after only taking home maybe $60 for the day. I was supposed to go into work this particular morning, but I decided to skip it. It's a labor agency. They'll just find somebody else. I call my girlfriend and tell her I want to go to Tybee Beach. I had already started drinking. She comes over and we hop in my big ugly van, pack up some rods and head to the beach. I decided to have a drink across from the beach at this little bar. This is where the story gets interesting. Shortly after ordering my drink... I get this really weird feeling. I become hyper aware of my surroundings. The door opens, and I see this guy walk in out of my peripheral vision. There was a seat between me and my girlfriend, but it was like 9am, and the bar was completely empty. He could have sat anywhere else, yet he chooses to sit right between her and I. Then, he starts doing this thing with his fingers. The bar top was reflective, and he takes his fingers like two little legs, and just starts walking with them, skating them on the top of the counter. This isn't something out of the ordinary, but I took notice, because when I was in school, I did that all the time. 
I pretended I had rollerblades on my fingers and that I was skating around my desk. I hated school and was always distracting myself. So I'm watching him do this, and I became kind of mesmerized for some reason. That's when he looks at me, and in this really thick, kind of Germanic or Nordic accent, he says, I notice you're a man who pays attention to details. Me too. Now, before I continue, I have to describe this guy. He had this short, spiky hair with bleached tips, kind of like a late 90s style. He had really expensive clothes on. A nice Prada leather jacket, nice designer jeans, really nice boots. He seemed like a kind of gay guy with really awesome fashion sense and really distinctive taste. I always remember this, because I think to myself, some weird homeless crazy guy couldn't afford clothes like that. The other thing that stuck out were his eyes. They were piercing grey. It reminded me of a husky's eyes, but his pupils just stayed this disturbing pinpoint size. They were just extremely small, which caused his look to be kind of terrifying. His teeth were normal, right? But not at the same time. I don't know how to explain it. They were sharper than they should be, as if they had been filed slightly. His hands were normal, but his fingernails were slightly long and pointed, as if he deliberately did it. He kept licking his teeth, too, as if he were salivating. The thing about this guy is that you look at him, and everything seems normal, but off at the same time. So you're left questioning if you're crazy for thinking this. This guy then begins to start talking about the relationship between me and my girlfriend, but really strangely. He's talking about how beautiful she is, and how I should pay her more attention. He admittedly, I was kind of a dick to her. Shortly after he began talking like this, I had this almost knowing feeling come over me. Like, I knew this guy wasn't human. I look at my girlfriend and say, you need to leave. She just kind of looks at me like she knows too. Without a word of protest, she gets up quietly and leaves. Later I learned that she went next door to get a coffee. That's when this guy literally says to me with the utmost confidence, You were supposed to go fishing today. He points at the beach across the street. If you had, I would have drowned you in that ocean. And I shit you not, he fucking hissed at me. Again, for some reason, this overwhelming calm had come over me. I just ask, who are you? He answers back with this crazy, guttural language. It sounded Arabic or Hebrew or something. For some reason, without skipping a beat, and I have no idea why I was so calm to this day, I just ask, say it in a way I can understand. <laughs> uh, you can call me Jimmy C. I jumped off the San Francisco Bridge years ago and we've been watching you. From there on out, he never referred to himself as me or I, only we. The conversation became something very strange after this. He kept buying me drinks too, specifically whiskey sours. It was like he had an endless supply of money. He smoked Marlboro ultralight cigarettes. After I don't know how long, because I lost sense of time, I told him I'm going to leave. I walk next door to get my girlfriend, and she's stone silent. We start driving home, don't say a word. Then, I just ask her, do you know what that was? Yeah, that was a demon. This girl had parents that were scientists. She was really analytical, completely non-religious, and that was the first thing out of her mouth. 
Now, I didn't say this part before, because to me, this is the most important aspect of the story. Because it's what happened after this that really screwed me up for fucking years. The last thing this Jimmy C guy said to me before I left is this. Look at my car. I look outside and see one of those newer Volkswagen Beetles. It was white. What does the license plate say? I look at the plate and it literally says fierce. He looks me dead in the eyes and says, The next time you see me, I'll be driving a black Mercedes, and the license plate will say Utopia. Stupid, right? That night, I was still calm. I don't know why. I felt like that guy on office space after his hypnotherapist died right in front of him, and he was weirdly zen. My girlfriend started having terrible nightmares of this guy's head just staring at her in her dreams. Weeks went by, and that's when the encounter started affecting me. I found myself becoming paranoid about that black fucking Mercedes. Every black car I saw, I checked if it was a Mercedes. If it was, I immediately looked at the license plate. I started doing it when I was watching TV or movies as well. Now, I'm gonna fast forward a bit. About 10 years go by. I'm 29, so this is just recently. When I'm alone, when I'm drinking, I often think about this encounter. I still look at black Mercedes every time they pass, but I'm not so much anxious anymore, but curious. I remembered that my girlfriend at the time always kept a journal. By now, I'm pretty sure I'm insane. Maybe I was drunk. Maybe I'm not remembering any of this correctly. After years of trying to find news articles of a Jimmy C that committed suicide off the San Francisco Bridge, years of looking at black cars and so on, I felt like I'd grown out of it, so to speak. Yet still, I had to know. So, last year, I tracked down my ex-girlfriend. We ended on bad terms. I find out she's a schoolteacher in Wisconsin, has married a woman, and is actually trying to have a child. I figure she's not going to talk to me, but I send her a Facebook message anyway. I ask her if she could find the journal from that day, because I have to know if her events line up with mine. Sure enough, she had it. It verified everything I remembered, and it contained even more details than I recalled, because she had written it at that coffee shop right after it happened. When I read what she had written literally that day, I knew I wasn't imagining the details wrong, that this actually happened. This is probably the single most frustrating and scary thing that has ever happened to me. I want to imagine it's just a normal, crazy guy, but unless you saw it, felt it, and heard him talk about all of the little details of what you were supposed to do on that day, when only you knew it, you just can't understand the impact of it. It's been ten years, and my only solace, really, is that my ex-girlfriend was there to corroborate. That communication, where I reached out to her, actually caused us to be on good terms again after a decade. It seems to have been something that bothered her just as much as it bothered me. And still, to this day, even though I'm living 10,000 miles away in Southeast Asia, I can't stop thinking about Jimmy C's twisted face. I wonder if he still crawls on my back, and if the fear I feel at night often to where I have to drink myself to sleep or find a one-night stand just to not feel alone, is him, or them, watching me. I used to work as a 911 operator in a relatively large metro area. One night, at about three in the morning or so, 
I answered a call from an elderly woman who said she didn't feel good. I tried to get more information about what was wrong. Chest pain, trouble breathing, headache, is she a diabetic, and so on. She gave me her address and phone number, and said no one else was home, but that the front door was unlocked so they could come right in. I toned the call out as general illness, and kept trying to get more details. No matter what else I asked about what was wrong, all she would say was, I just don't feel good. Can you send someone to help me? After a few minutes, she said, I'm gonna put the phone down for a minute. I need to go to the bathroom. I tried to get her to stay on the line with me, told her she could do whatever she needs to do to get ready, but I'd like to be able to stay in contact in case there's a problem. She said, I'm gonna put the phone down. I'll just be a minute. And that was it. I stayed on the line and asked for her every so often, but got no reply. A couple more minutes passed, and then the fire department called on scene, so I just disconnected and didn't think much more about it. Told them that the caller advised the front door was unlocked, and that she was in the bathroom. A couple more minutes, and one of the firefighters called over the air with a weird tone. Dispatch. How exactly was this call received? I told them the call was first party from the patient's home phone, approximately eight minutes ago. He didn't respond over the air, but called the desk from his cell phone, which usually only happens when something's going on that they don't want broadcasted, since anyone can listen in on the radios. On the phone, he said, are you sure this wasn't a third party call from a family member or something? Negative. Caller advised I don't feel good, and said no one else was home. So, to the best of my knowledge, the caller is the patient. Have you made contact? Yeah. She was in the bathroom like you said. But she's probably been dead for around 12 hours. Cold to the touch. Fully livid. Full rigor. We're gonna need a deputy out here. Afterwards, we pulled the tapes of the radio and phone calls. Checked the timestamps, address, phone number. Went over everything a few times to see if we'd missed something. I called them back in the morning after the shift to see if they had any more information. But they were just as weirded out as we were. The phone was still in the living room. And the patient was dead in the bathroom. On the way back from work, I would always pass by this creepy apartment complex. No one had been living there for years, and there were plans for the building to be demolished in a couple of months. This abandoned apartment was a hotspot for people who wanted to commit suicide. It was an isolated place with few houses nearby, and the building was high enough for the fall to be lethal. Word on the street was that this place was haunted. Us Japanese have always been a superstitious bunch, especially when it comes to suicide sites. We have more than our fair share. Since there were almost no houses nearby, there were no shops or streetlights either. It was a terrifying place to cycle past. It was a mid-December night, and the snow was falling thick and fast. Absolutely freezing. I pedalled my bike as fast as possible from the station to my house in the pitch blackness. I had nothing but my bike light to guide my path. As I neared the abandoned apartment, I stopped pedalling. There was a single light shining from the top of the building. I gulped. Was it a ghost? The soul of someone who had committed suicide? I didn't want to go near the building. But this was the only path that I could take to get back to my house. If I wanted to take a different route, it would require me to head all the way back to the station. The whole journey would take me an extra hour. It was freezing cold, and as another gust of snowy air hit me in the face, I made my mind up and pedaled slowly towards the apartment. 
As I came closer to the building, I realized that the light was not that of a ghost or soul, but was obviously a torch or a lamp. I suppose it could have also been the light off of someone's phone. Sighing in relief, I was about to cycle past when I heard a bone-chilling scream. It was a woman. The screaming continued until there was a resounding thud, as if something had slammed onto the pavement. A fresh gust of cold air erupted all around me. A woman had just thrown herself off the building. At first, I was frozen in fear, but it didn't take me long to spring into action. I rushed over to the foot of the building and found the girl who had jumped, gasping for breath and shaking in agony. Her limbs were shattered and contorted, and claret seeped from her mouth as she looked up at me, pure terror in her eyes. The bloodstained snow around her cushioned her landing, so the fall hadn't killed her instantly like she planned. Instantly, I pulled out my phone and called for help. I thought it was futile at the time. This girl was going to die in the next few minutes without proper medical assistance. All the same, I told her that everything was going to be okay, and to just hold on a little longer. At least she wouldn't die alone. It wasn't long until the whole area was full of red, blue, and white light. The girl was in a critical state, but unlike all of those that had jumped before her, she actually managed to survive. This whole ordeal was easily the scariest moment of my entire life, but not because of the girl, and not because I was so sure she was going to die. You see, as I knelt by the girl's side, freezing in the snow, Waiting for the ambulance to arrive, I realized that she wasn't staring up at me, but was looking just past me, up at the apartment building. Several of the apartment's lights were now on. In the windows were people, staring down at us. The complex seemed to be filled with light, sound and movement just before the ambulance arrived. Both she and I saw them their bloody, emaciated faces inviting her in. The building's gone now, but I still take a different route home from work. This took place in Rhode Island when I was much younger, back in my college days. This was on the local Rhode Island news, so if you tried hunting, I'm sure you could find it. I was dating a girl that went to school in a town I won't name. It was the summer and everyone was back home. My girlfriend's best friend had an internship back in that town, and this girl had a four-bedroom multi-family home to herself. The other three roommates were paying for their rooms, but chose to stay home. I guess they could only get this place if they started paying the rent two to three months prior to school starting, but whatever. One weekend, my girlfriend asks me to go to that town with her to spend some time with her friend. She's lonely and has nothing to do on the weekends. We're only like an hour away, so it sounds like a plan. We head down and we just chill for the night. It's about 2am and we decide to walk out and get some cigs. Nothing special. We walk by a guy on our way home from the gas station, and he's just staring at us. Kind of creepy, but no big deal. This wasn't the best of areas, but certainly not the worst. We eventually all pass out, and me and my girlfriend head home the next day. The end of the week comes, and my girlfriend asks if I want to go and visit her friend again, but I have to work all weekend, so I decline. She heads down there alone, and her friend's boyfriend is coming over to stay as well, pretty much a repeat of the weekend before. They all drink, but end up going out and partying a little bit. They're walking back after a night of drinking when they enter the mudroom at around 2am. The mudroom door had been left unlocked. They close it behind them, 
and there's a really raggedy looking dude in there waiting for them. He says out loud to them, Get in the fucking house. They all turn around, and he has a gun. My girlfriend's friend has already unlocked the door to the house, and it's partially opened. Everyone is frozen in place, and the guy repeats himself, Get in the fucking house. The boyfriend then steps forward with his hands up a little bit, trying not to seem confrontational. Hey man, calm down. It's all good. I don't know how the fuck this dude was brave enough to do any of this. As he says that, the intruder shoots him. My girlfriend and her friend run into the house and hide under a bed. They can't hear this, but the assailant took off and didn't follow them back in. They don't know this though, and they're terrified, hiding under a bed while the boyfriend is screaming for help. They think the psycho's in the house and is looking for them. My girlfriend told me they were both silently crying under the bed while the boyfriend screamed for help. The worst part was that he was yelling, Help me, I'm dying. The neighbors heard the gunshot and screaming, and they called the police. They ended up catching the dude. He'd been watching the girl for weeks. It was the guy we had seen watching us the week prior. Worst part was, the girl's boyfriend didn't make it. This isn't my story, but my grandma's. She told me this story after I shared an equally horrific tale of my own. I might get around to sharing that one soon. My grandmother is a part of the time period when lots of southerners were migrating to the northern states, looking for work and better pay to help out their families still living down south. This took her to New York, where she found seamstress work, and where this story takes place. I should also add that my grandma is a tough old bird, and she's very paranoid about people she doesn't really know, and situations she has no control over. So this story came as a bit of a shock to me, and kind of explains a little about why she might be so paranoid. I'll also add that she doesn't, and never has taken any shit from anyone. She's about 5 foot 9, had muscles in her 60s, still rocks a crew cut, and would kick some ass if necessary. She's not a typical granny at all, so if something scares her, it's really fucking scary. So, my grandma and her friend Judy worked down the street from each other. They were introduced by my grandma's boss, and hit it off pretty well, and they started hanging out frequently after work. My grandma said that one night they went out to a bar, just having a good old time. It was here that the men approached them. There were two of them, one tall and light-skinned, and the other shorter and darker. Judy seemed to know them, and seemed to be happy to see them. She introduced them to my grandma, and they all decided to hang out for the evening. After a while of drinking and having a good time in the bar, the men started asking Judy if her and her beautiful friend would like to come back to their house to continue the party, since the bar was going to be closing soon. My grandma declined, as she's always been paranoid, and she said the men were giving off creepy vibes all night, doing stuff like whispering when they thought her and Judy weren't paying attention, giving the general creeper stare, and the short dark man kept trying to touch my grandma's waist and wrist. She said he was ugly as hell, that he looked like an old screw-faced beagle in her own words, and that he was so short she practically towered over him. At one point, he tried to hold her hand, and she gave him her I'll fucking kill you face, and he let go. The tall man persisted with the after-party idea, saying they could go and play cards, and dance some more at their big, nice house. He promised others would be there as well to party and play cards. Judy, by this time, was tanked, and the man had her convinced, but she didn't want to go without my grandma. 
So she proceeded to beg my grandma to come with her. She tells my grandma to stop being so paranoid and to trust her, that these guys are her friends and that they're okay. So my grandma, against her better judgement, left with them. My grandma says they drove for a good long while, and the moment she looked out of the car window and didn't recognise anything at all, she asked the man where they were going, and all he said was, Upstate. That was when she knew she was probably in trouble. The two men sat in front, and her and Judy were in the back. Judy's telling my grandma to chill out, that they're gonna have a good time. They get to the place, and it turns out the guys didn't lie. They pull up in front of a nice big house in some suburb. They go inside, and Grandma says she remembers the front door led into some long, dimly lit hallway. They were all walking in single file down the hallway in this order. The tall man, Judy, Grandma, short man. She says that at the end of the hallway there was a door that they went to, and the tall man had to stop to open the door with a key. As they waited for him to do so, she saw a big rat in a spare room off the hall run across a dirty mattress with horrible brown stains all over it. She says that this is what initially creeped her out about the house. The stains looked like dried blood, and the mattress was the only thing in the room just lying in the middle of the floor. So, they're all waiting for the tall man to open the door, and my grandma is about two seconds from losing her shit. He finally gets it open. My grandma said she barely got a glimpse into the room. The door pulled out towards them, so she could see through the crack where the hinges and the frame meet. There were women of all ages, in the nude, lingerie, garters, laying all over the furniture, playing cards and smoking cigarettes with men. She also heard someone screaming. My grandma screamed as well, and turned and ran, knocking the short man down in the process. She was so much taller than him that she barely noticed she'd run him over. The tall man had already grabbed Judy, who was now screaming too, and with the help of another man, shoved her inside the room with the other women and slammed the door. He then turned to help the short man chase down my grandma. She said she could hear them behind her yelling things like, Catch that bitch, and that they'd kill her when they caught her. She managed to get down the hall and out of the door, and she ran down the street screaming because she didn't know where she was, or where a train station was to get away. By the grace of God, she ran into a little old man who was opening a newsstand. He asked her what was going on, and when she pointed at the men, he pulled out a gun and started yelling at them to get the fuck away. Thankfully, they hightailed it back to wherever. The newsstand man helped her find a train station, and gave her money to help her get back to the city. My grandma never saw Judy again. Her boss told her one day that a nice looking man came by and picked up all of her belongings from her place of work, which was also where she lived. Said he told them that Judy wouldn't be returning to work, and that she had found a new place to stay. In a nutshell, my grandma avoided being abducted into a human trafficking ring. She says this has been going on for longer than the world wants to admit. For those of you who ask why she didn't call the police, you have to understand. My grandma didn't know where they took her, or if she had been given real names. She didn't know the address or anything that would have helped her find Judy. Also, being black and from Alabama back then, she didn't have much faith that the police would do anything to help her, and was afraid of what the men might do to her for meddling. She wishes she could have convinced Judy not to go along that night, and for a long time felt guilty about being the only one who got away. I'm glad she did though. I wouldn't exist if they had caught her.
My girlfriend suffers from pretty intense night terrors and sleep paralysis, and has done since she was a kid. Usually, they're about a shadow man at the foot of her bed, or snakes in her room. It gets to the point where she scares herself so badly, she bruises herself while dreaming. She's had some small terrors before, and I'm usually able to calm her down quickly, convince her that nothing's really there, and she just goes back to sleep. We recently celebrated Valentine's Day by getting a hotel room, along with some pizza, some candy, and some beer, and just relaxed the night away. Everything went great, and when we finally go to sleep, I'm out like a light. Fifteen minutes after I pass out, she whispers quietly, There's someone in the room with us. I can see him. He's right there. Now, this hotel wasn't exactly the nicest, and it wasn't in the best area, but I had felt safe. I assumed it was just another one of her night terrors. She then starts screaming that he's coming closer, so at this point I bolt awake, and it's much, much darker in the room than it was when I went to bed. I flick the light on, and no one's there, but my girlfriend is sobbing curled up on the bed. With my heart racing, but still unconcerned, I checked the room to calm her down. I checked everywhere, including under the bed. When I went into the bathroom, my blood went cold. The window was open about three inches, when I specifically remembered closing it before I went to bed, and neither one of us had got up during the night. I didn't tell her about the window, cuddled her close, and didn't sleep at all for the rest of the night. I made sure that the knife I keep in my emergency kit was well within reach on the nightstand. Growing up in the mountains of North Georgia, Camping and hiking were things my brother and me did so often it became second nature. Any time Ryan and I had a break from school, we'd head out straight for the woods. We packed our gear, let our parents know where we were going, and that was that. No questions asked. We decided to camp about midways through Jack's River Trail in Kohata Wilderness, and it's a trail we knew fairly well since we'd used it a few times before to practice long hikes. We arrived at the trailhead around lunchtime, parked the car, got out our gear, and headed into the woods. We passed a few hikers as we moved along and asked them how the trail looked, and the answer was always the same. Wet. Jack's River Trail probably crossed the river 50 times as it went along its 17-mile journey, and with the colder temperatures of late fall setting in, it was harder for the trail to stay dry. We moved deeper into the trail and started to look for a place to make camp. This is where Ryan and I made our first mistake. You see, me and Ryan have this rule. We don't camp near people if at all possible. Call us paranoid, but the last thing we want is for someone to drag us out of our tents and into the woods never to be seen again. So, we always camped a pretty decent ways off the trail, and in the area that wasn't popular with overnight camping. After roughly two and a half hours or so, we found what we thought was the perfect place to set up for the two nights that we'd be out. We came up to Horseshoe Bend, and ventured about half a mile off the trail into a clearing and set up. We built a TP fire lay for that night. After setting up and unloading, we decided to walk back to the trail and go exploring around many of the swimming holes Jack's River had to offer. This was during Thanksgiving break, and I remember being surprised at how few people were on the trail. Maybe it was the weather, or the fact that this was early in the week, but there didn't seem to be anyone hiking, much less staying the night. Around five o'clock, Ryan and I headed back to our camp to start our fire, make dinner, and settle in for the night. 
as soon as the sun began to set, the cold rushed in. We added more wood to the fire, sat close, and just enjoyed conversation. Ryan was two years behind me in school. I was a senior and he was a sophomore, but growing up, we had always been close. We always hung out in the same groups, played the same sports, had the same hobbies. Around 9pm, we're settling comfortably around the fire. I just text our mum to let her know we were safe and settling down. And I remember we were talking about dreading going to our grandparents' house for Thanksgiving, when things started getting strange. We were no strangers to sounds in the woods, and these woods were full of animals, from deer to black bears, and even the random wild boar. If you're in the woods enough, you learn to distinguish certain sounds, and what we were hearing, I can only chalk up to as odd. What Ryan and I heard was what sounded like someone sneaking around slowly, just out of eyesight. With an animal walking on four legs, you hear a tighter group of steps. But what we were hearing sounded like a human walking slowly, or trying to move without making much noise. We both pulled out our flashlights and shone them in the direction we thought the sounds were coming from. But that's what's so weird. Whenever we'd fix our lights on the spot, the sound would suddenly change, as if it was multiple people walking around us. That's when the whistling started. At first, I thought it was the wind, and I remember thinking maybe the wind is just throwing leaves around, and what we thought we were hearing was nothing but the wilderness around us. Ryan looked at me, and asked if I was hearing it too. I didn't answer, and was trying to focus hard on each individual sound. Two consecutive notes, with roughly a three to four second gap, and then two more consecutive notes, over and over again. Ryan kept asking me if I heard it, and I put my finger to my lips, trying to keep him from talking. The fear I felt was incredible. My jaw was tight. My fist clenched, knowing I wasn't ready for whatever was out there, if it was anything at all. The whistling continued for what felt like forever. That's when Ryan finally yelled out into the darkness. Hey! Quiet. The whistling stopped. The crunching of the wood stopped. Nothing. I was pissed. I looked at Ryan with a what-the-hell look, and he shrugged his shoulders. I had to do something, he said. I just shook my head. We sat there in silence for a few minutes, when the woods erupted with noise. Something or someone was running in a circle around our campsite. The whistling came back. Two consecutive notes with the same three to four second gap and then two more consecutive notes again. How could someone whistle this loudly without cracking, while running at the same time? I was done. I stood up, shining my flashlight in all directions, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever was screwing with us. Nothing. It felt close enough to touch, but we never saw a thing. That's when the movement stopped, but the whistling was still constant. It was so loud, inhumanly loud. I looked at Ryan and told him to call the police. Now, this is the part I'll never forget, the part I never like to talk about. While Ryan was on the phone with the dispatcher and telling them our location and what was going on, I stepped around the fire towards my tent. Inside my bag, I had a six-inch fixed blade that I always carried, and thought I'd feel a bit more comfortable with it in my hand, more so than just with my flashlight at least. As I went to unzip my tent, trying to keep my eyes towards the woods, I heard some movement directly in front of me. I swept my light up in front of me, 
and for maybe two seconds, I saw it. Whatever this person or thing was, it was about five feet up in a tree. Everything about it was long. Its arms, legs, neck, fingers, everything. And it was fast. As soon as the light hit it, it launched backwards off of the tree. I heard it land, but it either jumped an impossible distance or landed in a thicket, because I heard it but never saw it. I don't think I've ever yelled so loud. I ran back to where Ryan was and sat down. He kept asking me what I saw, but I couldn't answer. I just kept thinking about it. Maybe ten minutes later, we saw a couple of flashlight beams coming through the woods, and about three guys came into view, asking if everything was okay. I settled a bit, and started asking them if they had seen or heard anything. All they said was they heard a lot of movement, and then heard my scream, and that's when they headed in our direction. I tried to explain what happened without sounding crazy, but it didn't seem to work. One of the guys walked around a bit, came back, and said he didn't see anything. Ryan told them that we had called the police, and roughly 30 minutes later, a park ranger showed up. Ryan and I tried to explain everything to him, but he just chalked it up to some curious animal or some campers trying to mess with us. Either way, Ryan and I decided we weren't staying the night. We packed our stuff up and walked out of the woods with the ranger. He took our statement, and we got in our car and drove home. Ryan and I don't talk about what happened that night, but neither of us have been back to Jack's River Trail, and probably never will go back. My brother, cousins and I used to play a game whenever we had a sleepover. It was simple. We'd stay up and scare the living fuck out of each other. When we were at Erin and Kyle's house, it was the scariest by far. Her house was haunted. That's what everyone said. Even her parents knew it. Don't worry about Mr. Toombs, they'd say. He's harmless. Then they'd laugh and go back to what they were doing. Mr. Toombs was the man who owned the house before Erin's parents. He died all alone, and no one realized he was gone until many months later. Even though the house got gutted and renovated before it went on the market, we had this feeling he had died in the basement right near the furnace. The air there just felt thick and heavy, like old sour breath. We'd have our sleepovers a few times a month. Our parents all worked at the same factory. Whenever they had to take third shift, we'd either stay at home and Erin and Kyle would come to our house, or Greg and I would go over to Erin and Kyle's. I never minded all the moving around, until Kyle said we had to play that game. I hated it. Kyle was the oldest, and could be mean if he wanted to. He wasn't a bully. He usually knew when to back off, and genuinely felt bad if he made one of us cry. But he still liked to get his way, and that meant we'd have to play the sleeping game. The first time we played the sleeping game, we were at our house. The four of us were in our sleeping bags in the living room, and Kyle started to tell a really terrifying story about a skinny alien that comes through the window and cuts you up in your bed. Greg, Erin, and I hated the story, but I could tell Erin was especially horrified. She was only six. I kept telling Kyle to take it easy on his sister, but he was relentless. To Erin's credit, she didn't cry, but I think that was the problem. He probably would have stopped if she had. The game went like this. After the story, you weren't allowed to get out of your sleeping bag. No matter how scared you were, you couldn't get up to get water, you couldn't go to the bathroom, and under no circumstances could you run upstairs to get comfort from the grown-ups. 
Certainly if you did, you'd have to get an Indian burn from the rest of the group. The night of the alien story, I couldn't stop looking at the living room windows. Whenever a car went by and cast its lights against the wall, I'd shiver and feel my balls drawing up into my body while goosebumps rose on the back of my neck. Stupid Greg and Kyle were already asleep. Erin, whose sleeping bag was next to mine, was crying to herself. I need to pee, she whispered, and I'm too scared to get up, and I don't want to get an Indian burn when I get back. I looked at Greg and Kyle. They were both completely out. Go ahead, I whispered. I won't tell anyone. Erin gave me a tight-lipped smile and snuck out of her sleeping bag and padded down the hallway. Right around the time when I'd assumed I would hear the bathroom door close, she screamed. It was a shrill, horror-filled explosion from her tiny lungs, and the three of us, now wide awake, vaulted from our sleeping bags in her direction. We got there a couple of seconds before my parents were thundering down the steps. They flipped on the lights. Erin was in the corner of the bathroom, sobbing. Her pajama pants were soaked. Mum picked her up and held her to her chest and asked her what happened. The alien, Erin whimpered, then pointed to the shower curtain. Dad opened it. Nothing was there. Oh, it was just a shadow, honey, Dad told her. He glared at us. Come with me, boys, he ordered, and brought us back into the living room while Mum drew a bath for Erin. After a long lecture from my father, we agreed to not tell any more scary stories. Erin eventually came back to her sleeping bag, and with Dad snoring on the couch, we all went to sleep. The next night, of course, brought more stories. They were much tamer, though. Greg told a dumb one about a lady who gets pulled into a grave by a killer. I told an even worse one about some teenager whose baby brother's head came off. Heron actually laughed at that one it was so bad. We got ready to go to sleep, still bound by the agreement that we couldn't get up for any reason until it was morning. At some point, in the middle of the night, Greg shook me awake. Hey, we caught Erin coming back from the bathroom. She was already rubbing her arm in discomfort from the burn her brother gave her. Greg grabbed her other one and twisted, making Erin yelp. I took her arm and just squeezed it a little bit. I felt bad. Months went by, and we played the sleeping game every time we were together. Everyone got caught at least once trying to sneak out. The Indian burns were had by all. Erin, though, got the most. It was obvious she wasn't having any fun. To make matters worse, she looked exhausted on the mornings after we played. I brought it up to Kyle, and he thought about it for a minute and then said we'd do it once a month instead of every time. I didn't argue. We kept our little agreement to ourselves, because we didn't want Erin to think we were treating her like a baby. That night, we were sleeping at their house. They had a beautifully furnished basement with a big screen TV, a ping pong table, and all sorts of other fun stuff. We set up our sleeping bags and played video games until well after 10pm. My aunt came down and said to turn it all off and to get some sleep, so we made like we were getting ready for bed. But when the lights went off, Kyle said it was time to play the sleeping game. I groaned, but he shot me a look and mouthed only one to me. At least he was holding up his end of the bargain. Like we always did, anyone who needed to get up and pee or get a drink beforehand was allowed to. I went followed by Kyle, and then Erin. We all came back. In the glow of the flashlight he liked to hold under his chin when he told his stories, Kyle started to talk about a ghost. The ghost. Mr. Toombs. Even Greg looked uncomfortable as he stared at the slatted wooden door, which served as a barrier between the furnished and unfurnished cellar. The furnace was on the other side. 
Mr. Toombs waits until you're asleep, Kyle whispered, and sucks your breath into his lungs. The longer you sleep, the more he takes away. And if you sleep for too long, you won't have any air left to breathe. And you'll be dead. My eyes were wide with fear, and Greg just stared at the ground. Kyle, too, looked like he'd successfully startled himself, especially when the furnace kicked on, and we all jumped. Erin, surprisingly, had actually managed to go to sleep first, despite bawling her eyes out by the end of the story, and making Kyle promise to give her his snacks at lunch, or else she'd tell on him. I snuck her one of the lifesaver candies I'd stashed away to help her feel better. I guess it worked. The rest of us tried to go to sleep. Kyle caught me getting up to pee and gave me a wicked Indian burn, but since he caught me while he was on his way to the bathroom himself, I was able to reciprocate. Hard. He punched me in the arm, and I swatted him in the balls. I won. We tiptoed back into the basement and got in our sleeping bags. It was the worst night's sleep I'd ever had. Each time the furnace kicked on, I knew I'd see Mr. Toombs floating above my sleeping bag, ready to suck the life out of me. Like always, my aunt came downstairs in the morning to wake us up for school. She started with gentle calls, then hollers, then shouts. Then, since we always ignored her, she stomped down the stairs and threatened to haul us out of the sleeping bags. Let's go, she ordered. Get dressed and go get your breakfast. Erin, if I have to ask you again, I'm gonna flush your goldfish. Erin didn't budge. I swear to God, Erin, Goldine's going down into the sewer with the Ninja Turtles in three, two, one. Nothing. Concern flashed across my aunt's face. Kyle, who'd been sleeping next to her, shook his sister. She didn't respond. My aunt rushed across the room and pulled Erin to her. She hung limply out of the sleeping bag. Everything went really fast for a while. The ambulance came while my aunt and uncle screamed and cried, and Kyle, Greg and I just sat there in stunned silence. My parents arrived soon after. They were also crying. We were all asked if we saw her drink any alcohol or take any medicine. None of us had. I knew Erin had been the last one to use the bathroom before bed, so I mentioned that. Someone went into the bathroom and returned with an empty bottle of sleeping pills that had been in the medicine cabinet. Through her tears, my aunt insisted that the bottle had been empty to begin with that she'd been saving it so she could remember which kind had worked for her so she could get it again. But there was no other explanation at the time. Erin was dead. There was a funeral. It was terribly sad. But I went on with my life. Everyone did. I learned years later that the toxicology reports had been negative, and Erin's death had been ruled as accidental asphyxiation. They blamed the sleeping bag, and my aunt and uncle sued for millions. When Greg was moving out before his first year at college, I was asked to help unload the van. I didn't want to, but I helped anyway. Some of the heavier things were boxed up in the unfinished part of the cellar, by the furnace. I went down, and tried not to think about poor Erin. When I opened the door and entered the warm furnace room, I remembered that feeling I got the first time I'd been in there. An image of Mr. Toombs decaying next to the furnace flashed in my head. I shivered. But then I noticed the familiar, strange heaviness in the air. I noticed the smell. It was different from the sour odour that had reminded me of the last breath trapped inside a corpse's rotting lungs. This smell was sweet. It was cloying, like the breath of someone who'd eaten a lime lifesaver.
the best things happen in the dark. I won't be using my name, or revealing exactly where I live, in case this comes back to bite me. But I will say this took place in California. Not so long ago now, I started using this site that catered to pretty much every fetish you can think of. Some obviously more popular than others. But if you could think of it, there were probably at least a few people in the community who were interested in it too. I came across a lot of these different groups on the site. s and that's a given. Guys who got off to girls stuck in fake quicksand, that one I'll never understand. Adults pretending to be babies, eyeball licking, vor, sex with the elderly, sex with clowns, and of course, the dreaded furries. The one that really tickled my pickle though was leather. I ended up meeting a girl on the site who was into the same thing, and we actually met for coffee. It went well. So well, in fact, that we met up for a few drinks later that week. Her name was Zoe. She looked a little older in real life than in her pictures, but that's usually the case, and she was still very much my type. During the second date, I noticed this table of four guys who kept staring over at the two of us. I mentioned this to Zoe, but she didn't seem to think it was a big deal. They looked a little rough around the edges, but I put it to the back of my mind. Anyway, we both ended up getting a little drunk, and she offered for me to go back to her place. Frankly, I was too far gone at that point, and wouldn't have been able to do anything even if I wanted to. So, to her surprise, I actually declined. She seemed aggravated by the fact I said no. I guess she just thought all guys said yes to an invitation like that. In hindsight, she got a bit too angry about the whole thing. But she cooled off pretty quickly, and I selectively forgot about it. The glory of alcohol. In all honesty, I was surprised that this fetish website had led to me sort of dating a girl. I figured it would all be about hookups and one-night flings. But Zoe and I actually organized a third date. I sent her a message about getting dinner, but she messaged me saying we should skip it and get straight to the drinks. Alright, fine by me. The night started well enough. I arrived late, but Zoe looked particularly happy to see me. You smooth dog, I thought to myself. She was wearing a pair of tight leather pants. Very nice, if I do say so myself. I planned on pacing my alcohol consumption better that night, expecting another invitation from Zoe to head back to her place. I didn't plan on whiskey dicking two times in a row. I order a beer and drink it slowly. Around ten minutes in, I spot those same four guys from last time over in the corner. I'm sure it was them. This was a completely different bar in a different part of town. Could have just been a coincidence, but I didn't like the way they kept throwing the occasional glance our way, just like the time before. Sometimes you just know something isn't right, and this was one of those times. I mentioned it again to Zoe, and we shared a laugh that those guys must be stalking us or something. We chat and flirt for around an hour, when I start to feel a little lightheaded. That's strange. At this point, I've barely drunk anything. This woozy feeling intensifies little by little, and I start to realize something's wrong. I excuse myself, and by the time I make it to the bathroom, the stalls are spinning. I fumble my way inside one of them, and force myself to vomit in the toilet. I knew what had happened. I'd been drugged. But when, and with what? 
I managed to call the only person I knew would help me without question, my pal Jeff. Slurring my words, I'd tell him the bar name and say I need an evac pronto. I count my lucky stars that I made that call when I did, because a few minutes later, I was so far gone I don't remember a thing. Jeff relayed to me what happened next. When Jeff arrived, I was being carried out of the bar by Zoe and some random guy. Neither appeared concerned, they were more like determined, on a mission. According to Jeff, they led me over to a van where a few other guys were waiting and were preparing to put me in the back of it. When he described the guys to me as best he could, I knew who he was talking about. Those same rough looking guys who had been staring at Zoe and I the entire evening and the time before. These hadn't been a set of dates, they'd been a set of traps. Zoe and the glancers were in cahoots. That explains her anger on the second meetup. She must have told those guys where she was going to take me, and was planning on leading me into an ambush. This time she wasn't taking any risks, and wanted to make sure I went along with them. She must have spiked my drink when I went to the bathroom or something. The bitch. Jeff gets out of the vehicle and rushes over, telling them he knows exactly what's going on and that he's going to call the police. He took their license plate number and pictures of the whole group with his phone. A couple of the guys start to get aggressive towards him, and Zoe's there screaming at him to fuck off, but Jeff manages to keep his cool. When a couple of late night passers-by come along, the group lost their nerve and dumped me in the middle of the road, leaving it to Jeff to scoop me up and get me to a hospital. They took off in the other direction. I woke up in the morning with the worst headache of my life, but other than that, I was going to be fine. I gave the cops as much information as I could about Zoe, but they couldn't find a trace of her on the site, and nothing ever came of it. Knowing Jeff, I'm sure he made it sound more heroic than it really was, but I have to be honest, he really saved my ass that night. I mean, what would have happened to me if he arrived just one or two minutes later? Jeff thinks human trafficking, but I'm not so sure that happens to guys all too often. I guess it's a possibility. Another friend of mine thinks they wanted to make a snuff movie. In theory, it could have been any number of things, especially when you consider they found me through a fetish website. Personally, I don't like to think too much about it. Guys, I think I fucked up. I could use some advice. It all started when I broke up with my ex one year ago. Her name was Haruka. Haruka was really kind, which was why I started dating her in the first place. But she was also really pessimistic, and as such, it was no fun to hang around with her. She was the kind of low spirit that made everyone around her depressed too including me. You know the type of person I'm talking about. I think she had a borderline personality disorder. I only really noticed her weird traits when we started dating. Every time I'd finish talking on the phone, she'd keep asking me whom I'd been talking to. If ever I didn't respond straight away, she'd ask me over and over again, and wouldn't stop querying me until I answered. Most times I said it was my parents, and it really was. I could see it in her eyes that she didn't really believe me though. During the weekends, it was a given that I would have to spend my time with her. I'm talking every minute of it. When I was away from town due to work, she'd call me up every hour on the hour. She had also request evidence that I'd actually been at work. Essentially, Haruka was a control freak. She made sure I had no privacy whatsoever. I think she would have controlled the way I shit and piss if she had the chance. She also started saying really disturbing things to me. 
things like, if you ever leave me for another girl, you know that I'd kill you, right? I realized that this wasn't normal, but I was still in love with her at the time. At one point, though, I decided enough was enough. I went to see her parents without telling her to try and sort out her problem, but before I could even discuss it with them, they started saying things like, Our daughter's been really depressed over the past few years. She's been in such a bad place ever since she was dumped by her last boyfriend. I'm glad she managed to find a good young man like you. She's in a much better place now. I hadn't even seen her laughing until these past few months. Thank you so much. Her mother was seriously in tears before I could bring it up. It was surreal. I ended up saying everything was fine, and left with a newfound enthusiasm to make it work with her. But it didn't last. Her need for control got worse as the days passed by. Towards the end, any conversation with other girls became completely forbidden. When I mentioned I was arranging a work get-together with some female colleagues, she deleted their phone numbers off my phone. Even casual greetings with neighbors was disallowed if they were a female. At restaurants, if the person bringing out the menus was a waitress, Haruka would be the one to order. She wouldn't even let me look in the girl's direction. I couldn't do this anymore. It didn't matter if she had come from a bad place or not. This just wasn't how human beings were meant to live. I think I would have gone mad if I stayed with her any longer. I went to Haruka's apartment early one weekend. Maybe you'll think I'm a freak when I say this, but I actually scripted out how I was going to break the news to her. I made sure the breakup would be as kind as possible. I sighed a breath of relief when I finished talking. I looked up to see her staring at the floor. I couldn't see the expression on her face at all. Not wanting to make her cry, I turned to leave with an, I'm really sorry. But as I got up, she suddenly reared her head upwards and with a massive shriek shouted, How dare you? Her face had contorted into a devilish sneer. It wasn't sadness in her eyes at all. It was fury. She looked at me as though she was looking at a cockroach, her contempt for me as clear as day. Before I had a chance to even open my mouth, she grabbed hold of my shirt and threw me to the ground with an almost otherworldly strength. She then ran off into the kitchen, shrieking all the way. Terrified and lost for words, I bolted out of the door, leaving my shoes behind, all the while hearing her shout things like, You don't deserve to live, you disgusting degenerate. I'm going to cut your fucking throat. And the ever-reliable, If I can't have you, no one can. I realized that the situation was dire. She had entered the kitchen to fetch herself a weapon. She most likely just wanted to threaten me, but of course I couldn't be sure. Biting my lips in the hallway, I waited for the elevator doors to open. But as they were about to, with a soft groan, I saw Haruka burst out from her room just ten meters away. Her door opened with such speed and force, it was almost as if she had broken right through the damn thing without opening it. The intensity in her eyes. She was like a woman possessed. As soon as I saw that, I knew that she didn't simply want to threaten me with the knife in her hand. She really did want to slit my throat. Crying out in shock, I left the elevator and stumbled for the stairs to my left. Her apartment was on the fifth floor, but I had no choice. She would have killed me if I waited there for the elevator to open. I know that much for certain. I ran down the stairs as fast as I could, but somehow her voice behind me seemed to be getting louder and louder. Screams of, I'll kill you, mixed in with unintelligible shouting. I got to the ground floor and was about to bolt for my car when I stopped. I looked behind me and back at my car. 
me in a split-second decision. I instead hid behind the shadow of the stairs and waited for her. A decision that to this day, I believe saved my life. Instinctively, I realized that by the time I got to my car, opened the door and turned on the ignition, I would have been pounced on. She had been catching up with me, and I could tell by the volume of her screams that she was only one floor away. So, terrified, I waited. I heard the screams and thumping of feet getting louder and louder. I bided my time, and wished with all my heart that this plan would work. I then jolted my leg forward in front of the stairs. I felt my leg connect with her shin with a painful crack. With a yell of surprise, she tripped, or more accurately, flew into the air in front of her. She crashed face first into the ground with a resounding thud, which seemed to echo around the foyer. My god, I didn't think she'd fall into the trap that well. She must have really lost her mind, so much so that she wasn't paying much attention to her surroundings. I quickly shuffled to the safety of my car, and peered at her cautiously. She was still on the ground. Maybe I should call an ambulance, I thought to myself. I could see her moving, however, and I distinctly saw other doors opening as the neighbours peered out to see what the commotion was. No doubt that if she told them what happened, they'd now take her side. Honestly... I didn't want to have anything to do with her at that stage. I just wanted her out of my life as soon as possible. I know it was a dick move, but I left her there. I drove to the entrance and floored it. I moved apartments after that. I told all of my colleagues at work not to give my new address away to anyone, and explained the full details of what had happened. I didn't notify the police, though. I was afraid she might sue me for what I had done, or even press criminal charges of her own. No doubt I'd come away looking like the bad guy. But you have to believe me when I say, I know she would have killed me in that building if given the chance. Anyway, all's well that ends well, right? Wrong. A few days ago, I got a letter in the mail. There was nothing written on the envelope, and there was no stamp. It was clear that someone had posted the letter by hand. I opened the letter to find a single, folded piece of A4 paper. On it was only one sentence. I will always be waiting for you. At the bottom was a kiss mark in red lipstick. And there it is. She's found me. What do you think I should do? Was that letter a threat? A promise? I know it's her, and I'm scared. When I was about 12, my great-uncle John came from Ukraine to visit us in Canada. He had a lot of stories, but this was the one that stood out. In the late 1960s, John was travelling by train from his village to another to visit family. He had to change trains at one point, and was dropped off at what amounted to a platform and a hut in the middle of nowhere. There was no one else at the station, and other than a dirt road that led off into the surrounding woods, there was nothing there. He waited for some time, but no train came. It was winter, and getting colder and darker, and just about the time he started worrying about having a place to stay and some food to eat, an old woman appeared out of the twilight. She asked if he was waiting for such and such a train, and when he said he was, she said it wouldn't be along until the following day. She asked if he needed a bed for the night, and offered him a meal and a room at her place, which she said was about an hour's walk from the station. Lodging with locals was more or less the standard when travelling in this part of the USSR, and Great Uncle John wasn't looking forward to a hungry night on a cold platform, so he was glad to accept her offer. 
He took his suitcase, and they set off together down the dark road into the forest. It was more than an hour away, more like two, and by the time they arrived at the woman's small two-story house, John was tired and hungry. They went inside, and the woman lit some oil lamps and warmed some borscht for them. It was the first time John was able to see the woman clearly, and he was a bit startled to realize that the old woman was actually a man. Not wanting to pry, and too tired to care, John finished his soup and asked where he would be sleeping. She led him up the stairs to a tiny room with a window that contained a single bed and nothing else. He thanked her, they said goodnight, and she closed the door. Then she locked it, leaving him in the dark. Somewhat creeped out by this, John called to her, but she didn't answer and he heard nothing. Figuring he would deal with it in the morning, and that she had probably done it by mistake, John set his suitcase down and laid on the bed, deciding to make the best of it and get some sleep. Before he could fall asleep though, he felt the urge to pee, and got out of bed, hoping to find a chamber pot or something he could pee in. He got onto his hands and knees, and began to feel under the bed in the darkness thinking that's where the pot would be if there was one. Instead, he found a body. Great Uncle John went right to the window to see if he could exit the room that way. It was nailed shut. He knew that if he remained in the room, he was probably a dead man. But if he broke the window and tried to get out that way, there was a good chance that the old woman, and who knows who else was there, would hear him and come into the room before he could get away. So he did the only thing he could do. He pulled the body from under the bed, heaved it onto the mattress, and covered it with the blanket. Then he got under the bed and waited. Sure enough, about an hour later, he heard footsteps coming slowly up the stairs, and then towards the room. The lock clicked, and the knob turned slowly. In the gloom, John saw someone move towards the bed. He heard several terrific and sickening thuds. The person had bashed the body on the bed with a large crowbar, which they had then dropped on the floor right in front of John. There was silence. Then the person went out of the room, and the door was shut again. The footsteps went down the stairs, and then once more, silence. John moved out from under the bed, took the crowbar, and was able to slowly pry the window open. He didn't say, but I imagine he was shitting bricks the entire time. When the window was up, he threw his suitcase out, then dove through himself, not caring what was below him, only worried about what was behind. He landed without too much injury, and began to run into a field behind the house, towards some lights in the far distance. It turned out to be a highway, with some military and transport trucks on it, and John was able to get a ride to another village where he could catch a train. He didn't bother reporting what happened to the authorities, since at that time in the USSR, there was a distinct chance he would be the one who got into trouble. He just thanked God that he escaped, and decided that the next time he travelled to visit relatives, he'd take another way. Hidden away in the rich part of town is my cafe. The luscious interior of the cafe, along with the relaxing jazz music that we play, make this a popular joint for students and housewives with too much free time on their hands. There's even a terrace, which is often filled with people reading books, chatting and drinking coffee. Sometimes something a little stronger. It was November, and a trio of young girls entered the cafe. They'd been allowed to leave school early due to finishing their midterm exams that day. They were complaining about how they went. 
Well, this is shit. Jesus, I'm gonna have to repeat a year. Oh, come on, you couldn't have done that badly. I've never heard of a student repeating a year at 14. A fresh batch of squabbling ignited, fueled by the stress of exams and the annoying air of confidence one of the girls was giving off. She was obviously the smarter of the bunch. The nattering subsided after ten minutes, and eventually the girls settled on a new topic of conversation, namely what schools they were planning to progress to. In the Japanese schooling system, high schools are commonly split between Chugaku, which is lower secondary, and Kou Kou, upper secondary. What Kou Kou you attend can greatly affect your chances of getting into a good university. Still eavesdropping in on their conversation, the two, well, less gifted students started teasing the smarter one, telling her how the best school in the district, the one she would likely be going to, was haunted. The rumour was a famous one. Apparently, after a student committed suicide at the school, other pupils started to die horrible deaths on the school premises. Witnesses often swore that they saw the dead student at the scene of the crimes. What a load of shit. It wasn't uncommon that people claim places where suicides occurred were haunted. In fact, in Japan, you can find an apartment at a comparatively cheaper price if uh, misfortunes occurred there. Losing interest, I was about to turn away and tend to my duties, when I heard a shout. Now wait just a minute, the voice said. Turning towards its source, I realised it was one of the ladies sitting on the opposite end of the cafe. The woman left her book on the table and walked over to the three young girls. Sitting down with a grunt, she scratched at her long dark hair rigorously. For that brief interval, everything in the cafe seemed to revolve around this little strange woman in a red dress. Then she opened her mouth to speak. I am sick and tired of all of these lies about my old school being haunted. If you three would be so kind as to stop spreading such idiotic rumours, I'd be more than happy to tell you what actually happened there. I couldn't help but listen in to this whole story from behind my counter. I was just as interested in finding out the truth behind the rumours as these three young girls. The story itself wasn't about this quirky woman in the red dress though. It was about another girl that she knew at the school called Akasuki. For the purposes of this video, I'll retell the story I overheard from Akasuki's perspective. I have an older twin sister. I sometimes get asked things like, do you feel pain when your sister gets hurt? Do your parents get confused between the two of you? Stuff like that. People seem to have this idea that twins are connected somehow on a deeper level, more so than regular siblings. But not us two. We didn't hate each other per se, but we didn't really care for one another either. We never argued talked, or interfered with each other's affairs. We might as well have been thin air to each other. Now, my sister was much more able than me when it came to, well, pretty much anything. Athletics, academics. Okay, it wasn't like she was miles ahead of me, but she was always slightly better. Even when the difference was so small, from a young age I was constantly deemed as the less able one. Sometimes even the simpleton. During childhood, my arsehole parents would always say things like, Your sister can already ride her bike, why can't you? I probably learnt it about 20 minutes after her, but this small amount might as well have been the difference between heaven and earth. If I scored 95% on a math test, I never got a pat on my back from the teacher, or even just a reassuring, well done. No. I'd be sitting by myself with my paper, staring at my sister being championed by the class for getting 98%. But then again, I didn't really envy my sister, and she didn't brag about being better. Like I said, we were pretty much just heir to each other. As implied by my past grades in school, we were both top of the league. There were times where our exam results were first and second in the whole school, 
so it was only natural that we ended up going to the same high school. That was the best high school in the district. Our relationship didn't change during high school. I actually enjoyed it there, but only for the first semester. Even in a school full of students who scored top grades, there were bullies and rebels. Problem was, these bullies were smart. Whenever they carried out their evil deeds, they'd make sure it wouldn't be found out by their peers or by faculty members. Even when they were found out, they generally got off the hook due to their excellent grades. Because obviously, straight-A students can't be evil, can they? It started when I came back from the summer break. The bullying, that is. For some reason, they started paying attention to me at school. I don't know what I'd done, but there was nothing that I could do. During lunch, or after school, they'd come to my classroom. Then they'd take me to some inconspicuous location, and punch me, kick me, hit me. Like I said, they were clever. They made sure to avoid bruising my face or arms. There were five bullies in total. One of them was a girl with chestnut-coloured hair, who just watched as three others pummeled me senseless. She just pointed and laughed while giving the other girls orders. She was obviously the leader. There was also one other girl who came along to watch the show. My sister. It didn't make sense to me. My sister hated these types of girls just as much as I did. After ignoring each other for so long, why would she try and break me now? I'd only known the friends I'd made at the school for three months. As soon as they found out I was being attacked by the rogues of the school, they almost immediately stopped hanging out with me, fearful that they'd be targeted simply for associating with me. In the end, I found myself alone at school. The violence continued for months and months. They started getting more creative in the ways they'd hurt and humiliate me. The worst days were when their chestnut-haired leader was in a bad mood. Sometimes I was stripped naked and thrown into a pond. When I fell to my knees out of breath, she'd grab me by the hair and pull me up to my feet. Not yet, Chestnut would say, and the violence would continue. All the while, my sister would be staring at me coldly, without a flicker of emotion on her face. It was as if she was staring at a rat or a cockroach. I couldn't tell what she was thinking. I thought about telling my parents, but they already had plenty to worry about with their work. Besides, they'd almost certainly take the side of their favoured daughter. My sister must have started bullying me in the first place because she knew I wouldn't talk. There was nothing I could do about the situation. If I told my teachers, there was a chance the bullying would just get worse. It was possible the teacher would think I was lying, particularly considering that the bullies were perfect students during lessons. There was absolutely nothing, nothing that I could do. Every day when I got home, I'd desperately try and clean the bloodstains off my shirt before my parents came home. I sobbed as I furiously rubbed my shirt. What had I done to deserve this? One time, while I was scrubbing, I heard my sister coming up the stairs. She must have got back from her part-time job early. I pictured her face, cold as ice, staring at me as the bullies beat me over and over again. How could it be that she was enjoying her life at school so much when I was in this state? She was part of the tennis club, had a part-time job, and lots of friends. Why did my life have to be so terrible? We were twins. I ended up hating my sister more than the other bullies, simply because she was enjoying her life so much. The violence just kept on intensifying. One time I nearly died from drowning, because I was just too tired and injured to resist as they dunked my head underwater. I was tired. I could only think of one way out. I began my preparations. I wrote a note with just four words. Mum. Dad. I'm sorry. 
Slowly, step by step, I walked up the stairs of the school. Nobody was allowed to be there after 9pm, so there were no teachers or other students around. But since I knew the school well, it wasn't difficult to break inside. I finally got to the top of the stairs. There was a metal door leading to the rooftop. I swung it wide open. It was winter at this point, and a cold breeze hit me straight away and chilled me to the bone. There was a full moon, and I could clearly see the whole rooftop area. My sister was already there, just as I had asked her to be, waiting with her back to the door. I hadn't expected her to come. She was leaning on the rails of the roof, staring down at the school grounds below. I walked towards her. I wanted to talk to you in private. I figured school would be the best place. Surprisingly, my sister replied straight away. I guess. This was the closest thing we'd had to a conversation for as long as I could remember. I stepped closer to my sister as she continued to talk. So, what did you want to talk about? Without hesitation, I threw myself at her. She had her back to me, and I caught her completely off guard. My sister flew into midair and fell downwards off the roof, down and out of sight. After seeing the suicide note that I'd placed in my sister's room, nobody suspected foul play. My sister hardly ever spoke to anyone, hardly ever laughed. It seemed perfectly plausible that she had been depressed and taken her own life. That was the beauty of my plan. Maybe with my sister gone, the four other bitches who'd been making my life hell would now lose interest in tormenting me. If that happened, I'd finally be able to get on with my life, go back to being a normal student again. From the time of my sister's death and her funeral, it had already been a few weeks. Feeling nervous, I stepped back into my classroom. All of my classmates ignored me, except for one girl, the leader of the bullies, the girl with chestnut hair. She smiled and winked at me. Hey, are you alright? She asked. I was taken aback by this display of compassion from her. Although my heart was now beating faster than it ever had, I made sure not to show it. I remained expressionless. I'm fine. It's not like I cared about her. Even though I said this, I had been feeling extremely remorseful. Yes, we were like heir to each other, but she had been my twin sister. The bully nodded and smiled again. Hey, that's great. So you're gonna find a part-time job now, I guess. That was strange. Why was she talking about a part-time job all of a sudden? I couldn't hide my surprise, and she laughed when she saw my confusion. <laughs> what? Did you think we'd take pity on you? If you want us to stop, you're gonna have to make a contract, just like your sister did. What the hell was she talking about? The bully looked genuinely surprised that I didn't know what she meant, that my sister had never told me what she had done. She really never told you, huh? <laughs> we were bullying your sister at the start. Had nothing to do with you. We only stopped fucking with her because she agreed to pay us off, and told her we'd find a new victim instead. Oh, I still remember her face when we said we'd picked you. She told me how much I'd have to pay her and her lackeys to stop this torment. Then she patted me on the shoulder, and with another wink said, Good luck from today. We've already found a new target instead of you. Provided you pay us on time, that is. Now I understood everything. Why the girls had started to bully me when I hadn't even met them before. Why my sister was always with them why my sister had been leaning against the rooftop rails with her back to me, as if she was asking me to push her. Maybe she had been in greater pain than me all along. In that moment, I blanked out. Next thing I remember, I'm being hauled into a police car by two armed cops. I was absolutely covered in blood. 
The human body is a very fragile thing. It's amazing the damage you can do to somebody with just one pen. And that was the story of Akasuki, as told by the woman in the red dress. I couldn't help but interrupt the story as I brought her another cup of coffee. How did she know all of this? It turned out that the woman in red had been a friend of Akasuki's, at least before she started getting bullied. To avoid unnecessary trouble, she had stopped hanging out with her, but after she found out what had happened, she felt extremely guilty. Akasuki had been placed in a psych ward after being deemed mentally unstable. The woman in red paid her a visit, and heard the whole story from Akasuki's own mouth. The woman sipped at her coffee. Ever since that incident, all reports of bullying were taken extremely seriously, and anyone found to be a bully was punished severely. But anyway, my whole point is this. It's stupid to say that the school's haunted. With a pale face, one of the young girls pointed out that what had happened there was as good a reason as any for the school to become haunted. I had to agree. This was one of the most gruesome tales I'd ever heard in my life. But to that, the woman simply snapped. If you ask me, what Akasuki did was perfectly natural, given what happened at least. I mean, wouldn't you have done the same in her shoes? This is my parents' story, and it took place in Colorado many years ago, back before I was even born. They're both natives, and have always been a very superstitious pair. That might just have saved their lives that night. They were traveling along Million Dollar Highway through Red Mountain Pass after a long road trip. It was around 2 or 3 a.m., and my dad was behind the wheel while my mum slept in the passenger seat. They both knew the road well, and dad was driving cautiously. The road is notoriously dangerous for its lack of guardrails and sheer steep drops over the edge. At one point, dad nudges my mum awake. There's something not quite right about the road up ahead. After letting her eyes adjust for a moment, she too could see that the road ahead was different than usual. After having driven that road so many times, they both knew that the sharp left curve they were fast approaching was going the opposite way it should have been. This part of the road was meant to curve right around the mountain. Always had, always would. Even the sign they just passed said so. Neither of them knew what to say as they approached the bend in the road. They both rubbed their eyes, but they're not seeing things. The road really is turning left, not right. But that was impossible. The silence was killing them, and as they reached the point of no return, Mum screamed to turn right instead. She needn't have bothered, as Dad was already spinning the wheel in that direction knowing that was how the road was supposed to go. As he turned, the actual road seemed to appear before them, just how it had always been. The road that turned left was now just gone, as if it had never been there to begin with, and all that was left in its place was a sheer drop. Had they followed the illusionary road they both saw, they would have plunged over the side of the mountain. Dad maintains that this was some sort of trickster, trying to force them off the side of the cliff, and in to an early grave. This took place back in the summer of 2014, when I was 25 years old. I live in Germany, and at the time, I had just become interested in BDSM. Basically, the whole whips and chains deal. It's not for everyone, but more people are into it than you'd think. Something like 20% of people fantasize about it. So, if you have four other friends, chances are one of you is a secret sadomasochist. 
if it isn't you, then you can have some fun speculating about which of your pals it might be. The problem for me at the time was that it's not the easiest thing to experiment with, especially when you're not in an established relationship. I don't think there's any smooth way to bring it up on a date or with girls at the bar, unless it's some sort of sex bar or something like that. That's when I had the bright idea to become a member of a fairly well-known BDSM website, just so I could finally chat about the subject with other like-minded people. And who knows, maybe see where things went from there. It was a surprisingly positive experience right off the bat. Everyone I chatted to was so friendly and welcoming. And I have to tell you, I learned more than a thing or two that doesn't bear repeating here. Like I said, I talked to quite a few people on the site, but one stood out. A redhead with a username that translates into Mistress Honey. She messaged me about two weeks into me becoming a member, saying that I was just her type and that she wanted to get to know me better. Scrolling through her photos, I was pleasantly surprised. Rocking body, pretty face, and from the thing she'd type, kinky as all hell. Jackpot. Over the course of a day or two, Mistress Honey told me that her real name was Yasmin, and that she thought I'd make a perfect subordinate. Someone she could dominate in the bedroom. Well, I don't know about you guys, but to me that sounded pretty good. Just what I was into. But I confessed that I wasn't really experienced with the whole BDSM thing, and since she seemed like she'd been around the block a few times, I might not be what she's looking for. She seemed to be really understanding, and eager to teach me all she knew. It genuinely was quite surprising how all the sadomasochists were actually really nice and welcoming, at least online. I tried to organize a meetup between the two of us, but she was either never available or had to cancel last minute. She suggested one night that I should go over to her place for a night of fun instead skip the pleasantries, and get straight down to business. In hindsight, it was a stupid idea, but I replied to her message, asking for her address. I knew she lived close by, but didn't know exactly where. She sends it over, and it's only a 30 minute drive away. Perfect. Not so far as to be impractical, but far enough that if it goes awkwardly, it's not like I'm going to bump into her in the streets afterwards. I message her back, saying that I'll be at her place in the next hour or so. She replied with a winky face. Hopping in my car and tapping her details into my GPS, I'll admit that I was a little bit nervous about the upcoming encounter. Not because I foresaw trouble or anything, but because, honestly, it had been a while since I'd last been with a woman, and now I was diving headfirst into a world of latex. Still, I guess this was sink or swim time. And besides, she was going to be the dominant one during the course of the evening, which had to be the harder job in practice, right? All I had to do was endure a little whipping, a bit of handcuff burn, and just enjoy the ride. This and other thoughts were swirling in my head as I drove the route highlighted on the machine, until I was nearing my destination. It was a lot more rural than I had first anticipated. I carefully drove down this thin, country road, engulfed by trees so thick they blocked out all of the moonlight, my headlights the only thing illuminating my path. You have reached your destination. I pulled up outside this tatty-looking farmhouse. Now, this really wasn't what I was expecting. It was so secluded and abandoned-looking. There was still a fair amount of distance from my vehicle to the house, so still time to pull out. But something compelled me to stay. No prizes for guessing what that thing was. A three-letter word ending in X. A light was on in what I presumed was the bedroom, the top right window of the house. Looking up, I saw that the window blinds were parted ever so slightly, 
and a pair of female eyes were peering down at me through the slats. Well, she knows I'm here, I figured. Can't turn back now. Checking my phone one last time, she had dropped me a message saying that the door was open and to just come on inside. Like all her messages, he had ended in that winky face. Against my better judgement, I stepped out of the car and approached her front door. Sure enough, it was open, and with a push, I stepped into the small entranceway. It was almost pitch black inside, I could barely see a damn thing. Immediately, I was hit by the faint smell of latex. Whoa, she really was hardcore into this stuff. Not knowing whether it was breaking the roleplay immersion or not, I called out to Yasmin. Silence. Uh, Yasmin? I called out again, a little louder this time. Still, nothing. I fondled the wall in search of a light switch, but couldn't seem to find anything. Was she expecting me to just head to the bedroom right away? I paused and stood motionless for a moment, listening intently for any signs of movement in the house. From what I could tell, there was a slight moaning coming from upstairs. My mind was running wild with what she might be doing up there. Using the phone in my pocket as a light source, I slowly made my way up the stairs with trepidation up to where I believed Yasmin was. I reached the top of the stairs. To my left, the hallway was completely black and could have gone on forever for all I could tell. To my right was the door to Yasmin's bedroom, light seeping out from a crack in the slightly open door. This was definitely where the sounds were coming from, a tad louder now, and strangely distorted. I composed myself, let out an excited breath, and walked into the room. As soon as I entered, I knew I had made a massive mistake. By the window, strategically positioned, was a cardboard cutout of a female, made to look as if it was peering out of the window shades. The walls were covered in magazine pages, calendars and cutouts of scantily clad or naked women. All that was in the room was a massive bed, large straps and chains attached to the posts, a large camera on a tripod aimed at it. Next to it, a table holding a various selection of tools, ranging from sex toys to knives and other blades. The moaning was coming from a porn movie playing on a television set. What the actual fuck was this? Certainly not what I'd signed up for. I jumped like someone had lit a candle up my arse and one would As I left the bedroom and made for the stairs, I looked down the world's darkest hallway dead ahead of me, and stopped dead in my tracks. Frozen to the spot, I noticed something I hadn't when I first glanced down there before. The outline of a figure. A male figure, hiding in the darkness and creeping closer. No, not one. Two. There were two people in the shadows. One standing upright, the other crawling on its knees. I could just about make them out now that they were closer to the light seeping out of the bedroom. As I stopped and stared at them, they both froze too. Who the fuck's there? I shouted. A thick male voice replied with one word. Yasmin. I bolted down the stairs and out the front door at lightning speed, praying not to fall on my way to the car, and that there were no other surprises waiting for me outside. In what felt like a heartbeat, I was there and scrambling for my keys. I opened the driver's side door and threw myself in, flicking on the headlights and preparing to make my getaway. My lights hit the house as I turned. 
In the doorway was a broad man who looked like Buffalo Bill, wearing a dress and holding a hammer. And I fuck you not, next to him was a gimp. A fucking gimp in one of those terrifying masks, charging out towards my vehicle as I reversed out of there, his hands bound behind his back like he was some sort of animal. The other guy, Yasmin, was clearly the master. He stood in the doorway watching, as if he had just released the hounds on me, screaming for the gimp to not let me get away. He rammed into the side of my vehicle, his face up against the window. I could just about make out the whites of his crazed eyes behind the mask, and hear his muffled yells and laughing. He sounded like an absolute maniac. Dear God, I floored it. That gimp in full latex sprinted after me as I drove down the country road, heart beating a thousand times a second. Thankfully, he really was only human, underneath all that skin-tight black clothing, and he soon faded out of view in my mirrors as I put pedal to the metal. I drove home faster than was legal, cracked open a beer to take the edge off, and, after some thinking, decided to call the police. They eventually got around to checking the place out. Turns out, the gimp was a living slave. He allowed the other guy to keep him in a cage, feed him scraps, and treat him like crap, all by choice. He had been there for months. All of the footage on the video camera in the bedroom had conveniently been deleted. God knows what those guys were recording. They played dumb to the cops about the whole thing, saying that nobody had been over that night, and that I must be lying. The cops bought their story and let them be. I know for a fact that if I hadn't hightailed it out of there when I did, I would likely have found myself in the gimp's position, only against my will. Perhaps an even worse fate would have befallen me. Who knows? The whole scenario was just so sketchy. Two movies I can no longer watch? The Silence of the Lambs and Pulp Fiction. Damn, love those movies too. This is a story given to me by a friend of mine. He's a psychiatrist in Tokyo, and has helped, or at least tried to help, a lot of truly disturbed people. We were at a school reunion when he told me about a case he was working on. His subject was a woman who had recently been charged with assault. She was locked up, and it was my friend's job to analyse her mental condition. I think he only told me because we're really close friends, and because he was very, very drunk. I won't be revealing any names or anything, you know, confidentiality and whatnot, but he didn't technically say to me that I shouldn't tell the story to anyone either. Maybe it's because it's rather unbelievable. Honestly, I didn't really believe it either, but I asked him about it again when he was sober, and he confirmed that everything he said was true. Now, I've known this guy for 30 years, and he's never lied to me before, even when we've both been intoxicated out of our minds. But I asked for some written proof, which he actually provided me. This story comes from a written account that the woman made. She was either unable or unwilling to talk at the time, so had to write down her side of the story. It's highly unethical, but regardless... I've transcribed as much as I could, as best as I could, here. What? In that instant, I was stunned. I couldn't understand what he was saying. Break up? What did he mean, break up? I'd devoted the last few years of my life entirely to him. But why? I asked him. You're too heavy. Heavy? What do you mean by heavy? That I'm fat? I asked him. No, you're not fat. 
I mean, you're emotionally heavy. You're a mental burden. A mental burden. Everything I did with my time was for him. My cooking, my money, all of it was for him. How could that be a mental burden on him? I don't know how to say it. You're so clingy, so overprotective. You don't let me do anything myself. Sometimes I think you'd wipe my ass for me if I asked you to. What's wrong with that, Doctor? So many people would dream to have someone like that in their lives. A second mother. Someone who will always look out for them and provide them their every need. It was all for him. Everything was for him. I'm sorry, darling. I cried. I'll do whatever it is you want me to do. Please! All right, then. Get out of my sight. What? Then get out of my sight, as fast as possible. I was astounded. Is that what he wanted? I'd do anything to grant his wish, but then I wouldn't be able to see him ever again. No, no, that can't happen. I don't want that to happen, I thought to myself. I couldn't bear it any more, and ran out of his room, crying. I sat outside in the park, swinging aimlessly on the swing set. I'm not very smart, but I racked my brain as hard as I could to work out how I could avoid the breakup. The best thing to do would be respect his wishes, but that would mean I'd have to leave him. That just couldn't happen. So, after some deep thinking, I came up with an idea. This was the only solution. No time like the present. I went to the local convenience store to buy what I needed. When I pressed the buzzer to his apartment, he almost immediately opened the door for me. Oh, what do you want? He asked. I want to make it up with you. I told you to stay out of my sight, he bellowed at me. I know. I'll fulfill your wish. I'd do anything for you. And with that, I quickly drew the screwdriver out of my pocket and plunged it into his right eye. At that point, he was rolling on the floor with agony. The poor little thing. I didn't want him to suffer for too long. It was easier the second time. He was on the floor after all. I perched on top of him and brought down the screwdriver again. It narrowly missed his left eye and slid into his left cheek, but it wasn't too difficult to slide the tool along his face and into the socket. Squelch is the sound I think it made. A cute sound, just like him. So, that's her account. Not all of it. Quite a lot of it was uninterpretable, according to my friend. Difficult to believe, right? Like I said, I didn't really believe him either. Not until I read this, at least. Then again, the fact he showed me this doesn't mean it's 100% true, either. This could have just been the ramblings of an imaginative but insane woman. But like I said, my friend's not much of a liar. Either way, I can kind of see her logic. The man asked her to get out of his sight, and technically, I suppose she did. This has haunted me for a long time. I was about 19 or 20 at the time, and I was living in Savannah, Georgia. I had a crappy fake ID, and I drank a lot. I worked this terrible job as a grunt laborer, the kind where you go to those temp labor agencies like Ablebody or Labor Finders. I'd show up at 4am, work until 5pm, and drink myself to sleep after only taking home maybe $60 for the day. I was supposed to go into work this particular morning, but I decided to skip it. It's a labor agency, they'll just find somebody else. I call my girlfriend and tell her I want to go to Tybee Beach. I had already started drinking. She comes over and we hop in my big ugly van pack up some rods, and head to the beach. I decided to have a drink across from the beach at this little bar. 
This is where the story gets interesting. Shortly after ordering my drink, I get this really weird feeling. I become hyper aware of my surroundings. The door opens, and I see this guy walk in out of my peripheral vision. There was a seat between me and my girlfriend, but it was like 9am, and the bar was completely empty. He could have sat anywhere else, yet he chooses to sit right between her and I. Then, he starts doing this thing with his fingers. The bar top was reflective, and he takes his fingers like two little legs, and just starts walking with them, skating them on the top of the counter. This isn't something out of the ordinary, but I took notice, because when I was in school, I did that all the time. I pretended I had rollerblades on my fingers, and that I was skating around my desk. I hated school, and was always distracting myself. So I'm watching him do this, and I became kind of mesmerized for some reason. That's when he looks at me, and in this really thick, kind of Germanic or Nordic accent, he says, I notice you're a man who pays attention to details. Me too. Now, before I continue, I have to describe this guy. He had this short, spiky hair with bleached tips, kind of like a late 90s style. He had really expensive clothes on. A nice Prada leather jacket, nice designer jeans, really nice boots. He seemed like a kind of gay guy with really awesome fashion sense and really distinctive taste. I always remember this, because I think to myself, some weird homeless crazy guy couldn't afford clothes like that. The other thing that stuck out were his eyes. They were piercing grey. It reminded me of a husky's eyes, but his pupils just stayed this disturbing pinpoint size. They were just extremely small, which caused his look to be kind of terrifying. His teeth were normal, right? But not at the same time. I don't know how to explain it. They were sharper than they should be, as if they had been filed slightly. His hands were normal, but his fingernails were slightly long and pointed, as if he deliberately did it. He kept licking his teeth too, as if he were salivating. The thing about this guy is that you look at him, and everything seems normal, but off at the same time. So you're left questioning if you're crazy for thinking this. This guy then begins to start talking about the relationship between me and my girlfriend, but really strangely. He's talking about how beautiful she is, and how I should pay her more attention. He admittedly, I was kind of a dick to her. Shortly after he began talking like this, I had this almost knowing feeling come over me. Like, I knew this guy wasn't human. I look at my girlfriend and say, You need to leave. She just kind of looks at me like she knows too. Without a word of protest, she gets up quietly and leaves. Later I learned that she went next door to get a coffee. That's when this guy literally says to me with the utmost confidence, you were supposed to go fishing today. He points at the beach across the street. If you had, I would have drowned you in that ocean. And I shit you not, he fucking hissed at me. Again, for some reason, this overwhelming calm had come over me. I just ask, who are you? He answers back with this crazy, guttural language. It sounded Arabic or Hebrew or something. For some reason, without skipping a beat, and I have no idea why I was so calm to this day, I just ask, say it in a way I can understand. <laughs> uh, you can call me Jimmy C. I jumped off the San Francisco Bridge years ago, and we've been watching you. From there on out, he never referred to himself as me or I, 
only we. The conversation became something very strange after this. He kept buying me drinks, too, specifically whiskey sours. It was like he had an endless supply of money. He smoked Marlboro ultralight cigarettes. After I don't know how long, because I lost sense of time, I told him I'm going to leave. I walked next door to get my girlfriend, and she's stone silent. We start driving home, don't say a word. Then I just ask her, do you know what that was? Yeah, that was a demon. This girl had parents that were scientists. She was really analytical, completely non-religious, and that was the first thing out of her mouth. Now, I didn't say this part before, because to me, this is the most important aspect of the story, because it's what happened after this that really screwed me up for fucking years. The last thing this Jimmy C guy said to me before I left is this. Look at my car. I look outside and see one of those newer Volkswagen Beetles. It was white. What does the license plate say? I look at the plate and it literally says, Fierce. He looks me dead in the eyes and says, The next time you see me, I'll be driving a black Mercedes, and the license plate will say Utopia. Stupid, right? That night, I was still calm. I don't know why. I felt like that guy on office space after his hypnotherapist died right in front of him, and he was weirdly zen. My girlfriend started having terrible nightmares of this guy's head just staring at her in her dreams. Weeks went by, and that's when the encounter started affecting me. I found myself becoming paranoid about that black fucking Mercedes. Every black car I saw, I checked if it was a Mercedes. If it was, I immediately looked at the license plate. I started doing it when I was watching TV or movies as well. Now, I'm gonna fast forward a bit. About 10 years go by. I'm 29, so this is just recently. When I'm alone, when I'm drinking, I often think about this encounter. I still look at black Mercedes every time they pass, but I'm not so much anxious anymore, but curious. I remembered that my girlfriend at the time always kept a journal. By now, I'm pretty sure I'm insane. Maybe I was drunk. Maybe I'm not remembering any of this correctly. After years of trying to find news articles of a Jimmy C that committed suicide off the San Francisco Bridge, years of looking at black cars and so on, I felt like I'd grown out of it, so to speak. Yet still, I had to know. So, last year, I tracked down my ex-girlfriend. We ended on bad terms. I find out she's a schoolteacher in Wisconsin, has married a woman, and is actually trying to have a child. I figure she's not going to talk to me, but I send her a Facebook message anyway. I ask her if she could find the journal from that day, because I have to know if her events line up with mine. Sure enough, she had it. It verified everything I remembered, and it contained even more details than I recalled because she had written it at that coffee shop right after it happened. When I read what she had written literally that day, I knew I wasn't imagining the details wrong, that this actually happened. This is probably the single most frustrating and scary thing that has ever happened to me. I want to imagine it's just a normal, crazy guy, but unless you saw it, felt it, and heard him talk about all of the little details of what you were supposed to do on that day, when only you knew it, you just can't understand the impact of it. It's been ten years, and my only solace, really, is that my ex-girlfriend was there to corroborate. 
That communication, where I reached out to her, actually caused us to be on good terms again after a decade. It seems to have been something that bothered her just as much as it bothered me. And still, to this day, even though I'm living 10,000 miles away in Southeast Asia, I can't stop thinking about Jimmy C's twisted face. I wonder if he still crawls on my back, and if the fear I feel at night, often to where I have to drink myself to sleep or find a one-night stand just to not feel alone, is him, or them, watching me. I used to work as a 911 operator in a relatively large metro area. One night, at about three in the morning or so, I answered a call from an elderly woman who said she didn't feel good. I tried to get more information about what was wrong. Chest pain, trouble breathing, headache, is she a diabetic, and so on. She gave me her address and phone number, and said no one else was home but that the front door was unlocked so they could come right in. I toned the call out as general illness, and kept trying to get more details. No matter what else I asked about what was wrong, all she would say was, I just don't feel good. Can you send someone to help me? After a few minutes, she said, I'm gonna put the phone down for a minute. I need to go to the bathroom. I tried to get her to stay on the line with me, told her she could do whatever she needs to do to get ready, but I'd like to be able to stay in contact in case there's a problem. She said, I'm gonna put the phone down, I'll just be a minute. And that was it. I stayed on the line and asked for her every so often, but got no reply. A couple more minutes passed, and then the fire department called on scene, so I just disconnected and didn't think much more about it. Told them that the caller advised the front door was unlocked, and that she was in the bathroom. A couple more minutes, and one of the firefighters called over the air with a weird tone. Dispatch, uh, how exactly was this call received? I told them the call was first party from the patient's home phone, approximately eight minutes ago. He didn't respond over the air, but called the desk from his cell phone, which usually only happens when something's going on that they don't want broadcasted, since anyone can listen in on the radios. On the phone, he said, Are you sure this wasn't a third party call from a family member or something? Negative. Caller advised I don't feel good, and said no one else was home. So, to the best of my knowledge, the caller is the patient. Have you made contact? Yeah. She was in the bathroom like you said. But she's probably been dead for around 12 hours. Cold to the touch. Fully livid. Full rigor. We're gonna need a deputy out here. Afterwards, we pulled the tapes of the radio and phone calls, checked the timestamps, address, phone number, went over everything a few times to see if we'd missed something. I called them back in the morning after the shift to see if they had any more information, but they were just as weirded out as we were. The phone was still in the living room, and the patient was dead in the bathroom. On the way back from work, I would always pass by this creepy apartment complex. No one had been living there for years, and there were plans for the building to be demolished in a couple of months. This abandoned apartment was a hotspot for people who wanted to commit suicide. It was an isolated place with few houses nearby, and the building was high enough for the fall to be lethal. Word on the street was that this place was haunted. Us Japanese have always been a superstitious bunch, especially when it comes to suicide sites. We have more than our fair share. Since there were almost no houses nearby, there were no shops or streetlights either. It was a terrifying place to cycle past. 
It was a mid-December night, and the snow was falling thick and fast. Absolutely freezing, I pedaled my bike as fast as possible from the station to my house in the pitch blackness. I had nothing but my bike light to guide my path. As I neared the abandoned apartment, I stopped pedaling. There was a single light shining from the top of the building. I gulped. Was it a ghost? The soul of someone who had committed suicide? I didn't want to go near the building, but this was the only path that I could take to get back to my house. If I wanted to take a different route, it would require me to head all the way back to the station. The whole journey would take me an extra hour. It was freezing cold, and as another gust of snowy air hit me in the face, I made my mind up and pedaled slowly towards the apartment. As I came closer to the building, I realized that the light was not that of a ghost or soul, but was obviously a torch or a lamp. I suppose it could have also been the light off of someone's phone. Sighing in relief, I was about to cycle past when I heard a bone-chilling scream. It was a woman. The screaming continued until there was a resounding thud, as if something had slammed onto the pavement. A fresh gust of cold air erupted all around me. A woman had just thrown herself off the building. At first, I was frozen in fear, but it didn't take me long to spring into action. I rushed over to the foot of the building and found the girl who had jumped, gasping for breath and shaking in agony. Her limbs were shattered and contorted, and claret seeped from her mouth as she looked up at me, pure terror in her eyes. The bloodstained snow around her cushioned her landing, so the fall hadn't killed her instantly like she planned. Instantly, I pulled out my phone and called for help. I thought it was futile at the time. This girl was going to die in the next few minutes without proper medical assistance. All the same, I told her that everything was going to be okay, and to just hold on a little longer. At least she wouldn't die alone. It wasn't long until the whole area was full of red, blue and white light. The girl was in a critical state, but unlike all of those that had jumped before her, she actually managed to survive. This whole ordeal was easily the scariest moment of my entire life, but not because of the girl, and not because I was so sure she was going to die. You see, as I knelt by the girl's side, freezing in the snow, waiting for the ambulance to arrive, I realized that she wasn't staring up at me, but was looking just past me, up at the apartment building. Several of the apartment's lights were now on. In the windows were people, staring down at us. The complex seemed to be filled with light, sound and movement just before the ambulance arrived. Both she and I saw them, their bloody, emaciated faces inviting her in. The building's gone now, but I still take a different route home from work. This took place in Rhode Island when I was much younger, back in my college days. This was on the local Rhode Island news, so if you tried hunting, I'm sure you could find it. I was dating a girl that went to school in a town I won't name. It was the summer and everyone was back home. My girlfriend's best friend had an internship back in that town, and this girl had a four-bedroom multi-family home to herself. The other three roommates were paying for their rooms, but chose to stay home. I guess they could only get this place if they started paying the rent two to three months prior to school starting, but whatever. One weekend, my girlfriend asks me to go to that town with her to spend some time with her friend. She's lonely and has nothing to do on the weekends. We're only like an hour away, so it sounds like a plan. We head down, and we just chill for the night. It's about 2am, and we decide to walk out and get some cigs. Nothing special. 
we walk by a guy on our way home from the gas station, and he's just staring at us. Kind of creepy, but no big deal. This wasn't the best of areas, but certainly not the worst. We eventually all pass out, and me and my girlfriend head home the next day. The end of the week comes, and my girlfriend asks if I want to go and visit her friend again, but I have to work all weekend, so I decline. She heads down there alone, and her friend's boyfriend is coming over to stay as well. Pretty much a repeat of the weekend before. They all drink, but end up going out and partying a little bit. They're walking back after a night of drinking when they enter the mudroom at around 2am. The mudroom door had been left unlocked. They close it behind them, and there's a really raggedy looking dude in there waiting for them. He says out loud to them, Get in the fucking house. They all turn around, and he has a gun. My girlfriend's friend has already unlocked the door to the house, and it's partially opened. Everyone is frozen in place, and the guy repeats himself. Get in the fucking house. The boyfriend then steps forward with his hands up a little bit, trying not to seem confrontational. Hey man, calm down. It's all good. I don't know how the fuck this dude was brave enough to do any of this. As he says that, the intruder shoots him. My girlfriend and her friend run into the house and hide under a bed. They can't hear this, but the assailant took off and didn't follow them back in. They don't know this though, and they're terrified, hiding under a bed while the boyfriend is screaming for help. They think that Here's a little known legend from my hometown in the Philippines. There's an infamous mountain here called Mount Cristobal. For tourists and people passing through, it's just like any other mountain you might see throughout my country. But we locals call it the Devil's Mountain for a reason. All sorts of peculiar and tragic happenings have occurred on and around Mount Cristobal, including the deaths and disappearances of many hikers and adventurers over the years. Some people claim that the Devil himself lives there hence the mountain's ominous nickname, and most avoid going there like the plague. Us locals believe that supernatural creatures roam the area after sundown. The unsettling feeling one gets when approaching the mountain is enough to scare most people off, even those who have never heard of the mountain's reputation before. In fact, there are countless stories from would-be hikers who were overcome by an eerie sensation when they approached the mountain, and so decided not to climb it. Sadly, not everybody trusts their intuition. When I was a child, my father owned a gas station. I was hanging around with him while he worked one day, playing with some toys in the back room. That morning, a group of three tourists from America came in. They bought a few snacks and drinks, fueled up their vehicle, and asked my dad if he could help them with some directions. Sure, where'd you need to go? My dad inquired. The foot of Mount Cristobal, replied one of the young Americans. We want to check out the mountain, but we don't know the best place to start our hike. Do you know a good starting point? My dad's eyes widened, and his jaw tightened. He told them that it was a dangerous place, linked to numerous terrible incidents. Said that it was the devil's playground, a cursed mountain. The three of them laughed at him, unfazed by his concerns. That's why we came here in the first place. We want to check it out, chill with the devil for a while. I know now that most people from other countries think urban legends are all nonsense, and that the three Americans believe going to the mountain was just a bit of fun, but my father took the stories about Mount Cristobal very seriously. I don't know the best place to start your hike, said my father. In my opinion, there is no best place to start, not if you have any sense anyway. It's dangerous, I tell you. The group ignored my father's remarks, paid for their things, and drove off without any more discussion. I looked up at my father, and even though I was young, and this was many years ago, I remember the concern on his face as he watched those tourists leave. I asked him what was wrong, but he said nothing more about the matter. Five days later, 
news started circulating around town about what had happened. An American tourist had stumbled out of the forest surrounding Mount Cristobal. He was completely alone and delirious, having had no food or sleep for days. I instantly recognized his face in the local newspaper my father was reading. It was one of the Americans that had come to our gas station. The paper told his story. Apparently, he and his two friends found their way to the foot of the mountain after all, and began making their way up to the top. They'd brought a tent and supplies with them, and planned to spend a night atop the mountain. They set up camp near a cliff with a steep drop, and cooked themselves some dinner. At nightfall, the three of them sat in a row on the cliff's edge, their feet dangling over the side of it, the kind of stupid thing young people do when they feel invincible. They sat there in the dark looking out at the beautiful world that surrounded them. Soon, they realized something wasn't right. Hey, do you guys feel that? One of them said to the others. Collectively, they all sensed that there was something in the darkness below them. They stopped their chattering and peered down into the total blackness of the sheer drop under their feet. Without sound or warning, a pair of hands attached to two long arms shot up from below them grabbed the middle tourist by his legs, and, in one fell tug, pulled him straight over the edge. They heard their friend scream as he fell, and vanished into the blackness, followed by a loud and distinctive thud as he hit the ground. One moment he was sitting there, then, in an instant, gone, swallowed by the darkness. The two remaining men scrambled from the cliff's edge. They couldn't believe what they'd just seen. Two impossibly long, stretched arms had just raised up out of nowhere and stolen their friend. They ran, and in their frantic escape, lost track of one another. One of the men kept running downhill, pushing through the brush and avoiding pitfalls. But as he made his way down the mountain slopes and came to a clearing, he found that he was somehow higher up on the mountain than where he'd started. He continued walking down the mountain, only to find himself somehow ascending it. For four days he wandered, trying to find his way to the bottom and back to civilization, all the while thinking he was losing his mind. Eventually, Mount Cristobal loosened its grip on him. He emerged from the mountain and was given medical assistance. It was a miracle that he had survived. The man who was pulled over the ledge by the hands was found at the bottom of the cliff. His head cracked open like a coconut, his bones shattered. The second American was never found. To this day, it's unknown what happened to him. He remains unaccounted for, another lost adventurer claimed by the mountain. I tried to warn them, said my father as he read their story in the paper. I tried to warn them, like so many others before. But you can't save everybody. Their story was read about and quickly forgotten by most locals. Like I said, Deaths and disappearances are commonplace on that mountain. They were just another three men who went to meet the devil and got far more than they bargained for. One folkloric creature from my country that everyone knows of is the Balbal. -bal. Considered by many to be one of the most frightful and disgusting creatures in Filipino folklore, they're said to be an omen of death, but there aren't many who have a personal story to share about them. Most believe them to be fictional creatures too, but my uncle knows otherwise. He told me a story from his youth one evening, when the two of us were drinking alone and having a heart to heart, and I'm going to share that story with you now. My uncle wasn't one to lie about such matters, and he recalled this incident with such clarity and sincerity that I for one believe him, and I'm not the only one. In roughly his words, this is what he shared with me. I was only ten years old at the time. My father, your granddaddy, had suddenly and unexpectedly passed away. My brother, your father, was four years older than me, and very protective. After our dad passed, he effectively became the man of the house, despite only being a teenager himself. Took good care of mum and me, but there was something that he always got angry about, and that he refused to let me discuss. It was the day of our father's funeral. A crowd of family and friends were gathered around his open grave. 
We listened to the priest philosophize on death for a few minutes, and then watched as the coffin was lowered into the grave and covered with dirt. There were a lot of tears and condolences, the usual stuff. I remember thinking at the time, I should feel a lot sadder than this. I hadn't shed a single tear during the whole service, and I felt guilty about that. I loved my dad with all my heart, of course. He was a good man, a kind man. I'd spent the last few days in tears over his loss. But there was something about the atmosphere around that grave that felt... off. It distracted me from my sadness. It's hard to put it into words, but the air had this sort of heaviness to it. There was a pressure to it that I hadn't felt before. Everyone's words seemed muffled, just slightly. No one else seemed to notice it, so I put it down to my emotions, wreaking havoc on my body. As we all stood around, watching the hole be filled, I suddenly felt this strange compulsion. A compulsion to look towards the banana trees in the distance. I gazed at those banana trees. It felt like I was looking at a picture where everything else was out of focus, except the part that your eye is supposed to be drawn to. Everything and everywhere else seemed a little blurry, but not this one particular section of trees. This was a weird sensation, and I tried not to panic, to fit in with all the other people around me standing silently around the grave, but I could feel a cold sweat forming on my forehead, and I couldn't look away from those trees. I just knew there was someone behind them, watching us. And then, I saw him. A man with very pale skin, dressed in black. Not unusual for a funeral, but even from 50 or 60 meters away, I could tell there was something not right about this guy. Another person might have seen him and thought that he was just someone who knew my father, that he was watching from afar because he was shy or out of respect. Somehow, I just knew otherwise. After the service, the crowd dispersed, and my brother, mother, and I went back home, now one family member short. But I couldn't stop thinking about that strange experience, about the banana trees and the man hiding within them. I knew I had to go back and investigate, alone. I knew my brother would call me a dramatic fool, and after the day we had all just had, I didn't want to cause my mother any more distress. So, after dinner... I quietly left the house and walked quickly towards the nearby cemetery. The sun had already set, and I wanted to get back before my mother knew I was gone. There were no electric lights or anything like that at the time, of course, but by the time I reached the gates, my eyes had already adjusted to the darkness. As I made my way past the first few headstones and got deeper into the graveyard, that blurry, otherworldly sensation began to take a hold of me again. The closer I got to my father's grave, the stronger the effect became. I had to stop to collect myself. Standing still, I could hear a noise coming from around the corner ahead of me. The corner that led to my father's resting place. My stomach was in knots as I stepped forward and turned the corner. There it was. Father's grave. It had been dug up. His coffin was open. And there, standing over him, was the only thing in focus. A tall, pale figure. Something between a man and a monster. It was shaped like a human, sure, but was much skinnier. The proportions were all off. It wasn't wearing clothes, and you could see each rib. Its face was buried deep in the coffin, but I must have let out a gasp, because it quickly jolted up and looked right at me. Its eyes were dead, as if skin had grown over them, like a Greek statue. At the end of its stretched face was a grotesquely long tongue, which thrashed back and forth. What must have been its mouth was stained with some dark liquid. I immediately knew what it was. A bal bal, the grave rubber from the stories. And just like in the stories, I knew why it was there at my father's grave, and what it was doing with him in his open coffin. It was eating him, peeling his skin off with its tongue and bloody, curved fingernails. I turned and ran for the gates, didn't stop running until I made it back home. I was in floods of tears, and my brother immediately told me to get a grip of myself and to not worry mother. He asked me what on earth was the matter, told me that he was the man of the house and that he'd take care of it, whatever it was. I confided in him what I'd just seen. 
He scolded me, told me not to make up such stories about our dearly departed father. And then, realizing that I genuinely was in a state of shock, he told me that he would go to the grave and take a look for himself. I begged him not to go, but he told me I was just in a state of grief and that he was just going to take a look to put my mind at ease. In the meantime, he said, I had to wait in my room. It was too late for me to be going back outside. Twenty minutes later, he returned. He knocked on my door, told me that he went to the cemetery and that there was nothing there, that there was nothing out of place at the grave and that everything was as it should be. Nothing out of the ordinary, and certainly no balbals out for a midnight feast. I had just been imagining things, he said. But I knew what I'd seen, and I told him that he must have just missed the thing. Your old man got real serious with me after that, told me to stop making up lies, and to never speak of this ridiculous balbal story again. He said, nobody likes a liar. You're gonna get a reputation if you go around saying you saw a balbal. But I wasn't lying. Maybe I was just seeing things, yeah. Maybe I did just have a moment of madness, sparked by the loss of our papa. A grieving mind can play all manner of strange tricks on a person, that I know. But it was so real, that I can't explain it. I just know I saw what I saw. I know it was a pal pal. I know it was watching us in its human form during the service. And I know it came to eat our dad. Anyway, I stopped talking about it after that. With that, my uncle took a swig from his drink. I didn't know what to make of his story, but I knew he wasn't lying. That's to say, I knew he truly believed he saw a bal bal, but maybe my uncle was just a bit crazier than I thought. Sometime after my uncle told me that story, I decided to speak to my father about it. I expected my dad to laugh about it, to say, that old story again. Your uncle must have had too much to drink. Instead, he just looked at me with an uncharacteristically serious face. Your uncle and I haven't talked about that for a long time, he told me. I'm surprised he brought it up with you. It's a bad omen to mention it. My uncle had told me about my father's reaction at the time. How he'd told my father about the Balbal, and how my father had mocked him, and told him to show more respect to their father, and to stop lying about such drivel. The concern in my father's voice now caught me off guard, and I questioned him about it. There was a long pause. My father exhaled. I knew he wasn't lying. I saw it too. My dad explained that that night, when he went alone to investigate his brother's claim, he found their father's grave was covered, just as it should have been, but that it seemed freshly filled in, as if the dirt had just been placed minutes before. A scraping sound caught his attention, and he looked up towards some banana trees in the distance. There, he saw a pale, emaciated figure, with statue-like eyes and a thrashing tongue, dragging what was left of a suited corpse into the tree line. He then went home and pretended not to have seen anything. Firstly, to protect his brother, to make him think that he had just imagined the Balbal and that the creature wasn't real, and secondly, so they didn't talk about it. That would have been inviting death into their lives. If you talk too much about the Balbal, -bal, he'll come for you. My father said that he'll never know for sure, but he's certain that if he were to dig up my grandfather's grave, inside his coffin, he wouldn't find bones. Instead, he'd most likely find the trunk of a banana tree, the very item a Balbal -bal is said to replace a body with when it comes to steal one. For the sake of my uncle, I promised my father I wouldn't reveal his secret. The fact that they both had seen the same thing, and that it wasn't just my uncle's imagination. My father also made me promise, regardless of my own beliefs, that I never talk about the Bao Bao with either of them again. This was all a long time ago, and both my uncle and father have since passed. I kept my promise, and didn't bring the story up with either of them again. Thankfully, I can say I didn't see anything at their funerals. No pale figure lurking in the tree line. Nothing digging them up under cover of darkness. I don't know if I believe in the Bal Bal fully. I don't believe it's exactly how the stories say. That seeing it is an omen of death, or that talking about it will draw its attention to you. But I do believe that they both saw something at my grandfather's funeral. 
something very few people ever have or will, and that such folklore stories exist for a reason. Because a select few know the truth, and pass those stories on to the rest of us. My old high school was ancient, around 120 years old. It had had so many renovations in the past that its layout was a total mess. Even though it was a one-story building, it had a staircase that led up from one end of the corridor to the ceiling, and inaccessible doors embedded into the walls for reasons lost to time. The oddest of all of these incongruencies, though, was the watch cabin. From the outside, it looked like a normal country house. Inside was a sleeping area, big enough to fit eight tatami mats, an old-style telephone, and a small kitchen area. I never knew why it was known as the watch cabin, though, until the night of this incident. My home was far from my school, so I'd sometimes stay overnight at a friend's house who lived more locally. One day, though, I couldn't find anyone who could let me sleep over at their place, so I decided to spend the night in the disused watch cabin. Another person, a friend of mine, was going to stay there with me. We were in high spirits as we spread our futons on the floor, feeling like we were on a mini school field trip or something. We were talking and eating our dinner, when, unexpectedly, the old telephone started ringing. It made us both jump. Nobody was supposed to know we were here. I picked up the receiver. On the other end of the line was a school janitor. He was checking in on us. He said he was worried because we were staying at the watch cabin by ourselves. How he knew we were staying there was beyond us. Whichever janitor it was, he must have seen us sneak in or something. He told us not to mess around too much and so on. The usual spiel. Just as I was about to hang up the phone, he says, Oh, and one last thing. Make sure to close the curtains on the west side of the cabin. You got that? Without thinking too much, I said, sure, and hung up the old phone. When I thought about his words in more detail, however, they didn't make much sense to me. I didn't remember there being anything notable on the west side. What's he talking about? We asked each other as my friend and I looked out the west side window. What we saw there was a sinister looking old well encircled by a hemp rope, like the kind you might see at a shrine. Up until that moment, neither of us had ever noticed it because it was hidden away in a secluded spot, wedged in between the school building and the cabin. I felt a shiver run along my spine as soon as I laid eyes on it. I don't know what it is about that well, but it's kind of creepy, isn't it? I said to my friend. She agreed with me. We went to bed after rearranging our futons so they were side by side, making sure they were closer now than before, both of us feeling a little unsettled. I fell asleep quickly. I don't know how long I was asleep for, but I awoke with chills around my shoulders. I looked around and noticed my friend was missing. The cabin itself didn't have a toilet, so I assumed she had gone to the teacher's boarding house to do her business. I waited and waited, but she still hadn't returned. I opened the door and looked outside, but there was no sign of her. I felt uneasy as I went back inside. Without thinking, I opened the curtains on the west side of the cabin. There, outside, I could see my friend, standing in only her underwear beside the old well. Her hands were groped around her waist. It looked as though she was trying to pee. At first, I felt a little shocked, but then closed the curtains and tried to go back to sleep. Still, I felt that something was off about the way she was moving. I stood up, opened the curtains again, and looked out. I almost screamed when I realized what she was actually doing. She wasn't groping her waist. She was trying to tie a rope around it. I just watched on in complete disbelief. When she had finished tying the rope around her waist, she bent down and began tying the other end to a large stone by her feet. I became so scared I couldn't utter a single word, couldn't move. The next thing I saw was a pale, 
white hand come slithering out of the well. At first, the hand was moving as if it was searching for something, and then stopped once it found the rope on the ground. My friend stood there with her head bent down, almost like she was in a trance, still and unresponsive. The white hand slowly began to tug on the rope, attempting to pull the stone into the well, to drag my friend down into it. I was paralyzed with fear. It was then that my ears were filled with a shrill ringing which pierced the silence. It was the old telephone. Immediately I came to my senses and felt my body become lighter. Before I knew it, I was out of the door and running for the well. I grabbed a hold of my zombified friend and dragged her back inside the cabin, shouting her name over and over. She soon regained her senses too, and began sobbing heavily. Relief washed over me, and I began sobbing with her. We both knew we needed help, so I grabbed the old telephone and brought the receiver to my ear. There was no dial tone at all. The telephone wasn't working. We examined it, only to find that the telephone was only a shell. We hadn't noticed before, but there were no machine parts inside it, let alone a telephone line. By all accounts, it should have never worked in the first place. It was only at a later date that we heard the story surrounding that old well. When the school first opened, students kept ending their lives by throwing themselves down the well. The school tried to bury the well, but everyone who worked on burying it started perishing one after another. In the end, the school simply decided to give up on burying the well, and instead renovated the school building itself, extending it in a way that enclosed the well and made it more or less hidden. Still, occasionally, people would come and throw themselves down it. That's why they built the watch cabin. The school stationed a watchman inside to keep an eye on people, to make sure nobody ever went near that well. Thing is, in the end, even the watchman threw himself into it. Since that day, the watch cabin had remained empty. How did the telephone ring that night to warn us about closing the curtains? Better question, who was the man who I spoke to on the phone? I sometimes wonder if it was the old watchman, still standing guard after all those years. My friend John recently convinced me to share this story that happened to us near McCall, Idaho. We'd like to hear what you all make of it, cause it sure beats the hell out of us. John's parents owned a lakeside cabin, and we had decided to spend the weekend there with our other friend Tom. We just planned on kicking back with a few beers, going out and enjoying nature. This place was quite a ways out of town, pretty much in the middle of nowhere not another living person around for miles in any direction. We shared some laughs on our journey there, talking about all the things we were going to get up to. The place was a small but stunning log cabin, overlooking this picturesque little lake. We spent what was left of the daylight unpacking, cracking open cold ones, and swimming in that lake. We dived off the wooden dock into the water, cannonballing each other and just generally having a fun time. Night time rolled around, and the three of us were playing cards inside the living room area of the cabin. It was a nice, peaceful evening, and we were starting to wind down after the long day. Now it was a relatively quiet night, but at around 11pm, things became real silent. Any rustling outside had stopped along with the sound of the breeze and the hooting of birds. Out of nowhere, this eerie silence just filled the air. There was nothing suggesting danger, but we all looked at each other, like we all felt something strange in the atmosphere. It's hard to explain, but for a few seconds, the nothingness felt like something. Something horrible. That's when this loud splash broke the silence. It sounded like something huge had just fallen from a great height into the lake. 
we rushed outside to see what it was. That's the curious part. The water was completely still, no ripples whatsoever. But there was something there, something large floating in the lake. We got nearer to the water's edge to take a closer look. We could make it out now. It wasn't a thing. It was a person. A body floating face down in the water, arms outstretched. It looked like a man, and it seemed as if we were too late to help. The body was bloated, like a waterlogged corpse. Where the hell had he come from? Nobody else was meant to be around anywhere nearby. We all started freaking out, and John ran down to the wooden docks walkway to try and pull the guy out. I fumbled for my phone to call for an ambulance. Tom looked on in horror as John got to the end of the walkway and kneeled down to grab the body as it floated by the dock. As I was on the phone, I heard John shriek. Something had spooked him real bad. Tom ran to his aid, but John came rushing back to intercept him, pale as a ghost. Guys, there's nothing we can do for him. He's gone. Come on, let's get back inside. Upon hearing this, Tom looked concerned. Dude, he said. We can't just leave him there. We have to get him out. Tom started moving towards the body. No, Tom, said John. Not you. Come on, back inside. Now. John's tone was so serious. I hadn't heard him speak like that in the longest time. It kind of frightened me, to be honest. And it definitely convinced Tom, who turned back and hurried inside the cabin. We all waited in the living area for the ambulance to arrive, looking outside every now and then to see the body still floating face down in the water. The old red and blue lights took a long time to get to us, but as soon as they pulled up, we rushed out to greet them. We told them about the body in the lake and went to point it out to them. But that's the thing. It wasn't there. The corpse was nowhere to be seen. Where the hell had it gone? Had it sunk? Divers searched the small lake and found no trace of a body whatsoever. The water was empty. There were absolutely no tire tracks near the cabin. Nothing unusual or out of place. Nowhere for anyone to go. Where the hell had the corpse gone? The man had been face down in the water for ages. He wasn't exactly in any condition to just stand up and walk away. If this was some guy just messing with us, we had no idea how or why. This whole experience shook me up pretty bad, but I honestly wouldn't be sharing this story if it wasn't for what John told me. Remember that John shrieked? Well, he hadn't told us what scared him so much that night because he didn't want to freak Tom out. But, in private, John confessed to me what had happened. He said that as he leant down to examine the body, the corpse's head turned up to look at him. Its hand grabbed his arm. Its face was charred, its eyes milky white. It looked at me, bro, said John. It looked at me, and it said... Why you, not Tom? John told me this with complete sincerity, and I for one believe him. We've never been back to that cabin since, and I think we'll keep it that way. I don't claim to be a saint, and some of my decisions in this story might make some of you think I did the wrong thing. But believe me, at the time, Self-preservation was my number one concern, and unless you find yourself in a similar situation, I don't think you can say you wouldn't make the same call as I did. With all that said, here's my story. I live in Missouri, in a small town far from any major cities. A short drive from my house is this really huge forest. A few years ago, I was out walking deep in those very woods, clearing my head after a pretty messy breakup. I was in a bad place mentally, and by the time I came to my senses, I realized that I had wandered far off the beaten track. I was deep in the woods now. 
damn it, I thought to myself. As I stumbled through the brush, to my surprise, I saw another person hunched down in a ditch. His back was turned to me. That was remarkably odd. This was an extremely secluded spot. Why was this guy so deep in the woods as well? And what on earth was he doing? Hiding? Spying on someone? I hesitated, unsure of whether or not I should approach him. I decided I would. Uh, hey, I said. I don't suppose you know the way back to- Jesus, shh! He cut me off. I clearly startled him. As he turned to face me, I could see that he was covered in mud and sweat. He looked terrified. In a quiet voice, I asked him if he was okay. He motioned for me to get down. As I edged closer to the guy, I could see that one of his lower legs was all bloody and injured. I asked him what the hell was going on. Little did I know the trouble I had just stumbled into. This poor guy had been out herping by himself when he stumbled upon some meth lab hidden deep in the forest. Some meth heads were inside cooking when they noticed him snooping around. Fearing that their operation was going to be busted, they came out with a couple of rifles and started firing at the guy. He ran through the forest with the men still chasing behind him, intent on killing him and probably burying him in an unmarked grave. He made it as far as he could when he noticed one of his legs was in immense pain. Because of all of the adrenaline, he hadn't realized that one of the shots had hit him in the leg. Now, no longer able to run, he found a spot to hide. The ditch. That's the situation I found myself in. I was now hiding in a ditch with this incapacitated man, with god knows how many armed meth heads out searching for him. I couldn't exactly leave the guy there. And even if I did, what if I bumped into one of the men searching for him? They'd probably just blow me away too. We didn't have any cell signal out there, so we were really between a rock and a hard place. We must have hid there for a good ten minutes together when we heard rustling up ahead of us. We couldn't see who was making the noise, but it definitely sounded like human footsteps to me. We remained silent. Thankfully, whoever it was passed by without noticing us. Another ten minutes must have passed. The tension was getting too much for us to bear. The guy tells me that he thinks the coast is clear and that he was going to hobble back the way he came. Said that he had a car about 20 minutes away. If we could get to it, we'd be able to escape, find cell signal, and call for help. I didn't feel comfortable with that plan. I just met this guy. For all I knew, he could have been anybody. Realistically, anyone could be chasing him for any number of reasons. I didn't want to get caught up in this mess. Not any more than I already was, that is. Not to mention, he was acting erratic and unreliable. I decided that I was going to go my own way, back the way I think I came. It was a quick decision I had to make, and I decided to go with my gut, and my gut told me not to completely trust this guy. We both checked that the area was still clear, gave each other a look of good luck, and then made off our separate ways. I turned and looked as he limped off. I hurtled through the brush, hoping I wouldn't bump into anybody. As I ran back in the direction I had come from, I heard something that almost froze me in my place. Two gunshots in quick succession, ringing out in the distance behind me. Then, a third. I swallowed my fear and continued to run. I eventually found my way back onto a familiar path. It led me out of the woods, back to civilization, and back to cell signal. I called the police immediately. After combing those woods, the cops found the lab. It had recently been cooked in, but there were no signs of the meth heads anywhere. They never found the injured man. To this day, no bodies have ever been reported as found in those woods, so the optimist in me likes to think that those shots weren't aimed at the herper. The realist in me, however, thinks he's buried 
deep in those woods somewhere. I'll tell you this much, though. I'm glad I went the other way. When I heard those shots, I knew I had made the right decision. Always follow your gut. My co-worker and I were driving through northern Arizona, on Highway 89, between Flagstaff and Page. It was late, something like 2am. We had recently finished our late night shift. Up ahead on the lonely road, I noticed a set of glowing eyes in my headlights. Must be an animal up in the middle of the road. Not wanting to hit the critter, I let my foot off the gas and slowed down to go around it. As we came to pass it, I saw that it wasn't one animal at all. There were four or five, well, coyotes or dogs I guess, gathered around something in the road. But there was something wrong with all of them. They all looked up at us as we came up beside them, and their faces were contorted, morphed. Their features are not in the right place. The thing that they were huddled around in the road appeared to be another dead coyote, all bloody and crooked, like it had been hit by a car. As we drove off, my co-worker told me that one of the coyotes was following behind us. I looked in my mirror, and sure enough, one of them was chasing us off the shoulder of the road. As we gained speed, so did the coyote. I floored it and looked over. I swear to God, the bloody creature stood up on its hind legs and was keeping pace with our vehicle, looking more human than animal now. How it was moving so goddamn fast, I don't know. It was charging towards our vehicle. Luckily, as we picked up speed, we managed to outpace the thing. I could see in my mirror that it continued to chase behind us, becoming smaller and smaller in my vision before fading into the distance. We spent the rest of our journey back home trying to wrap our heads around what we had just seen. I dropped my co-worker off at his house, both of us just as confused as when the event had happened. That night, as I lay in bed, I heard strange noises coming from the woods outside my house. It almost sounded like coyotes, but not quite. Something was off about their cries. They sounded distorted and slower than natural. Their wails went on for a good long while. I refused to look outside my window, terrified that I'd never be able to unsee the image waiting for me. The wailing suddenly stopped. Then, quick footsteps approached my house. Whatever was in those woods was now outside my window. A human voice spoke. What's wrong? Nothing. Go to sleep. It was like two different voices coming from one source. It's hard to explain. These words repeated several times in exactly the same way, like a recording. As they did, a loud ringing filled my ears like tinnitus, getting louder and louder. It was becoming too much to bear. A few seconds and a heart attack later, the ringing and the voices abruptly stopped, and the normal silence of the Arizona countryside was all that filled the air. After all that noise, it sounded quieter than it ever had before. I heard nothing more that night. The scariest part, to me, was when I met up with my co-worker the next evening. I told him about the strange noises outside my house during the night. His face became ghostly pale. Dude, he said, I heard the same noises last night too. Several years later, I heard from a native gentleman about these creatures called skimwalkers. Creatures that can mimic the appearance and noises of other creatures that they've killed in the past, including humans. They usually can't imitate their victims perfectly though, and something about them almost always looks and sounds off. He also mentioned that they can only repeat the last words and screams of their prey, and that they'd use them to try and lure people into their midst. After hearing his description of these creatures, 
I remembered my experience years earlier. I couldn't help but wonder if those are what my co-worker and I encountered on Highway 89 that night. I told the native my story. Huh, you got lucky, he said. They usually don't leave people alone. <laughs> Not until they get them. I live on a farm in the Lone Star State, and I have some serious problems with my neighbor. He's a real pain in my behind, to say the least. We have somewhat of a rivalry, seeing how he's a farmer himself. I gotta say though, I'm grateful for that rivalry, and I'll tell you why. I'd been having some trouble with a few of my vehicles a while back. Someone had been slashing their tires. Whoever had done this had also left manure in my mailbox a few weeks earlier, and put broken glass all over my driveway a couple of weeks after that. I was sure that my neighbor was responsible, but when I confronted him about it, he denied any involvement in any of the incidents. I was going to need evidence to prove that it was him, then I could hit him where it really hurt, namely his wallet. Thus, I installed a few security cameras around my property, small enough as not to be noticeable. My trap was set, now I just needed to wait for him to strike again. Perhaps a month passed by, and in all that time, there had been no new incidents on my farm. Maybe my neighbor had noticed me installing the cameras. Well, if that was the case, I was just glad it stopped him from coming onto my property, tampering with my vehicles, and pulling all sorts of horrible pranks if you want to call them that. One afternoon, I found myself driving alone back to my farm. I'd been out of town for the whole weekend visiting family. I was running a little low on fuel, so I stopped at a gas station along the way. I pumped in my gas and went inside the store to pay. Mustn't have been more than five minutes. I hopped back in my car and continued on my way, singing to myself and enjoying some alone time on the long journey back. A good twenty minutes passed, and by chance, I recognized someone walking along the road, heading in the direction of my farm. It was one of my farmhands, a young guy who had been working for me for a short while. He was carrying supplies back from town. Why was he walking instead of driving, I wondered. I pulled over and honked at him, motioning for him to get in with me. Sorry boss, he said. I woke up this morning, and you'll never guess what. The tires on the track have been slashed again. I was going to call you as soon as I got back to the farm. Oh, my neighbor, I suspected. I've got him this time. In a rage, I sped back to my farm, eager to look over my security footage and catch my neighbor in the act, to put a stop to this nonsense once and for all. We arrived back at the farm, rushed inside to the computer, and loaded up that day's footage. There, on CCTV, was a masked figure sneaking onto my property and slashing my tires. It was my neighbor, for sure. His same build, his same scraggly hair hanging out the back of the mask. I was furious, and immediately called the police. Oh, this was juicy. I had finally caught him red-handed. My farmhand and I checked through the rest of the day's footage, seeing if he'd been up to anything else. Nothing else seemed out of the ordinary. We got to the part where we had just pulled up into the driveway. That's when the footage displayed something that took a while to fully sink in. The footage showed what we expected. In it, you could see my farmhand and I pull into the driveway, get out of the car and rush into the house. Nothing else happened for a few moments. The car just sat there, parked outside the house. Then, the back door slowly opened. Somebody had been hiding in the back seat of my car. A man I had never seen before in my life carefully exited the vehicle, looking towards the house as if to check if he'd been seen. He then sprinted off my property. I immediately grabbed a rifle and headed outside. I checked the back seat of my car. Nobody else there, thank God. But there was something that made my gut sink. Stabbed into one of the cloth seats was a hunting knife. 
The cops reviewed the footage and took the matter seriously. They later let me know that they had reviewed the footage from the gas station I had stopped at as well. They told me that while I was inside paying for my gas, some wacko snuck inside the back seat of my car. He had been lying down the whole journey back to the farm, hiding mere inches behind me. Why he targeted me and what he planned on doing, I can't say, but nothing else ever came of it. In a way, I'm glad my neighbor caused me so many problems. If it wasn't for him, I'd never have installed those cameras. Nor would I have passed my farmhand on the way back to the farm. I'm guessing that if my farmhand hadn't been in the car with me, things would have ended very differently. I have thalassophobia. This is defined as an intense and persistent fear of the sea, or of sea travel. It can also include the fear of being in large bodies of water, fear of the vast emptiness of the sea, of sea waves, and of distance from land. Most people find this odd, considering I grew up on an island in the Pacific Northwest. My relationship with the ocean is one of love and hate. I find it beautiful and mysterious and terrifying all at the same time. I can ride a ferry or a boat like riding in a car, and I can even swim in the shallows. It's what's beyond there that scares me. This experience is responsible for that fear. I was ten years old. My grandparents lived right on the beach where the ferry docks. When I say right on the beach, I mean there was only a twenty foot long yard and a stone bulkhead separating their home from the shore. I grew up digging for clams when the tide was low, building forts from driftwood and swimming in the freezing cold waters of Puget Sound. I had no fear of the sea. I guess it also helped that my parents' home was close to the ocean too. This particular morning, my grandfather had recruited me to help him repair one of the crab pots that he had set up the previous week. It was early, and there was a layer of fog covering the water. I hopped in the small boat and buckled my life jacket as my grandfather pushed us out into the sea. I let my fingers slide across the top of the water as we moved farther and farther out. The sea became darker and darker. Soon I could no longer see the bottom. We stopped at the bright orange and red buoys that marked our pots. While my grandpa pulled up the broken one, I stared over the side of our small boat. I could see a small school of fish swimming just below the surface. My grandpa asked me for some pliers. I reached down into the bag of tools in front of me and pulled out a pair. As I handed them to my grandpa, I looked over the edge of the boat again. The school of fish had scattered quickly. I looked closer into the darkness and saw two eyes staring back at me. I knew what fish eyes looked like, and these were not the eyes of a fish. They looked human. They were large and wide, and they were coming closer, rising from the depths of the water. They were wild and horrible. I jerked back causing the boat to rock. My grandpa grabbed the back of my life jacket to stop me from falling over the edge. Whoa, kiddo. What's got you spooked? I pointed into the water and just said, Eyes. My grandpa looked at me quizzically and then peered over the side of the boat where I'd been. Now, my grandpa was an Irish World War II veteran, a former boxer who was covered in tattoos. Not a lot rattled the guy. When he looked back at me, I saw the distress on his weathered face. Without a word, he threw the crab pot he had been working on back in the water. Jules, don't look into the water, okay? And keep your hands in your lap. The tone of his voice was low and serious, but I could tell by the way he called me by my nickname he was trying to keep me calm. I was the baby of the family and my grandpa had always been fiercely protective of me. He rode back to shore faster than I thought a 76-year-old man could. Of course, my curiosity got the better of me, and I glanced into that dark water. About a foot below the surface, I saw what looked like black hair floating 
moving through the water. I yelped and felt tears rolling down my cheeks. When the boat hit the rocky sand, my grandpa jumped out and pulled the boat out of the water. I was too scared to move. My grandpa picked me up and carried me up the stone steps to the yard. He didn't set me down until we walked through the front door. My grandma was standing in the living room with a concerned look on her face. Sweet Jesus, Richard. What's wrong? You're as white as a sheet. He set me down and knelt down next to me. Go in your grandma's room and watch TV, okay? He said to me, ruffling my hair and wiping a tear from my cheek. I ran into her bedroom and jumped on her big bed where their black cat, Dynamite, was sleeping. I cuddled up next to him as he purred. I strained my ears to listen to my grandparents going back and forth in the living room. Barbara, they were human eyes, like some goddamn banshee rising up from the depths of hell. Scared the kid half to death. My grandmother didn't say anything. I'm not taking the kids out on that boat. Not anymore. I tried to focus on the TV. I tried not to think about those eyes. What that thing could have possibly been. I had nightmares for weeks after that. As I got older, the memory seemed to fade. It still lurked in the back of my mind, but not as strongly as it did before. I often wondered if I had really seen it at all, if, in my adolescence, I had let my imagination get away from me. When I was a junior in high school, my grandfather passed away. Before he did, I remember sitting in the living room with him. He rocked back and forth in his old chair as he carved the hunk of wood in his hand. Hey, do you remember that time that we went out to fix the crab pot and we saw that thing in the water? I asked him. I half expected him to look at me like I was crazy. But he didn't. He stopped rocking. He didn't look up from his carving, but I could see his facial expression change. Yeah, but there was something I didn't tell you at the time. You were too young, and I didn't want to spook you any more than you already were. When I was pulling the boat in, I saw a head poking out the water. Just the top. It was covered in black hair, and those eyes were staring right at me. That's why I picked you up out of the boat and carried you. I didn't want to chance that thing, snatching you. I sat there in disbelief. Even at 83, and having survived two heart attacks and a stroke, this still shook him to the core. Not too long after this conversation, my grandfather passed away. As I said in the beginning of the story, I have a love-hate relationship with the ocean. It's beautiful and mysterious, but I'm sure that in its depths harbor dark things we cannot even begin to fathom. Whenever I ride the ferry, which is often... I find myself staring into the inky abyss of the sound and expect to see those eyes staring back. There are a lot of crazy stories from Florida, but I think my experience has to be considered one of the weirdest. It took place two years ago on a woody trail in Lee County, and I swear it's a hundred percent true. My girlfriend and I were driving home one night, and at one point or other, must have taken a wrong turn somewhere. We were coming home from a weekend break, and were taking an unfamiliar route back. It was dark, and our GPS wasn't working right on the country roads. We were both getting pretty frustrated, when, by chance, we saw another car parked up ahead of us in the distance. All the doors of the vehicle opened, and four figures stepped out. Perfect, we thought. Maybe they can help us. I rolled down the driver's side window and slowly drove up to where they were. I called out to them, asking for directions. We must have only been about twenty feet away from them and noticed that they were all standing with their backs to us. They were frozen still, completely motionless. Hey, uh, are you guys okay? I asked. No response. I drove up right next to their car, and again, I asked, Well, are you okay? In total unison, they all turned their heads to look at me. 
And when I say their heads, I mean only their heads. Some of them twisted their heads so much they were on backwards. The rest of their bodies remained perfectly still. But the worst part was their faces. When I saw them, I swear I felt like I was going to faint. They were pale white and completely featureless, like store mannequins or crash test dummies. The one closest to our car started shaking its head, no. Its head was moving very fast and jerky, and only became faster and faster. They all turned their bodies to face us, and started slowly moving towards our car, their movements stiff and awkward. We didn't stick around to see any more. My girlfriend yelled drive, and believe me, I did. I looked back as we drove off, and they were all standing still again, except for the one that kept shaking its head real fast. Had I been the only one to have experienced this, I would have thought I was going crazy. Hell, everyone I've told has called me nuts. But my girlfriend can back me up, and neither of us will ever forget what we saw in those woods that night. Is there anyone else out there that's encountered something similar? We can't be the only ones. I live in a small town that sits alongside Bayou Tesh, a huge body of water that stretches on for 125 miles in the heart of Cajun country. Where we're from, there's a little known urban legend. Only folks who live around the bayou seem to know about it, and even then, only in certain circles. I only came to learn about it after I had an encounter with this thing myself. I'll get straight to it. I was out walking with a couple of friends of mine a few years back, one of those boring summer afternoons where you don't have anything to do but wander around aimlessly. Out of nowhere, all the sounds around me stopped. All I could hear was an eerie, loud breathing filling the air. It wasn't my breathing, nor the breathing of my friends. It was coming from elsewhere, but it was loud, and it was prominent, and it was literally the only thing I could hear. Do you guys hear that? I asked my friends. Well, I think I asked. I could feel the words escape my mouth, come out of my throat, but I couldn't hear them. I couldn't hear what my friends were saying back to me either. Their lips were moving, but all I could hear was that damn breathing. No birds, or rustling, or footsteps, or any other natural sounds at all. It was surreal. Hold up, I said, and tried to say, and motioned for my friends to wait for me. I then moved towards where I thought the breathing was coming from, behind a few trees next to the bayou. As I got closer, the sound of the breathing became louder and louder. I knew what curiosity did to the cat, but nonetheless, I followed that damn breathing to its source. It's hard to explain why. I just felt compelled to. It was like a magnet, drawing me in. The weird part was the different sound of each breath. They were more like gasps, if that makes sense. Like the person was struggling to breathe. They were all different from each other too, as if every breath was coming from a different set of lungs. I continued on to where I thought it was coming from. I came to a break in the foliage. There, thirty feet ahead of me, sitting on the edge of the bayou, was a man. He was wearing a western-style hat and a brown leather jacket. That's about all I could make out, seeing how his back was turned to me as he looked out across the muddy water. He was completely motionless, like he was really focused on something, but there was no doubt in my mind that the breathing was coming from him. Despite the weirdness of the situation, he didn't seem scary to me. I felt calm and serene. For whatever reason, I thought about approaching him. I managed to shake that thought out of my head, and instead called out a soundless, Hey! Only the man's head moved. It slowly turned around to face me. His skin was the same shade as the leather of his jacket and he looked to be half decayed. He had no lips, no eyes, just exposed teeth and two huge black holes. 
After staring at me for a few seconds, the man began to stand up. All sounds came back to me in that instant. As I looked into those dark pits in his face, my sense of calm disappeared. Now all I was filled with was dread. I bolted and ran back to my friends, told them we needed to leave immediately, and explained everything on the way. Most of them told me I was crazy, but one of them told me to come and talk with his grandparents. You see, the folks whose family have lived around Bayou Tesh for generations, they know about the man. I've heard several names floating around for him. Swamp Man, the Cajun Devil, but most just call him the Bayou Man. They say he's like a siren, that he travels around the circumference of Bayou Tesh on a continuous loop and draws people away from their friends and families, brings them out to him. Then he lures them to the water's edge and holds them under the muddy water until they expire, leaves them at the bottom of the bayou for the gators. His weird breathing, they say it's made up of the final gasps of each of the people he's ended. You can sleep tight now, they all tell me. The bayou man will only try to get you one time. You got lucky. I guess I did. I'm glad I didn't fall for his trick. In my late teens, I used to take part in competitive snowboarding. One of my competitions brought me to Snowshoe Mountain in West Virginia. While I was there, I couldn't shake this weird feeling. I chalked it up merely to pre-competition excitement, to the constant grey skies, and the fact that I had to cross two state lines to get here with my mum driving me. I made friends with some of the other competitors, one guy in particular. He and I both practiced the course together from time to time. It soon became quite apparent that not all of these courses were as well maintained as they ought to be. Watch out for that one kicker, I was told. It's dangerous. For reference, a kicker is a type of jump in a sense. While normal jumps are wedge-shaped and shoot the snowboarder upward, a kicker is more curved and launches you forward. They can be dangerous, because if you hit them wrong, you're basically throwing yourself headlong in any direction but the way you want to go, and there's little you can do to recover at that point when you're speeding down the slope at roughly 25 miles an hour. None of us wanted to hit that kicker very hard. There were too many trees around for our liking. The thing is, with this competition guaranteeing the winners a spot in the nationals, many of us were itching for as many points as we could get. The day of the competition came. It was a weird day. Grey clouds. Everything felt heavy and off. I took my run among the first. I made it down the mountain, making decent time. On the way back up, I saw it. Those iconic red jackets, and a long stretcher covered up. Instantly, I knew. My buddy had gone hard on that kicker, after all. The officials tried to play it calm, but there's no coming back from a broken neck. A dark mood hung over us all. It was getting late, and my mum was ready to go home. Frankly, so was I. As soon as I got my awards, my mum hurried me into the car, and I managed to slip into the driver's seat, still in my gear. The drive back home was going to be a long one. It led us down winding, ill-lit back roads all the way through the mountains. The clouds from that morning never went away, covering the stars. Nor did that weird feeling. I was tired, sore, and the thought of my new buddy, now deceased, hung in the back of my mind. I just wanted to get away from there. After driving for a while, I started to bake inside my heavy snowboarding gear. I told my mum I needed to pull over and take some layers off. It was very dark and the only traffic on this road, other than us, were a few semi-trucks. Thick wooded slopes and mountain rock faces lined the highway. No off-ramps till we got down from the mountain. Up ahead, I saw a small, curved dirt turnoff, barely the length of three cars. I quickly pulled in towards it. As the car eased to a stop, I noticed something in the dim reach of my headlights. A large, painted boulder, with something sitting on it. 
Reaching for the car door, I strained my eyes to see what it was. It looked like a large, weird-shaped, upright log with thick branches. What is that? I wondered. Suddenly, my mum started to hit my arm. Get us out of here, she ordered frantically. What? What is it? I demanded, still trying to make out the shape. Drive! She shouted. I could feel the weight of her hand hitting me through all my thick layers. Then my tired eyes focused and I could make out what was on the rock. It wasn't a log. It was a severed deer's head. It was perched upright on the rock, its cloudy eyes shining in the headlights, its tongue hanging out, red oozing down the side of the boulder, staining it a dark color. My heart started pounding in my chest. I looked around and noticed there were no other cars or trucks in the small pocket. There was room really for only one or two cars. Drive, my mum shouted again. I had to wait for a large semi to pass by first before pulling back out onto the main road. All the while, that thing was staring at me. It was only a few minutes, but it felt like an eternity. I could barely think between my mum shouting and the flood of panic squeezing my chest. As soon as that truck passed, I peeled back onto the highway. Where did that thing come from? Who put it there? And more importantly, why? There were no other people in the area that I could see, and no way for someone to park a truck or car. Was it some sick prank? Was there something waiting in the trees just out of sight? Was it really some sort of trap meant to throw us off? Or was it just some sort of omen related to my now gone buddy? I have no idea, and I really don't want to know. But yeah, that's my story. Just be careful if you find yourself driving through the mountains of West Virginia. Always be aware, and don't take chances unless you have to. We made it down the mountain okay, and I've been back to snowshoe since then. Thankfully, I've never come across anything like that again. It was just a weird day, I guess. A very dark, weird day. During the midsummer, usually around the middle of July, me and a few of my good friends, Ryan, Kevin and Tommy, always made time to go up to Kev's family cabin, located on Vermilion Lake, way up north in the forests of Minnesota. Throughout all of our young years, we would always be accompanied by Kevin's dad, and sometimes a few of our dads as well. Once we were juniors in high school, however, we felt mature enough to go to the cabin on our own, finally without Kevin's dad or any other adult supervision. My friend's cabin was very remote and very little, based upon a large island. Other cabins were on the island, but the next one closest to us was a solid half mile away at least, and you could only get to it by taking a man-made path around the island. I want to mention that to get to my friend's cabin, you had to park on a gravel road on the opposite side of the island and take his boat across the lake about a half mile. Vermilion Lake is huge. My mind always had a tendency to run around while I was sleeping there. The cabin was all on one level, with only two bedrooms next to one another, a kitchen and living room area connected to them, and a bathroom in the back of the cabin. And there was always one window in each of the rooms with no curtains to them at all, so it was very easy to see outside to the woods and lake. And this is where my mind would run, as I always thought about someone peering in. And they never were, of course. I had been to the cabin about a dozen times during my lifespan, and nothing bad ever happened there, so the older I got, the easier it was to sleep. Now for the event. On this particular trip, we planned to stay around five nights. On the third night during the trip, when we were finally on our own, we had set up a campfire and had been drinking beers all night. I don't condone underage drinking, but being the rebels we were, we just so happened to sneak some. We went out to the dock to stare up at the magnificent stars and enjoy our buzz, when all of a sudden we heard something out on the water that sounded like a fish jumping out to catch a bug. We quickly looked over at the lake, wondering where the splash came from, our fishing poles at the ready. Thankfully the moon was out that night, which lit up the lake. Without it, it would have been pitch black, 
what with there being no city lights for miles upon miles. Ryan began to point out to something. Um, guys, what the hell's that? After looking closely and finally spotting what he was pointing at, the only way I can describe it is it simply looked like a head floating out in the middle of the lake, staring at us directly. It was about three quarters worth of a football field out in the lake from the dock. It had long, black hair and a very pale, skin-like face, but I couldn't make out the eyes, mouth, nose or chin, as if it was just a blob of pale skin with long black hair over it. I'll never forget that feeling that came over me. The hairs on my legs, neck and arms all stood up, and I felt paralyzed on the inside and ready to go home at that moment. We told ourselves it was just a loon. Those birds are very popular night drifters on the lake, and they do their hunting late. I mean, it was possible that a loon all of a sudden popped up in the water after hunting for a bit. Or at least, we tried to convince ourselves of that scenario. All of us had the creeps. That damn thing wasn't moving one bit, just treading water in the same place. We went back to our campfire, lit it even brighter, and headed inside to drink more. We soon forgot about the head-like thing with the help of the beer. That is, until I had to use the bathroom really bad, and the one inside was preoccupied. I went outside to do my business, seeing how we were in the great outdoors. Whilst taking a pee and glancing at the beautiful moonlit lake, I noticed that the black, circular object was still there, but about thirty yards closer now, still looking as if it was staring right up at me. I could easily see the nose on this thing's face. Again, it was very pale, like it hadn't seen the sun for years. A very, very uneasy feeling came over me, and I immediately went back inside and told my friends to come and look. They all came outside to see it still there, looking at us as if the head was corked up and its chin was in the air. Nobody dared go down to the dock anymore, and we immediately went back inside, deciding it probably wasn't a loon. For a loon to stay in the same spot for almost an hour or two made no sense to any of us. This head-like object was stiff as a board and not moving a single muscle, just staring up at us from the deck. And there was no ripple effect from it at all. We said it was just a log and went back inside. I could tell everyone else felt uneasy too. A few hours passed. It was super late into the night at this point and we all knew we needed sleep. Being my curious self, I looked back outside one last time, and the black object had completely vanished. I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief, thinking the log must have floated off or just hit shore somewhere else. There was no AC in the cabin, and we had to open the windows, or else we'd fry in the middle of summer. Me and Tommy slept in the living room, while my two other friends slept in the two bedrooms with their doors open. Not being able to sleep, but keeping my eyes shut, I began to hear someone walking around outside at the bottom of the stairs to the cabin. I thought I was about to have a heart attack. No question that whoever or whatever I heard down there was on the deck, pacing back and forth, their feet clicking on the wood. It was as if they weren't sure what to do with themselves. It lasted for about three minutes. I wanted to whisper to my buddy, but was frozen in fear. I just kept my eyes shut and my ears on full alert. The footsteps sounded like they took two rapid steps up the deck stairs all of a sudden, but then turned around and sounded like they were sprinting away down the man-made path. After it sounded like the steps were long gone and a couple of minutes had passed, I woke up Tommy and asked him if he'd heard the steps. We both sat up and were startled by Ryan walking out of his room and saying, We need to leave. Now. There was something very disturbing about his expression. I asked him why. He woke up Kevin in the other room. Come on, get to the boat. It's time to go. What? Ryan, what the hell's wrong with you? Kevin asked. Ryan explained to us quickly while grabbing his stuff. I'll never forget what he told us. Nor will my other friends. He said that when he was turning sides on his bed to get more comfortable... He saw someone peeking in at the top right corner of the window. The figure quickly shifted out of his view. He said all he saw was one eye, ghostly white skin, and long 
black hair down the window. When looking back at what he experienced, it chills us to the bone to realize that since this space was in the top right corner of the window in my friend's room, it was either damn near eight foot tall, standing on something like bricks trying to peek in, or was floating. Tommy and I told the others what we'd heard outside the cabin, absolutely disturbed the hell out of our minds and feeling like we were going to be sick. We all packed up our stuff and booked it, not cleaning the cabin or anything. We locked up, and as we headed down the stairs, we saw bare footprints in the dirt, heading off along the path and all around the cabin. We picked up our pace, made it to the boat, not knowing what was watching us or around us, threw our stuff in the boat, untied it, and sped off. I didn't even think about the head in the water. My eyes were just glued to the island, trying to spot anything moving. I saw nothing. When we finally got our stuff packed in the car, we hopped inside and took off. We drove for about ten miles, when, out of the blue, Ryan all of a sudden broke down in the car, sobbing, saying things like, What was it, guys? What was it? Oh god, what did I see? We called to tell our parents what had happened on the way back, told them that Ryan was freaking out. They said to just get home safely and quickly. It was late, about four or five in the morning, but no one slept. It was a very quiet ride home. My friend's dad, who owns the cabin, went up that following weekend. Said he didn't experience anything weird while there, but did mention that the bare footprints were still lingering about. That bugged him badly. What Ryan saw in the window really hit him hard. After his breakdown, he had trouble sleeping for multiple nights and ended up having to seek help for a couple of weeks and hop on some sleeping medicine. As time went on, he ended up being fine, but isn't too comfortable sleeping next to a window without a curtain. To this day, I can't explain what happened, nor why it seemed to happen to us. Nothing has ever happened at that cabin since that night, so we're told by Kevin's dad at least. I personally have never gone back to the cabin, which really makes me sad, because I have some great childhood memories from there. Tommy and Kevin have both been back and been fine, but Ryan refuses to ever set foot there again, and I'm with him. A lot of people have cabins on that island, so it could have been a prank in the making, and Ryan busted it when he saw the person in the window. It could also have been a person wanting to do something worse to us. I'll never be able to explain what was floating in the lake, but the fact that that incident, along with the footprints and someone looking in at Ryan, all happened in the same night, seems like more than a coincidence to me. I was out hiking in Morgan Monroe State Forest with my girlfriend one afternoon. It was a nice day, and the insects and birds were chirping away. Out of nowhere, the pair of us heard what sounded like three gunshots, one after another, they went off not too far down the trail. We looked at each other. A few seconds of silence. Then another three shots. Is that gunfire? My girlfriend asked me. I nodded, unable to think what else it could be out here. We decided to turn back, not wanting to chance running into some hillbilly nutjob or whatever. What struck me at that moment was the lack of any kind of sound coming from the woods. After the shots rang out, there wasn't any kind of nature sound at all. I mean, I get that the birds might have been scared away, but even the insects had fallen silent. We were both getting some weird vibes. The situation just felt unnatural. In amongst all the surreal silence, we heard one thing just behind us. Footsteps snapping on twigs. We turned to see who was following us. I half expected to see a hunter with a rifle. I was wrong. Moving down the trail towards us was this thing. A humanoid figure that obviously wasn't human. It was like looking at a living silhouette. Even in the light, it looked like it was hiding in the darkness. The thing just looked like a shadow. That's the best way I can describe it. The sunlight just wasn't hitting it for some reason. From its outline, it looked to just be skin and bones, and it was tall, real tall. 
at least a foot larger than me, and I'm not a small dude. I'd scarcely believe I'd even seen the thing had my girlfriend not been there as well. It was walking in long strides, gaining a lot of distance with each step. Needless to say, we bolted back the way we came. I've no idea if that thing pursued us or not. We were both too terrified to turn back and look. We made it back to our vehicle and hightailed it home, not stopping for anything. We've never been back to Morgan Monroe since. Unless the both of us momentarily lost our minds at the exact same time, then there's something out in those woods, and neither of us plan on going back to find out what it is. So, near where I live, but a little farther out in the sticks, there's a glorified gravel path in the woods called Rube Hill. It runs maybe three miles long, and only half a mile of it's paved. On the south end is the pavement, with a few old but otherwise normal houses dotted around it. Deceptively average at that point. Then the houses end, the pavement ends, and the gravel road shoots up a steep hill. It's not taken care of at all. The gravel's piled up in potholes and berms, so unless you're driving a nice off-road vehicle, you'd want to take it easy. Since you'd need to drive slowly, you'd get a nice view of the handmade signs nailed to trees with messages like, No Trespassing, and We're Watching You, scrawled in Sharpie. At the top of the hill, the road winds lazily for a little under a mile before diving back down the other side of the hill. The gravel is in equally crappy condition on this side. After you reach the bottom of the hill, the road cuts straight for about a mile through cornfields before intersecting with another road. The reason I'm so familiar with the layout is that I've taken friends out on late night drives along this road to scare the bejesus out of them. Never an elaborate prank, I'd just drive slowly and play creepy music to get them amped up and paranoid. I always made sure to tell them about the meth heads and their labs out there, and how the sheriffs try to avoid going there because it's dangerous. I figured it was all hogwash, just stories, you know, but now I think there's an element of truth to some of those rumours. I was with my friend Aaron one night, and we decided to go on a late night drive along Rube Hill to freak ourselves out. We took off, drove down the various country highways and backroads, and turned onto Rube Hill. I made sure to play extra creepy music, since Aaron and I had made the trip many times before. It honestly lost a lot of its creepy luster on me, but I still enjoyed the long drives and scaring my friends. Of course, the drive mostly went by uneventful, and we were almost across the hill, about to descend the other side. That's when Aaron started freaking out. I checked my mirrors to see what had spooked him so much, and saw truck headlights down the road behind us. They seemed to be back where the road first topped the hill. The truck made it under the only street light on the top of the hill, a really dim orange light, and I could see it was kicking up a ton of dirt. It was speeding towards us. I paused the music we were playing, and sure enough, with the windows down, I could hear the gravel crunching and flying like the vehicle was speeding. Keep in mind that I've driven this road dozens of times, both during the day and at night, and not once have I ever encountered another vehicle. So, having a truck speeding to seemingly catch up to us at midnight on a road supposedly filled with rumoured junkheads was pretty jarring. Usually, I don't relinquish my brakes driving down that hill. This time, I didn't even touch them. Thankfully, we got home safe and sound. The next day, I'm hanging out with one of my other friends, Chris. Chris and I are lounging around, playing video games, talking about quantum physics, Chris's favourite thing and Chipotle, my favourite thing. I of course told him about Aaron and I being chased, and I kind of hammed it up, made it come across more harrowing than it really was. Now Chris wanted to go to the road, so we waited until late at night, about 2am, and drove out to Rube Hill. This time I wasn't playing any music. I wanted to be alert. It was all going quite normally, just like usual, when I slammed on my brakes. I threw the car in park and turned to Chris. Oh, dude, you can see that too, right? Chris was just as confused as me. He looked at me and nodded. My headlights were clearly illuminating a thick metal cable stretched across the road in front of us. 
On the right, it was wrapped around a tree at roughly head height for an adult, and it was pulled taut across the road, anchored to a fence post on the left at roughly chest height. We were both sitting there, wondering what to make of it, when we heard gravel being thrown by tires behind us. I checked my mirrors, and sure enough, truck headlights were tearing ass down the road. I started freaking out. My breathing and heart rate were out of control, and I began sweating. Chris just swore quietly under his breath. I threw it into drive, pulled as far to the right as I could, and my low-sitting car slid under the cable with a loud metal-on-metal -metal scraping noise. I cringed as I heard the scrape, but I wasn't about to sit there and get deliveranced. So again, I flew down the hill, and this is the creepy cherry on the Sunday for me personally, because Chris didn't see it. As we left the tree line and entered the cornfields, I glanced to my right, past Chris, and briefly caught a glimpse of somebody standing about three or four feet back in the corn. I just felt my stomach scrunch up, and I floored the accelerator. I glanced in my rearview mirror and could see a man standing in the road behind us, illuminated by the moon and my taillights. He had a long object slung over his shoulder. I couldn't tell if it was a cane or maybe a rifle, but I didn't stay to find out. Before I could even tell Chris about it, we were around a bend and out of sight. That car had a scrape mark on the roof the rest of the time I owned it. It was a good reminder of why I never went out to that road again. I used to live in a pretty old house in Wichita. A lot of strange happenings went on there, and I'm not sure if they're related to this incident or not. Sometimes, especially at night, we'd hear what sounded like static voices whispering down the hallway, creaking footsteps in the rooms above us and see brief shadowy outlines of people moving in the corners of our eyes. We chalked it up to the house just being old, and our paranoid brains making us see things that weren't really there. In said house, there was a spare bedroom in the attic that we never really used. My wife and I didn't have any kids, still don't, and we never had any guests who needed to come and spend the night, so the room remained mostly empty. We didn't have much stuff at the time, so we didn't need to store anything up there either. My wife always talked about turning the space into a little hobby room. Now that might sound like a good decision to most of you, but I personally was against that idea. You see, the attic always had a weird effect on me. I never liked to go up there. Every time I did, I'd get these weird, electric sensations, like the air around me was static, if that makes sense. It's hard to properly articulate, but there was something really off about the whole space and I'd get uncomfortable just being up there. There was a small crawl space at the bottom of the leftmost wall, and that crawl space always freaked me out in particular. It was only a small hole that went back into the wall, barely enough space for a human to squeeze into it, but whenever I'd go near it, the strange static sensations would intensify. Just looking at the thing gave me a headache. My wife, on the other hand, never noticed anything strange about the attic. And, unfortunately for me, in this relationship, what she says goes. So I guess I was going to have to turn it into a hobby room. One night, I went up into the attic alone to start clearing some things out of it, get it ready for the transformation, so to speak. The air up there felt static and unsettling as always. It was past sundown by that point, so the one small roof window wasn't letting in any light. I flicked the light switch and, for a brief moment, the room illuminated. It stayed light just long enough for me to get fully up into the room. Then, the light bulb started to dim. I mean, the brightness of the light just became lesser and lesser, to the point where I couldn't see anything at all. After a few seconds, the bulb went completely out. Ah, oh, damn. Gonna have to replace that, I thought. That could wait. I clambered back down the ladder, back down from the darkness of the attic, rummaged through a drawer in my bedroom and pulled out a flashlight. I climbed back up into the blackness and switched the device on. Bright light came shining out of it. Then, the strangest thing happened. After maybe two or three seconds of being on full beam, the flashlight too began to fade. Its light became dimmer and dimmer, 
and within a matter of seconds, the batteries had completely run out of juice. That was a strange coincidence, but nothing more than that, I thought. Back down the ladder I scampered. I rummaged through my drawers again and pulled out four fresh batteries. I reloaded the flashlight with two of them and stuck the other two in my pocket. I climbed back up into the attic. Blick. I switched on the flashlight again, and again it lit up the room in front of me in a cone of light. After maybe two or three seconds, that light started to get weaker. After ten seconds, the flashlight was dead again, leaving me in total darkness. Now, up in the attic all by myself, completely blind, I became more aware of that oppressive, electrical quality. I quickly fumbled with the bottom of the flashlight, unscrewing it until it finally came loose. The two batteries inside fell out onto my hand. God damn, they were boiling hot, to the point where they actually felt like small blocks of fire on my palm. I dropped them instantly, and began stuffing in the other two batteries I brought along. I managed to get them in without too much hassle, and flipped the switch on the device once again. Out poured the light, and I did a quick 360 to check my surroundings. I soon calmed myself down, seeing that everything was as it should be, and shone my flashlight at the ground where the two hot batteries had fallen. They were lying right next to the crawl space. The static sensation became more noticeable as I bent down to pick them up. And, lo and behold, the damn flashlight in my hand began to lose power once again. That was it, I thought. I was just going to scoop up the fried batteries if they weren't too hot, and get the hell down from there. As I got to the ground, the light from my flashlight was at about half strength. Now, at eye level with the crawl space, the electricity in the air felt stronger than it ever had before. A strange compulsion took me, and I turned to look into the crawl space, and shone the fading light of my torch into it. Staring back at me were two black eyes. I only caught sight of whatever it was for a moment, but it was human-shaped, and lying on its stomach, twitching, with long, black hair running down the sides of its chalk-white base. It looked both human and non-human at the same time. It wore no clothes, but I couldn't tell you if it was male or female. Terror and disgust hit me all at once as my flashlight ran out of power again, leaving me once again in darkness, only this time with this thing right next to me. I jumped up and hurried back down the ladder, back out of the attic. Above me I could hear it moving, first from what sounded like within the walls of the attic, and then from what sounded like the roof. That didn't make any sense, the crawl space didn't lead to the roof. Soon the noises were gone. I ran downstairs to tell my wife we needed to leave at once. She looked at me in total confusion, she hadn't heard a damn thing. I explained to her as best I could, told her what I'd seen in the crawl space. She just laughed at me, told me I'd just seen a rat. That thing was no rat. After that incident, I never had the same strange static feeling when I went into the attic. The electricity in the air that I'd noticed for so long disappeared overnight. All the weird happenings around my home stopped as well. There were no more weird noises, no unusual shadows or creaks, and that crawl space, it returned to just being a regular hole in the wall. Nothing strange or unexplainable happened for the rest of the time I lived in that house. Maybe the whole incident was simply a brain spasm. You know, I could accept that. Maybe I just lost my mind for a few minutes. Sure, it's possible. But I know my wife's suggestion that it was just an animal is complete baloney. I may have only looked at the thing for a second or two, but I'll never forget what it looked like. It was damn near human. I have no idea what the static quality in the air was, nor why I was the only person who ever noticed it. But whatever that creature was in the crawl space, it took the static with it when it left. I live in a rural part of Colorado, on a farm close to the infamous Riverdale Road. A lot of strange goings on along that road, let me tell you. People have claimed to have seen all kinds of apparitions while traveling down it. One part of the road even leads off to a mansion that was once the headquarters of a satanic cult. Some folks say that the gates to hell are located there by the chicken coop. 
but that doesn't really have anything to do with this story. At least, I hope it doesn't. I must have been fourteen years old at the time, doing some schoolwork at home, when, all of a sudden, my brother came running in, hollering, said that a mangy dog had wandered onto our property. My dad and I went out to take a look with him. Lo and behold, there was a humongous Doberman standing about twenty yards from our house, completely motionless. It didn't look healthy at all. Dobermans are almost always black, with patches of brown. This one was off-color, gray, and covered in blisters. It looked as if it was decomposing, despite still being alive, if only barely. Its eyes, they weren't like alive creatures. They were stark white, like it was blind or something. No pupils or color at all. It was panting heavily, and just looked at us, begging to be put out of its misery. We had no idea where it could have come from. There wasn't another house near ours for as far as the eye could see. And of the houses that were nearby, well, none of them had a Doberman. My dad didn't want the thing to suffer, and he certainly didn't want it spreading disease to our livestock. So he got his rifle and told us to go back inside. We knew what he meant. We went back and switched on the TV. No more than a few seconds later, we heard a shot ring out from the outside. My dad then dug a grave and buried the poor creature in a patch of unused land away from our house. That night, we all woke up to the sound of aggressive barking from outside. That was odd. We got up to check what it was. Outside our house was another Doberman, looking identical to the one that had wandered onto our property in the day. This one, too, was diseased-looking, missing half its fur and covered in lumps. Where were these dogs coming from? Like the one before, this one was just standing motionless, waiting in the exact same place. What were different this time, though, were the eyes. They were still stark white, but they weren't like before. They were shiny, the color of the moon, like they were glowing. They stood out against the darkness of the night. Where are you poor creatures coming from? My dad asked it, rhetorically. Look away, boys, he said. We ignored his command. After staring at the beast for a few moments, my dad raised his rifle again and fired at the animal's head. It collapsed to the ground. Oh, get back to bed, he told us. We did as he said this time, but couldn't get much sleep. Dad went to dig another grave beside the one that he'd made earlier. But that's the thing. The grave he'd dug for the other dog was empty. It had been dug out from the inside. The dog he'd just shot, it was the same dog as before. He placed the strange animal back in the empty hole, filled it back up with earth, and retired to bed. We all put it down to the creature's will to live. Next morning, when we all woke up, we went to check on the grave. The damn thing was empty, dug out from the inside again, tracks leading off to the woodland near our house. After that, we never saw the dog again, though to this day, about once every three months, we hear that same barking coming from the woods near our house. Occasionally when we do, we'll look outside the window and see one of our farm animals standing in the exact same place that dog stood, just watching us, waiting for the gun. Sometimes it's a pig, sometimes just a hen. But no matter what, they always look decomposed. They never move. And, at night, they all have those bright, moon-like eyes. Had to put down at least a dozen of them over the years. I don't know what that dog brought to our farm, but it ain't going away. I live on the outskirts of Sapporo in Hokkaido, Japan. It's an extraordinarily safe place to live, albeit a little freezing cold. This story just so happened to take place during a particularly cold winter there. The whole area was covered in snow, and the sun was beginning to set. 
I was power walking along the Ishikari River, desperately trying to get home. Even after living here for the past ten years, I still haven't gotten used to that damn cold. As I made my way along the riverside, I noticed a man up ahead, standing with his back to me. He had his hood up over his head, and despite all the snow, he was barefoot. I scanned the area, and there was absolutely nobody else around. Now, as I mentioned, I lived in an extremely safe part of the world, but even still, I felt a little uneasy. There was just a weird atmosphere about the guy. The way he was standing completely still, with his back turned to me. Well, he obviously wasn't looking at the river. Was he just standing there, staring at the ground? Not to mention, I'm a five foot two, petite woman, and this guy appeared to be at least six foot, very tall by Japanese standards. Still, I put all those worries to the back of my mind. The man remained perfectly still as I came to pass him. I muttered a quiet, good evening, under my breath, in a vain attempt to ease my unease, I suppose. He didn't reply as I walked past. All I could hear were the sounds of my footsteps, rhythmic and predictable. After ten or fifteen steps, though, something interrupted the flow of their beat. I turned around and saw that the barefoot man was following behind me now. But his face, the best way I can describe it is like a mannequin, or one of those wooden figures that artists use. Don't get me wrong, his face was fleshy, but there were no features. His head was faceless, just like an operabo from Japanese folklore. As I picked up my pace, he did as well. Now, extremely frightened, I broke out into a sprint, desperate to get away from the faceless man. Looking back over my shoulder, I could see that the man was running at full speed as well, no longer just keeping pace, but actually gaining on me. I had never felt such fear in my life. I managed to make it to a corner with a bridge. From it, passing cars could see me. If this was the end, there'd at least be witnesses. I turned around one final time to see how close the man was to me now. But that's the thing. He was just standing there, frozen in place once again. He stood, facing me, if you want to call it that, and remained motionless as I fled into the distance. I ran all the way back to my home, unsure of what to do. Should I call the police? What should I tell them? That I saw a noperabo? As the night went on, I continued to deliberate. By midnight, I decided to sleep on it. I fell into a deep slumber, exhausted by the events of the evening. I was awoken by a series of loud, melodic notes. It was my front doorbell. I rubbed my eyes and checked the clock next to my bed. 3 a.m. What the hell? To say I was surprised would be an understatement. I have an app on my phone with a camera that's linked to my doorbell. That way, I can see who's standing at my front door without ever having to get up and check. I opened the app to see who in God's name was ringing my doorbell at 3 in the morning. The live footage from the camera popped up. Standing at my front door, with his head close up to the camera, was that same faceless figure I had seen by the river. It had somehow followed me. I dropped my phone in a state of pure shock. In a panic, I immediately ran into my bathroom and locked the door. My mind was racing, and I knew I had to call somebody for help. The police, my parents, my friends or my neighbours, I didn't care. Just anybody who could make this faceless man disappear. Stupidly, I had left my phone on my bed after I dropped it, but I was far too scared to leave the safety of my locked en suite. After twenty minutes, I finally worked up the courage to go and get it. I lifted my device, and, with my eyes half covered by my hands, reopened the app to see if he was still standing in my doorway. The live feed popped up again. 
the faceless man was nowhere to be seen. I took the opportunity to call my father. I told him some strange man had stalked me to my house, that he had come for me in the night. Needless to say, he rushed over and arrived only a few moments before a police car. He had taken the liberty of calling them for me. I explained the situation to them all, told them about bumping into a faceless man by the river. I showed them my app, which confirmed my doorbell had indeed been activated at three in the morning. Frustratingly, the app didn't have a record function, so I had no definitive evidence to show them. Okay, said one of the cops. Be on the lookout for a man with no face. Got it. I thought he was mocking me, so I insisted I was being serious. Oh, believe me, I'm taking this seriously, ma'am, he said. You're not the first one around here to report this guy. As of right now, nothing's come of their investigation. I don't know how many people in my town have claimed to have seen this guy, but from what the cop said, I at least know I'm not the only one. There's one final detail I have to share. When the police searched the area, they found a set of footprints in the snow, mud and grass around my house. They led from my front doorstep all the way around the perimeter of my house. Whoever had left them had stopped outside every one of my ground floor windows. The prints had obviously been made by somebody walking barefoot. No DNA could be extracted from them. I live in a remote, rural part of East Oklahoma. Nothing but farmland, wide empty fields or forests all around, depending on which direction you're looking. The nearest town is a solid ten minute drive away from here, and before that, there's barely any signs of life at all. Oftentimes, I feel a little isolated here, especially since I live by myself. I arrived home from town one evening, just before sunset. It had been a long day at work, and to be honest, I was exhausted. I fed my little dog Curly, a Jack Russell Terrier, and then set about fixing up some dinner for myself. After that, I eased myself Here's a little known legend from my hometown in the Philippines. There's an infamous mountain here called Mount Cristobal. For tourists and people passing through, it's just like any other mountain you might see throughout my country. But we locals call it the Devil's Mountain for a reason. All sorts of peculiar and tragic happenings have occurred on and around Mount Cristobal, including the deaths and disappearances of many hikers and adventurers over the years. Some people claim that the Devil himself lives there, hence the mountain's ominous nickname, and most avoid going there like the plague. Us locals believe that supernatural creatures roam the area after sundown. The unsettling feeling one gets when approaching the mountain is enough to scare most people off, even those who have never heard of the mountain's reputation before. In fact, there are countless stories from would-be hikers who were overcome by an eerie sensation when they approached the mountain, and so decided not to climb it. Sadly, not everybody trusts their intuition. When I was a child, my father owned a gas station. I was hanging around with him while he worked one day, playing with some toys in the back room. That morning, a group of three tourists from America came in. They bought a few snacks and drinks, fueled up their vehicle, and asked my dad if he could help them with some directions. Sure, where'd you need to go? My dad inquired. The foot of Mount Cristobal, replied one of the young Americans. We want to check out the mountain, but we don't know the best place to start our hike. Do you know a good starting point? My dad's eyes widened, and his jaw tightened. He told them that it was a dangerous place, linked to numerous terrible incidents. Said that it was the Devil's Playground, a cursed mountain. The three of them laughed at him, unfazed by his concerns. That's why we came here in the first place. We want to check it out, chill with the Devil for a while. I know now that most people from other countries think urban legends are all nonsense and that the three Americans believed going to the mountain was just a bit of fun. But my father took the stories about Mount Cristobal very seriously. I don't know the best place to start your hike, said my father. In my opinion, there is no best place to start. 
Not if you have any sense, anyway. It's dangerous, I tell you. The group ignored my father's remarks, paid for their things, and drove off without any more discussion. I looked up at my father, and even though I was young, and this was many years ago, I remember the concern on his face as he watched those tourists leave. I asked him what was wrong, but he said nothing more about the matter. Five days later, news started circulating around town about what had happened. An American tourist had stumbled out of the forest surrounding Mount Cristobal. He was completely alone and delirious, having had no food or sleep for days. I instantly recognized his face in the local newspaper my father was reading. It was one of the Americans that had come to our gas station. The paper told his story. Apparently, he and his two friends found their way to the foot of the mountain after all, and began making their way up to the top. They'd brought a tent and supplies with them, and planned to spend a night atop the mountain. They set up camp near a cliff with a steep drop, and cooked themselves some dinner. At nightfall, the three of them sat in a row on the cliff's edge, their feet dangling over the side of it, the kind of stupid thing young people do when they feel invincible. They sat there in the dark looking out at the beautiful world that surrounded them. Soon, they realized something wasn't right. Hey, do you guys feel that? One of them said to the others. Collectively, they all sensed that there was something in the darkness below them. They stopped their chattering and peered down into the total blackness of the sheer drop under their feet. Without sound or warning, a pair of hands attached to two long arms shot up from below them grabbed the middle tourist by his legs, and, in one fell tug, pulled him straight over the edge. They heard their friend scream as he fell and vanished into the blackness, followed by a loud and distinctive thud as he hit the ground. One moment he was sitting there, then, in an instant, gone, swallowed by the darkness. The two remaining men scrambled from the cliff's edge. They couldn't believe what they'd just seen. Two impossibly long, stretched arms had just raised up out of nowhere and stolen their friend. They ran, and in their frantic escape, lost track of one another. One of the men kept running downhill, pushing through the brush and avoiding pitfalls. But as he made his way down the mountain slopes and came to a clearing, he found that he was somehow higher up on the mountain than where he'd started. He continued walking down the mountain, only to find himself somehow ascending it. For four days he wandered, trying to find his way to the bottom and back to civilization, all the while thinking he was losing his mind. Eventually, Mount Cristobal loosened its grip on him. He emerged from the mountain and was given medical assistance. It was a miracle that he had survived. The man who was pulled over the ledge by the hands was found at the bottom of the cliff. His head cracked open like a coconut, his bones shattered. The second American was never found. To this day, it's unknown what happened to him. He remains unaccounted for, another lost adventurer claimed by the mountain. I tried to warn them, said my father as he read their story in the paper. I tried to warn them, like so many others before. But you can't save everybody. Their story was read about and quickly forgotten by most locals. Like I said, Deaths and disappearances are commonplace on that mountain. They were just another three men who went to meet the devil, and got far more than they bargained for. One folkloric creature from my country that everyone knows of is the Balbal. Considered by many to be one of the most frightful and disgusting creatures in Filipino folklore, they're said to be an omen of death, but there aren't many who have a personal story to share about them. Most believe them to be fictional creatures too, but my uncle knows otherwise. He told me a story from his youth one evening, when the two of us were drinking alone and having a heart to heart, and I'm going to share that story with you now. My uncle wasn't one to lie about such matters, and he recalled this incident with such clarity and sincerity that I for one believe him, and I'm not the only one. In roughly his words, this is what he shared with me. I was only ten years old at the time. My father, your granddaddy, had suddenly and unexpectedly passed away. 
My brother, your father, was four years older than me, and very protective. After our dad passed, he effectively became the man of the house, despite only being a teenager himself. Took good care of mum and me, but there was something that he always got angry about, and that he refused to let me discuss. It was the day of our father's funeral. A crowd of family and friends were gathered around his open grave. We listened to the priest philosophize on death for a few minutes, and then watched as the coffin was lowered into the grave and covered with dirt. There were a lot of tears and condolences, the usual stuff. I remember thinking at the time, I should feel a lot sadder than this. I hadn't shed a single tear during the whole service, and I felt guilty about that. I loved my dad with all my heart, of course. He was a good man, a kind man. I'd spent the last few days in tears over his loss. But there was something about the atmosphere around that grave that felt... off. It distracted me from my sadness. It's hard to put it into words, but the air had this sort of heaviness to it. There was a pressure to it that I hadn't felt before. Everyone's words seemed muffled, just slightly. No one else seemed to notice it, so I put it down to my emotions wreaking havoc on my body. As we all stood around, watching the hole be filled, I suddenly felt this strange compulsion. A compulsion to look towards the banana trees in the distance. I gazed at those banana trees. It felt like I was looking at a picture where everything else was out of focus except the part that your eye is supposed to be drawn to. Everything and everywhere else seemed a little blurry, but not this one particular section of trees. This was a weird sensation, and I tried not to panic, to fit in with all the other people around me standing silently around the grave, but I could feel a cold sweat forming on my forehead, and I couldn't look away from those trees. I just knew there was someone behind them, watching us. And then, I saw him. A man with very pale skin, dressed in black. Not unusual for a funeral, but even from 50 or 60 meters away, I could tell there was something not right about this guy. Another person might have seen him and thought that he was just someone who knew my father, that he was watching from afar because he was shy or out of respect. Somehow, I just knew otherwise. After the service, the crowd dispersed, and my brother, mother, and I went back home, now one family member short. But I couldn't stop thinking about that strange experience, about the banana trees and the man hiding within them. I knew I had to go back and investigate, alone. I knew my brother would call me a dramatic fool, and after the day we had all just had, I didn't want to cause my mother any more distress. So, after dinner... I quietly left the house and walked quickly towards the nearby cemetery. The sun had already set, and I wanted to get back before my mother knew I was gone. There were no electric lights or anything like that at the time, of course, but by the time I reached the gates, my eyes had already adjusted to the darkness. As I made my way past the first few headstones and got deeper into the graveyard, that blurry, otherworldly sensation began to take a hold of me again. The closer I got to my father's grave, the stronger the effect became. I had to stop to collect myself. Standing still, I could hear a noise coming from around the corner ahead of me. The corner that led to my father's resting place. My stomach was in knots as I stepped forward and turned the corner. There it was. Father's grave. It had been dug up. His coffin was open. And there, standing over him, was the only thing in focus. A tall, pale figure. Something between a man and a monster. It was shaped like a human, sure, but was much skinnier. The proportions were all off. It wasn't wearing clothes, and you could see each rib. Its face was buried deep in the coffin, but I must have let out a gasp, because it quickly jolted up and looked right at me. Its eyes were dead, as if skin had grown over them, like a Greek statue. At the end of its stretched face was a grotesquely long tongue, which thrashed back and forth. What must have been its mouth was stained with some dark liquid. I immediately knew what it was. A Baal Baal, the grave robber from the stories. And just like in the stories, I knew why it was there at my father's grave, and what it was doing with him in his open coffin. 
It was eating him, peeling his skin off with its tongue and bloody curved fingernails. I turned and ran for the gates, didn't stop running until I made it back home. I was in floods of tears, and my brother immediately told me to get a grip of myself and to not worry mother. He asked me what on earth was the matter, told me that he was the man of the house and that he'd take care of it, whatever it was. I confided in him what I'd just seen. He scolded me, told me not to make up such stories about our dearly departed father. And then, realizing that I genuinely was in a state of shock, he told me that he would go to the grave and take a look for himself. I begged him not to go, but he told me I was just in a state of grief and that he was just going to take a look to put my mind at ease. In the meantime, he said, I had to wait in my room. It was too late for me to be going back outside. Twenty minutes later, he returned. He knocked on my door, told me that he went to the cemetery, and that there was nothing there, that there was nothing out of place at the grave, and that everything was as it should be. Nothing out of the ordinary, and certainly no balbals out for a midnight feast. I had just been imagining things, he said. But I knew what I'd seen, and I told him that he must have just missed the thing. Your old man got real serious with me after that told me to stop making up lies and to never speak of this ridiculous Bao Bao story again. He said, nobody likes a liar. You're going to get a reputation if you go around saying you saw a Bao Bao. But I wasn't lying. Maybe I was just seeing things. Yeah. Maybe I did just have a moment of madness sparked by the loss of our papa. A grieving mind can play all manner of strange tricks on a person. That I know. But it was so real that I can't explain it. I just know I saw what I saw. I know it was a pal pal. I know it was watching us in its human form during the service. And I know it came to eat our dad. <sighs> anyway, I stopped talking about it after that. With that, my uncle took a swig from his drink. I didn't know what to make of his story, but I knew he wasn't lying. That's to say, I knew he truly believed he saw a pal pal. But maybe my uncle was just a bit crazier than I thought. Sometime after my uncle told me that story, I decided to speak to my father about it. I expected my dad to laugh about it. To say, that old story again. Your uncle must have had too much to drink. Instead, he just looked at me with an uncharacteristically serious face. Your uncle and I haven't talked about that for a long time, he told me. I'm surprised he brought it up with you. It's a bad omen to mention it. My uncle had told me about my father's reaction at the time. How he had told my father about the Bao Bao, and how my father had mocked him, and told him to show more respect to their father, and to stop lying about such drivel. The concern in my father's voice now caught me off guard, and I questioned him about it. There was a long pause. My father exhaled. I knew he wasn't lying. I saw it too. My dad explained that that night, when he went alone to investigate his brother's claim, he found their father's grave was covered, just as it should have been, but that it seemed freshly filled in, as if the dirt had just been placed minutes before. A scraping sound caught his attention, and he looked up towards some banana trees in the distance. There, he saw a pale, emaciated figure, with statue-like eyes and a thrashing tongue dragging what was left of a suited corpse into the tree line. He then went home and pretended not to have seen anything. Firstly, to protect his brother, to make him think that he had just imagined the Bal Bal and that the creature wasn't real. And secondly, so they didn't talk about it. That would have been inviting death into their lives. If you talk too much about the Bal Bal, he'll come for you. My father said that he'll never know for sure but he's certain that if he were to dig up my grandfather's grave, inside his coffin, he wouldn't find bones. Instead, he'd most likely find the trunk of a banana tree, the very item a Bao Bao is said to replace a body with when it comes to steal one. For the sake of my uncle, I promised my father I wouldn't reveal his secret. The fact that they both had seen the same thing, and that it wasn't just my uncle's imagination. My father also made me promise, regardless of my own beliefs, that I never talk about the Bao Bao with either of them again. This was all a long time ago, and both my uncle and father have since passed. 
I kept my promise and didn't bring the story up with either of them again. Thankfully, I can say I didn't see anything at their funerals. No pale figure lurking in the tree line. Nothing digging them up under cover of darkness. I don't know if I believe in the Balmal fully. I don't believe it's exactly how the stories say. That seeing it is an omen of death, or that talking about it will draw its attention to you. But I do believe that they both saw something at my grandfather's funeral. Something very few people ever have or will. And that such folklore stories exist for a reason. Because a select few know the truth and pass those stories on to the rest of us. My old high school was ancient, around 120 years old. It had had so many renovations in the past that its layout was a total mess. Even though it was a one-story building, it had a staircase that led up from one end of the corridor to the ceiling, and inaccessible doors embedded into the walls for reasons lost to time. The oddest of all of these incongruencies, though, was the watch cabin. From the outside, it looked like a normal country house. Inside was a sleeping area, big enough to fit eight tatami mats, an old-style telephone, and a small kitchen area. I never knew why it was known as the watch cabin, though, until the night of this incident. My home was far from my school, so I'd sometimes stay overnight at a friend's house who lived more locally. One day, though, I couldn't find anyone who could let me sleep over at their place, so I decided to spend the night in the disused watch cabin. Another person, a friend of mine, was going to stay there with me. We were in high spirits as we spread our futons on the floor, feeling like we were on a mini school field trip or something. We were talking and eating our dinner, when, unexpectedly, the old telephone started ringing. It made us both jump. Nobody was supposed to know we were here. I picked up the receiver. On the other end of the line, was a school janitor. He was checking in on us. He said he was worried because we were staying at the watch cabin by ourselves. How he knew we were staying there was beyond us. Whichever janitor it was, he must have seen us sneak in or something. He told us not to mess around too much and so on. The usual spiel. Just as I was about to hang up the phone, he says, Oh, and one last thing. Make sure to close the curtains on the west side of the cabin. You got that? Without thinking too much, I said, sure, and hung up the old phone. When I thought about his words in more detail, however, they didn't make much sense to me. I didn't remember there being anything notable on the west side. What's he talking about? We asked each other, as my friend and I looked out the west side window. What we saw there was a sinister-looking, old well encircled by a hemp rope, like the kind you might see at a shrine. Up until that moment, neither of us had ever noticed it, because it was hidden away in a secluded spot, wedged in between the school building and the cabin. I felt a shiver run along my spine as soon as I laid eyes on it. I don't know what it is about that well, but it's kind of creepy, isn't it? I said to my friend. She agreed with me. We went to bed after rearranging our futons so they were side by side, making sure they were closer now than before, both of us feeling a little unsettled. I fell asleep quickly. I don't know how long I was asleep for, but I awoke with chills around my shoulders. I looked around and noticed my friend was missing. The cabin itself didn't have a toilet, so I assumed she had gone to the teacher's boarding house to do her business. I waited and waited, but she still hadn't returned. I opened the door and looked outside, but there was no sign of her. I felt uneasy as I went back inside. Without thinking, I opened the curtains on the west side of the cabin. There, outside, I could see my friend, standing in only her underwear beside the old well. Her hands were groped around her waist. It looked as though she was trying to pee. At first, I felt a little shocked, but then closed the curtains and tried to go back to sleep. Still, I felt that something was off about the way she was moving. I stood up, opened the curtains again, and looked out. I almost screamed when I realized what she was actually doing. 
she wasn't groping her waist. She was trying to tie a rope around it. I just watched on in complete disbelief. When she had finished tying the rope around her waist, she bent down and began tying the other end to a large stone by her feet. I became so scared I couldn't utter a single word, couldn't move. The next thing I saw was a pale, white hand come slithering out of the well. At first, the hand was moving as if it was searching for something, and then stopped once it found the rope on the ground. My friend stood there with her head bent down, almost like she was in a trance, still and unresponsive. The white hand slowly began to tug on the rope, attempting to pull the stone into the well, to drag my friend down into it. I was paralyzed with fear. It was then that my ears were filled with a shrill ringing which pierced the silence. It was the old telephone. Immediately I came to my senses and felt my body become lighter. Before I knew it, I was out of the door and running for the well. I grabbed a hold of my zombified friend and dragged her back inside the cabin, shouting her name over and over. She soon regained her senses too, and began sobbing heavily. Relief washed over me, and I began sobbing with her. We both knew we needed help, so I grabbed the old telephone and brought the receiver to my ear. There was no dial tone at all. The telephone wasn't working. We examined it, only to find that the telephone was only a shell. We hadn't noticed before, but there were no machine parts inside it, let alone a telephone line. By all accounts, it should have never worked in the first place. It was only at a later date that we heard the story surrounding that old well. When the school first opened, students kept ending their lives by throwing themselves down the well. The school tried to bury the well, but everyone who worked on burying it started perishing one after another. In the end, the school simply decided to give up on burying the well, and instead renovated the school building itself, extending it in a way that enclosed the well and made it more or less hidden. Still, occasionally, people would come and throw themselves down it. That's why they built the watch cabin. The school stationed a watchman inside to keep an eye on people, to make sure nobody ever went near that well. Thing is, in the end, even the watchman threw himself into it. Since that day, the watch cabin had remained empty. How did the telephone ring that night to warn us about closing the curtains? Better question, who was the man who I spoke to on the phone? I sometimes wonder if it was the old watchman, still standing guard after all those years. My friend John recently convinced me to share this story that happened to us near McCall, Idaho. We'd like to hear what you all make of it, cause it sure beats the hell out of us. John's parents owned a lakeside cabin, and we had decided to spend the weekend there with our other friend Tom. We just planned on kicking back with a few beers, going out and enjoying nature. This place was quite a ways out of town, pretty much in the middle of nowhere not another living person around for miles in any direction. We shed some laughs on our journey there, talking about all the things we were going to get up to. The place was a small but stunning log cabin, overlooking this picturesque little lake. We spent what was left of the daylight unpacking, cracking open cold ones, and swimming in that lake. We dived off the wooden dock into the water, cannonballing each other, and just generally having a fun time. Nighttime rolled around, and the three of us were playing cards inside the living room area of the cabin. It was a nice, peaceful evening, and we were starting to wind down after the long day. Now, it was a relatively quiet night, but at around 11pm, things became real silent. Any rustling outside had stopped along with the sound of the breeze and the hooting of birds. Out of nowhere, this eerie silence just filled the air. There was nothing suggesting danger, but we all looked at each other, 
like we all felt something strange in the atmosphere. It's hard to explain, but for a few seconds, the nothingness felt like something. Something horrible. That's when this loud splash broke the silence. It sounded like something huge had just fallen from a great height into the lake. We rushed outside to see what it was. That's the curious part. The water was completely still, no ripples whatsoever. But there was something there, something large floating in the lake. We got nearer to the water's edge to take a closer look. We could make it out now. It wasn't a thing. It was a person. A body floating face down in the water, arms outstretched. It looked like a man, and it seemed as if we were too late to help. The body was bloated, like a waterlogged corpse. Where the hell had he come from? Nobody else was meant to be around anywhere nearby. We all started freaking out, and John ran down to the wooden docks walkway to try and pull the guy out. I fumbled for my phone to call for an ambulance. Tom looked on in horror as John got to the end of the walkway and kneeled down to grab the body as it floated by the dock. As I was on the phone, I heard John shriek. Something had spooked him real bad. Tom ran to his aid, but John came rushing back to intercept him, pale as a ghost. Guys, there's nothing we can do for him. He's gone. Come on, let's get back inside. Upon hearing this, Tom looked concerned. Dude, he said, we can't just leave him there. We have to get him out. Tom started moving towards the body. No, Tom, said John. Not you. Come on, back inside. Now. John's tone was so serious. I hadn't heard him speak like that in the longest time. It kind of frightened me, to be honest. And it definitely convinced Tom, who turned back and hurried inside the cabin. We all waited in the living area for the ambulance to arrive, looking outside every now and then to see the body still floating face down in the water. The old red and blue lights took a long time to get to us, but as soon as they pulled up, we rushed out to greet them. We told them about the body in the lake and went to point it out to them. But that's the thing. It wasn't there. The corpse was nowhere to be seen. Where the hell had it gone? Had it sunk? Divers searched the small lake and found no trace of a body whatsoever. The water was empty. There were absolutely no tire tracks near the cabin. Nothing unusual or out of place. Nowhere for anyone to go. Where the hell had the corpse gone? The man had been face down in the water for ages. He wasn't exactly in any condition to just stand up and walk away. If this was some guy just messing with us, we had no idea how or why. This whole experience shook me up pretty bad, but I honestly wouldn't be sharing this story if it wasn't for what John told me. Remember that John shrieked? Well, he hadn't told us what scared him so much that night because he didn't want to freak Tom out. But, in private, John confessed to me what had happened. He said that as he leant down to examine the body, the corpse's head turned up to look at him. Its hand grabbed his arm. Its face was charred, its eyes milky white. It looked at me, bro, said John. It looked at me, and it said, why you, not Tom? John told me this with complete sincerity, and I for one believe him. We've never been back to that cabin since, and I think we'll keep it that way. I don't claim to be a saint, and some of my decisions in this story might make some of you think I did the wrong thing. But believe me, at the time, Self-preservation was my number one concern, and unless you find yourself in a similar situation, I don't think you can say you wouldn't make the same call as I did. With all that said, here's my story. I live in Missouri, 
in a small town far from any major cities. A short drive from my house is this really huge forest. A few years ago, I was out walking deep in those very woods, clearing my head after a pretty messy breakup. I was in a bad place mentally, and by the time I came to my senses, I realized that I had wandered far off the beaten track. I was deep in the woods now. Damn it, I thought to myself. As I stumbled through the brush, to my surprise, I saw another person hunched down in a ditch. His back was turned to me. That was remarkably odd. This was an extremely secluded spot. Why was this guy so deep in the woods as well? And what on earth was he doing? Hiding? Spying on someone? I hesitated, unsure of whether or not I should approach him. I decided I would. Uh, hey, I said. I don't suppose you know the way back to- Jesus, shh! He cut me off. I clearly startled him. As he turned to face me, I could see that he was covered in mud and sweat. He looked terrified. In a quiet voice, I asked him if he was okay. He motioned for me to get down. As I edged closer to the guy, I could see that one of his lower legs was all bloody and injured. I asked him what the hell was going on. Little did I know the trouble I had just stumbled into. This poor guy had been out herping by himself when he stumbled upon some meth lab hidden deep in the forest. Some meth heads were inside, cooking, when they noticed him snooping around. Fearing that their operation was going to be busted, they came out with a couple of rifles and started firing at the guy. He ran through the forest with the men still chasing behind him, intent on killing him and probably burying him in an unmarked grave. He made it as far as he could when he noticed one of his legs was in immense pain. Because of all of the adrenaline, he hadn't realized that one of the shots had hit him in the leg. Now, no longer able to run, he found a spot to hide. The ditch. That's the situation I found myself in. I was now hiding in a ditch with this incapacitated man, with god knows how many armed meth heads out searching for him. I couldn't exactly leave the guy there. And even if I did, what if I bumped into one of the men searching for him? They'd probably just blow me away too. We didn't have any cell signal out there, so we were really between a rock and a hard place. We must have hid there for a good ten minutes together when we heard rustling up ahead of us. We couldn't see who was making the noise, but it definitely sounded like human footsteps to me. We remained silent. Thankfully, whoever it was passed by without noticing us. Another ten minutes must have passed. The tension was getting too much for us to bear. The guy tells me that he thinks the coast is clear, and that he was going to hobble back the way he came. Said that he had a car about twenty minutes away. If we could get to it, we'd be able to escape, find cell signal, and call for help. I didn't feel comfortable with that plan. I just met this guy. For all I knew, he could have been anybody. Realistically, anyone could be chasing him for any number of reasons. I didn't want to get caught up in this mess. Not any more than I already was, that is. Not to mention, he was acting erratic and unreliable. I decided that I was going to go my own way. Back the way I think I came. It was a quick decision I had to make, and I decided to go with my gut. And my gut told me not to completely trust this guy. We both checked that the area was still clear, gave each other a look of good luck, and then made off our separate ways. I turned and looked as he limped off. I hurtled through the brush, hoping I wouldn't bump into anybody. As I ran back in the direction I had come from, I heard something that almost froze me in my place. Two gunshots in quick succession, ringing out in the distance behind me. Then, a third. I swallowed my fear and continued to run. I eventually found my way back onto a familiar path. It led me out of the woods, back to civilization, and back to cell signal. I called the police immediately. 
After combing those woods, the cops found the lab. It had recently been cooked in, but there were no signs of the meth heads anywhere. They never found the injured man. To this day, no bodies have ever been reported as found in those woods. So the optimist in me likes to think that those shots weren't aimed at the herper. The realist in me, however, thinks he's buried deep in those woods somewhere. I'll tell you this much though, I'm glad I went the other way. When I heard those shots, I knew I had made the right decision. Always follow your gut. My co-worker and I were driving through northern Arizona, on Highway 89 between Flagstaff and Page. It was late, something like 2am. We had recently finished our late night shift. Up ahead on the lonely road, I noticed a set of glowing eyes in my headlights. Must be an animal up in the middle of the road. Not wanting to hit the critter, I let my foot off the gas and slowed down to go around it. As we came to pass it, I saw that it wasn't one animal at all. There were four or five, well, coyotes or dogs I guess, gathered around something in the road. But there was something wrong with all of them. They all looked up at us as we came up beside them, and their faces were contorted, morphed. Their features are not in the right place. The thing that they were huddled around in the road appeared to be another dead coyote, all bloody and crooked, like it had been hit by a car. As we drove off, my co-worker told me that one of the coyotes was following behind us. I looked in my mirror, and sure enough, one of them was chasing us off the shoulder of the road. As we gained speed, so did the coyote. I floored it and looked over. I swear to God. The bloody creature stood up on its hind legs and was keeping pace with our vehicle, looking more human than animal now. How it was moving so goddamn fast, I don't know. It was charging towards our vehicle. Luckily, as we picked up speed, we managed to outpace the thing. I could see in my mirror that it continued to chase behind us, becoming smaller and smaller in my vision before fading into the distance. We spent the rest of our journey back home trying to wrap our heads around what we had just seen. I dropped my co-worker off at his house, both of us just as confused as when the event had happened. That night, as I lay in bed, I heard strange noises coming from the woods outside my house. It almost sounded like coyotes, but not quite. Something was off about their cries. They sounded distorted and slower than natural. Their wails went on for a good long while. I refused to look outside my window, terrified that I'd never be able to unsee the image waiting for me. The wailing suddenly stopped. Then, quick footsteps approached my house. Whatever was in those woods was now outside my window. A human voice spoke. What's wrong? Nothing. Go to sleep. It was like two different voices coming from one source. It's hard to explain. These words repeated several times in exactly the same way, like a recording. As they did, a loud ringing filled my ears like tinnitus, getting louder and louder. It was becoming too much to bear. A few seconds and a heart attack later, the ringing and the voices abruptly stopped, and the normal silence of the Arizona countryside was all that filled the air. After all that noise, it sounded quieter than it ever had before. I heard nothing more that night. The scariest part, to me, was when I met up with my co-worker the next evening. I told him about the strange noises outside my house during the night. His face became ghostly pale. Dude, he said, I heard the same noises last night too. Several years later, I heard from a native gentleman about these creatures called skimwalkers. Creatures that can mimic the appearance and noises of other creatures that they've killed in the past. 
including humans. They usually can't imitate their victims perfectly though, and something about them almost always looks and sounds off. He also mentioned that they can only repeat the last words and screams of their prey, and that they'd use them to try and lure people into their midst. After hearing his description of these creatures, I remembered my experience years earlier. I couldn't help but wonder if those are what my co-worker and I encountered on Highway 89 that night. I told the native my story. Huh, you got lucky, he said. They usually don't leave people alone. <laughs> Not until they get them. I live on a farm in the Lone Star State, and I have some serious problems with my neighbor. He's a real pain in my behind, to say the least. We have somewhat of a rivalry, seeing how he's a farmer himself. I gotta say though, I'm grateful for that rivalry, and I'll tell you why. I'd been having some trouble with a few of my vehicles a while back. Someone had been slashing their tires. Whoever had done this had also left manure in my mailbox a few weeks earlier, and put broken glass all over my driveway a couple of weeks after that. I was sure that my neighbor was responsible, but when I confronted him about it, he denied any involvement in any of the incidents. I was going to need evidence to prove that it was him, then I could hit him where it really hurt namely his wallet. Thus, I installed a few security cameras around my property, small enough as not to be noticeable. My trap was set. Now I just needed to wait for him to strike again. Perhaps a month passed by, and in all that time, there had been no new incidents on my farm. Maybe my neighbor had noticed me installing the cameras. Well, if that was the case, I was just glad it stopped him from coming onto my property, tampering with my vehicles, and pulling all sorts of horrible pranks if you want to call them that. One afternoon, I found myself driving alone back to my farm. I'd been out of town for the whole weekend visiting family. I was running a little low on fuel, so I stopped at a gas station along the way. I pumped in my gas, and went inside the store to pay. Mustn't have been more than five minutes. I hopped back in my car and continued on my way, singing to myself and enjoying some alone time on the long journey back. A good twenty minutes passed, and by chance, I recognized someone walking along the road, heading in the direction of my farm. It was one of my farmhands, a young guy who had been working for me for a short while. He was carrying supplies back from town. Why was he walking instead of driving, I wondered? I pulled over and honked at him, motioning for him to get in with me. Sorry boss, he said. I woke up this morning, and you'll never guess what. The tires on the truck have been slashed again. I was going to call you as soon as I got back to the farm. Oh, my neighbor, I suspected. I've got him this time. In a rage, I sped back to my farm, eager to look over my security footage and catch my neighbor in the act to put a stop to this nonsense once and for all. We arrived back at the farm, rushed inside to the computer, and loaded up that day's footage. There, on CCTV, was a masked figure sneaking onto my property and slashing my tires. It was my neighbor, for sure. His same build, his same scraggly hair hanging out the back of the mask. I was furious, and immediately called the police. Oh, this was juicy. I had finally caught him red-handed. My farmhand and I checked through the rest of the day's footage, seeing if he'd been up to anything else. Nothing else seemed out of the ordinary. We got to the part where we had just pulled up into the driveway. That's when the footage displayed something that took a while to fully sink in. The footage showed what we expected. In it. You could see my farmhand and I pull into the driveway, get out of the car, and rush into the house. Nothing else happened for a few moments. The car just sat there, parked outside the house. Then, the back door slowly opened. Somebody had been hiding in the back seat of my car. A man I had never seen before in my life carefully exited the vehicle, 
looking towards the house as if to check if he'd been seen. He then sprinted off my property. I immediately grabbed a rifle and headed outside. I checked the back seat of my car. Nobody else there, thank God, but there was something that made my gut sink. Stabbed into one of the cloth seats was a hunting knife. The cops reviewed the footage and took the matter seriously. They later let me know that they'd reviewed the footage from the gas station I had stopped at as well. They told me that while I was inside paying for my gas, some wacko snuck inside the back seat of my car. He'd been lying down the whole journey back to the farm, hiding mere inches behind me. Why he targeted me and what he planned on doing, I can't say, but nothing else ever came of it. In a way, I'm glad my neighbor caused me so many problems. If it wasn't for him, I'd never have installed those cameras. Nor would I have passed my farmhand on the way back to the farm. I'm guessing that if my farmhand hadn't been in the car with me, things would have ended very differently. I have thalassophobia. This is defined as an intense and persistent fear of the sea, or of sea travel. It can also include the fear of being in large bodies of water, fear of the vast emptiness of the sea, of sea waves, and of distance from land. Most people find this odd, considering I grew up on an island in the Pacific Northwest. My relationship with the ocean is one of love and hate. I find it beautiful and mysterious and terrifying all at the same time. I can ride a ferry or a boat like riding in a car, and I can even swim in the shallows. It's what's beyond there that scares me. This experience is responsible for that fear. I was ten years old. My grandparents lived right on the beach where the ferry docks. When I say right on the beach, I mean there was only a twenty-foot-long yard and a stone bulkhead separating their home from the shore. I grew up digging for clams when the tide was low, building forts from driftwood and swimming in the freezing cold waters of Puget Sound. I had no fear of the sea. I guess it also helped that my parents' home was close to the ocean too. This particular morning, my grandfather had recruited me to help him repair one of the crab pots that he had set up the previous week. It was early, and there was a layer of fog covering the water. I hopped in the small boat and buckled my life jacket as my grandfather pushed us out into the sea. I let my fingers slide across the top of the water as we moved farther and farther out. The sea became darker and darker. Soon I could no longer see the bottom. We stopped at the bright orange and red buoys that marked our pots. While my grandpa pulled up the broken one, I stared over the side of our small boat. I could see a small school of fish swimming just below the surface. My grandpa asked me for some pliers. I reached down into the bag of tools in front of me and pulled out a pair. As I handed them to my grandpa, I looked over the edge of the boat again. The school of fish had scattered quickly. I looked closer into the darkness and saw two eyes staring back at me. I knew what fish eyes looked like and these were not the eyes of a fish. They looked human. They were large and wide, and they were coming closer, rising from the depths of the water. They were wild and horrible. I jerked back, causing the boat to rock. My grandpa grabbed the back of my life jacket to stop me from falling over the edge. Whoa, kiddo, what's got you spooked? I pointed into the water and just said, eyes. My grandpa looked at me quizzically and then peered over the side of the boat where I'd been. Now my grandpa was an Irish World War II veteran, a former boxer who was covered in tattoos. Not a lot rattled the guy. When he looked back at me, I saw the distress on his weathered face. Without a word, he threw the crap pot he had been working on back in the water. Jules. Don't look into the water, okay? And keep your hands in your lap. The tone of his voice was low and serious, but I could tell by the way he called me by my nickname he was trying to keep me calm. 
I was the baby of the family, and my grandpa had always been fiercely protective of me. He rode back to shore faster than I thought a 76-year-old man could. Of course, my curiosity got the better of me, and I glanced into that dark water. About a foot below the surface, I saw what looked like black hair floating, moving through the water. I yelped and felt tears rolling down my cheeks. When the boat hit the rocky sand, my grandpa jumped out and pulled the boat out of the water. I was too scared to move. My grandpa picked me up and carried me up the stone steps to the yard. He didn't set me down until we walked through the front door. My grandma was standing in the living room with a concerned look on her face. Sweet Jesus, Richard. What's wrong? You're as white as a sheet. He set me down and knelt down next to me. Go in your grandma's room and watch TV, okay? He said to me, ruffling my hair and wiping a tear from my cheek. I ran into her bedroom and jumped on her big bed where their black cat, Dynamite, was sleeping. I cuddled up next to him as he purred. I strained my ears to listen to my grandparents going back and forth in the living room. Barbara, they were human eyes, like some goddamn banshee rising up from the depths of hell. Scared the kid half to death. My grandmother didn't say anything. I'm not taking the kids out on that boat. Not anymore. I tried to focus on the TV. I tried not to think about those eyes. What that thing could have possibly been. I had nightmares for weeks after that. As I got older, the memory seemed to fade. It still lurked in the back of my mind, but not as strongly as it did before. I often wondered if I had really seen it at all, if, in my adolescence, I had let my imagination get away from me. When I was a junior in high school, my grandfather passed away. Before he did, I remember sitting in the living room with him. He rocked back and forth in his old chair as he carved the hunk of wood in his hand. Hey, do you remember that time that we went out to fix the crab pot and we saw that thing in the water? I asked him. I half expected him to look at me like I was crazy. But he didn't. He stopped rocking. He didn't look up from his carving, but I could see his facial expression change. Yeah, but there was something I didn't tell you at the time. You were too young, and I didn't want to spook you any more than you already were. When I was pulling the boat in, I saw a head poking out the water. Just the top. It was covered in black hair, and those eyes were staring right at me. That's why I picked you up out of the boat and carried you. I didn't want to chance that thing, snatching you. I sat there in disbelief. Even at 83, and having survived two heart attacks and a stroke, this still shook him to the core. Not too long after this conversation, my grandfather passed away. As I said in the beginning of the story, I have a love-hate relationship with the ocean. It's beautiful and mysterious, but I'm sure that in its depths harbor dark things we cannot even begin to fathom. Whenever I ride the ferry, which is often... I find myself staring into the inky abyss of the sound, and expect to see those eyes staring back. There are a lot of crazy stories from Florida, but I think my experience has to be considered one of the weirdest. It took place two years ago, on a woody trail in Lee County, and I swear it's a hundred percent true. My girlfriend and I were driving home one night, and at one point or other, must have taken a wrong turn somewhere. We were coming home from a weekend break, and were taking an unfamiliar route back. It was dark, and our GPS wasn't working right on the country roads. We were both getting pretty frustrated, when, by chance, we saw another car parked up ahead of us in the distance. All the doors of the vehicle opened, and four figures stepped out. Perfect, we thought. Maybe they can help us. I rolled down the driver's side window and slowly drove up to where they were. I called out to them, asking for directions. We must have only been about 20 feet away from them and noticed that they were all standing with their backs to us. 
they were frozen still, completely motionless. Hey, uh, are you guys okay? I asked. No response. I drove up right next to their car, and again, I asked, Well, are you okay? In total unison, they all turned their heads to look at me. And when I say their heads, I mean only their heads. Some of them twisted their heads so much they were on backwards. The rest of their bodies remained perfectly still. But the worst part was their faces. When I saw them, I swear I felt like I was going to faint. They were pale white and completely featureless, like store mannequins or crash test dummies. The one closest to our car started shaking its head, no. Its head was moving very fast and jerky, and only became faster and faster. They all turned their bodies to face us, and started slowly moving towards our car, their movements stiff and awkward. We didn't stick around to see any more. My girlfriend yelled, drive, and believe me, I did. I looked back as we drove off, and they were all standing still again, except for the one that kept shaking its head real fast. Had I been the only one to have experienced this, I would have thought I was going crazy. Hell, everyone I've told has called me nuts. But my girlfriend can back me up, and neither of us will ever forget what we saw in those woods that night. Is there anyone else out there that's encountered something similar? We can't be the only ones. I live in a small town that sits alongside Bayou Tesh, a huge body of water that stretches on for 125 miles in the heart of Cajun country. Where we're from, there's a little known urban legend. Only folks who live around the bayou seem to know about it, and even then, only in certain circles. I only came to learn about it after I had an encounter with this thing myself. I'll get straight to it. I was out walking with a couple of friends of mine a few years back, one of those boring summer afternoons where you don't have anything to do but wander around aimlessly. Out of nowhere, all the sounds around me stopped. All I could hear was an eerie, loud breathing filling the air. It wasn't my breathing, nor the breathing of my friends. It was coming from elsewhere, but it was loud, and it was prominent, and it was literally the only thing I could hear. Do you guys hear that? I asked my friends. Well, I think I asked. I could feel the words escape my mouth, come out of my throat, but I couldn't hear them. I couldn't hear what my friends were saying back to me either. Their lips were moving, but all I could hear was that damn breathing. No birds, or rustling, or footsteps, or any other natural sounds at all. It was surreal. Hold up, I said, and tried to say, and motioned for my friends to wait for me. I then moved towards where I thought the breathing was coming from, behind a few trees next to the bayou. As I got closer, the sound of the breathing became louder and louder. I knew what curiosity did to the cat, but nonetheless, I followed that damn breathing to its source. It's hard to explain why. I just felt compelled to. It was like a magnet, drawing me in. The weird part was the different sound of each breath. They were more like gasps, if that makes sense. Like the person was struggling to breathe. They were all different from each other too, as if every breath was coming from a different set of lungs. I continued on to where I thought it was coming from. I came to a break in the foliage. There, thirty feet ahead of me, sitting on the edge of the bayou, was a man. He was wearing a western-style hat and a brown leather jacket. That's about all I could make out, seeing how his back was turned to me as he looked out across the muddy water. He was completely motionless, like he was really focused on something, but there was no doubt in my mind that the breathing was coming from him. Despite the weirdness of the situation, he didn't seem scary to me. I felt calm and serene. For whatever reason, I thought about approaching him. I managed to shake that thought out of my head, and instead called out a soundless, Hey! 
only the man's head moved. It slowly turned around to face me. His skin was the same shade as the leather of his jacket, and he looked to be half decayed. He had no lips, no eyes, just exposed teeth and two huge black holes. After staring at me for a few seconds, the man began to stand up. All sounds came back to me in that instant. As I looked into those dark pits in his face, my sense of calm disappeared. Now all I was filled with was dread. I bolted and ran back to my friends, told them we needed to leave immediately, and explained everything on the way. Most of them told me I was crazy, but one of them told me to come and talk with his grandparents. You see, the folks whose family have lived around Bayou Tesh for generations, they know about the man. I've heard several names floating around for him. Swamp Man, the Cajun Devil, but most just call him the Bayou Man. They say he's like a siren, that he travels around the circumference of Bayou Tesh on a continuous loop and draws people away from their friends and families, brings them out to him. Then he lures them to the water's edge and holds them under the muddy water until they expire, leaves them at the bottom of the bayou for the gators. His weird breathing, they say it's made up of the final gasps of each of the people he's ended. You can sleep tight now. They all tell me. The Bayou Man will only try to get you one time. You got lucky. I guess I did. I'm glad I didn't fall for his trick. In my late teens, I used to take part in competitive snowboarding. One of my competitions brought me to Snowshoe Mountain in West Virginia. While I was there, I couldn't shake this weird feeling. I chalked it up merely to pre-competition excitement, to the constant grey skies, and the fact that I had to cross two state lines to get here with my mum driving me. I made friends with some of the other competitors, one guy in particular. He and I both practiced the course together from time to time. It soon became quite apparent that not all of these courses were as well maintained as they ought to be. Watch out for that one kicker, I was told. It's dangerous. For reference, a kicker is a type of jump in a sense. While normal jumps are wedge-shaped and shoot the snowboarder upward, a kicker is more curved and launches you forward. They can be dangerous, because if you hit them wrong, you're basically throwing yourself headlong in any direction but the way you want to go, and there's little you can do to recover at that point when you're speeding down the slope at roughly 25 miles an hour. None of us wanted to hit that kicker very hard. There were too many trees around for our liking. The thing is, with this competition guaranteeing the winners a spot in the Nationals, many of us were itching for as many points as we could get. The day of the competition came. It was a weird day. Grey clouds. Everything felt heavy and off. I took my run among the first. I made it down the mountain, making decent time. On the way back up, I saw it those iconic red jackets, and a long stretcher covered up. Instantly, I knew. My buddy had gone hard on that kicker, after all. The officials tried to play it calm, but there's no coming back from a broken neck. A dark mood hung over us all. It was getting late, and my mum was ready to go home. Frankly, so was I. As soon as I got my awards, my mum hurried me into the car, and I managed to slip into the driver's seat, still in my gear. The drive back home was going to be a long one. It led us down winding, ill-lit back roads all the way through the mountains. The clouds from that morning never went away, covering the stars. Nor did that weird feeling. I was tired, sore, and the thought of my new buddy, now deceased, hung in the back of my mind. I just wanted to get away from there. After driving for a while, I started to bake inside my heavy snowboarding gear. I told my mum I needed to pull over and take some layers off. It was very dark, and the only traffic on this road, other than us, were a few semi-trucks. Thick wooded slopes and mountain rock faces lined the highway. No off-ramps till we got down from the mountain. 
Up ahead, I saw a small, curved dirt turnoff, barely the length of three cars. I quickly pulled in towards it. As the car eased to a stop, I noticed something in the dim reach of my headlights. A large, painted boulder, with something sitting on it. Reaching for the car door, I strained my eyes to see what it was. It looked like a large, weird-shaped, upright log with thick branches. What is that? I wondered. Suddenly, my mum started to hit my arm. Get us out of here, she ordered frantically. What? What is it? I demanded, still trying to make out the shape. Drive! She shouted. I could feel the weight of her hand hitting me through all my thick layers. Then, my tired eyes focused, and I could make out what was on the rock. It wasn't a log. It was a severed deer's head. It was perched upright on the rock, its cloudy eyes shining in the headlights, its tongue hanging out, red oozing down the side of the boulder, staining it a dark color. My heart started pounding in my chest. I looked around and noticed there were no other cars or trucks in the small pocket. There was room really for only one or two cars. Drive, my mum shouted again. I had to wait for a large semi to pass by first before pulling back out onto the main road. All the while, that thing was staring at me. It was only a few minutes, but it felt like an eternity. I could barely think between my mum shouting and the flood of panic squeezing my chest. As soon as that truck passed, I peeled back onto the highway. Where did that thing come from? Who put it there? And more importantly, why? There were no other people in the area that I could see, and no way for someone to park a truck or car. Was it some sick prank? Was there something waiting in the trees just out of sight? Was it really some sort of trap meant to throw us off? Or was it just some sort of omen related to my now gone buddy? I have no idea, and I really don't want to know. But yeah, that's my story. Just be careful if you find yourself driving through the mountains of West Virginia. Always be aware, and don't take chances unless you have to. We made it down the mountain okay, and I've been back to snowshoe since then. Thankfully, I've never come across anything like that again. It was just a weird day, I guess. A very dark, weird day. During the midsummer, usually around the middle of July, me and a few of my good friends, Ryan, Kevin and Tommy, always made time to go up to Kev's family cabin, located on Vermilion Lake, way up north in the forests of Minnesota. Throughout all of our young years, we would always be accompanied by Kevin's dad, and sometimes a few of our dads as well. Once we were juniors in high school, however, we felt mature enough to go to the cabin on our own, finally without Kevin's dad or any other adult supervision. My friend's cabin was very remote and very little, based upon a large island. Other cabins were on the island, but the next one closest to us was a solid half mile away at least, and you could only get to it by taking a man-made path around the island. I want to mention that to get to my friend's cabin, you had to park on a gravel road on the opposite side of the island, and take his boat across the lake about a half mile. Vermilion Lake is huge. My mind always had a tendency to run around while I was sleeping there. The cabin was all on one level, with only two bedrooms next to one another, a kitchen and living room area connected to them, and a bathroom in the back of the cabin. There was always one window in each of the rooms with no curtains to them at all, so it was very easy to see outside to the woods and lake. And this is where my mind would run, as I always thought about someone peering in. And they never were, of course. I had been to the cabin about a dozen times during my lifespan, and nothing bad ever happened there, so the older I got, the easier it was to sleep. Now for the event. On this particular trip, we planned to stay around five nights. On the third night during the trip, when we were finally on our own, we had set up a campfire and had been drinking beers all night. I don't condone underage drinking, but being the rebels we were, we just so happened to sneak some. We went out to the dock to stare up at the magnificent stars and enjoy our buzz, when all of a sudden, 
We heard something out on the water that sounded like a fish jumping out to catch a bug. We quickly looked over at the lake, wondering where the splash came from, our fishing poles at the ready. Thankfully, the moon was out that night, which lit up the lake. Without it, it would have been pitch black, what with there being no city lights for miles upon miles. Ryan began to point out to something. Um, guys, what the hell's that? After looking closely, and finally spotting what he was pointing at, the only way I can describe it is it simply looked like a head floating out in the middle of the lake, staring at us directly. It was about three quarters worth of a football field out in the lake from the dock. It had long, black hair, and a very pale, skin-like face, but I couldn't make out the eyes, mouth, nose, or chin, as if it was just a blob of pale skin with long black hair over it. I'll never forget that feeling that came over me. The hairs on my legs, neck, and arms all stood up, and I felt paralyzed on the inside and ready to go home at that moment. We told ourselves it was just a loon. Those birds are very popular night drifters on the lake, and they do their hunting late. I mean, it was possible that a loon all of a sudden popped up in the water after hunting for a bit. At least, we tried to convince ourselves of that scenario. All of us had the creeps. That damn thing wasn't moving one bit, just treading water in the same place. We went back to our campfire, lit it even brighter, and headed inside to drink more. We soon forgot about the head-like thing with the help of the beer. That is, until I had to use the bathroom really bad, and the one inside was preoccupied. I went outside to do my business, seeing how we were in the great outdoors. Whilst taking a pee and glancing at the beautiful moonlit lake, I noticed that the black, circular object was still there, but about thirty yards closer now, still looking as if it was staring right up at me. I could easily see the nose on this thing's face. Again, it was very pale, like it hadn't seen the sun for years. A very, very uneasy feeling came over me, and I immediately went back inside and told my friends to come and look. They all came outside to see it still there, looking at us as if the head was corked up and its chin was in the air. Nobody dared go down to the dock anymore, and we immediately went back inside, deciding it probably wasn't a loon. For a loon to stay in the same spot for almost an hour or two made no sense to any of us. This head-like object was stiff as a board and not moving a single muscle, just staring up at us from the deck. And there was no ripple effect from it at all. We said it was just a log and went back inside. I could tell everyone else felt uneasy too. A few hours passed. It was super late into the night at this point, and we all knew we needed sleep. Being my curious self, I looked back outside one last time, and the black object had completely vanished. I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief, thinking the log must have floated off or just hit shore somewhere else. There was no AC in the cabin, and we had to open the windows or else we'd fry in the middle of summer. Me and Tommy slept in the living room, while my two other friends slept in the two bedrooms with their doors open. Not being able to sleep, but keeping my eyes shut, I began to hear someone walking around outside at the bottom of the stairs to the cabin. I thought I was about to have a heart attack. No question that whoever or whatever I heard down there was on the deck, pacing back and forth, their feet clicking on the wood. It was as if they weren't sure what to do with themselves. It lasted for about three minutes. I wanted to whisper to my buddy, but was frozen in fear. I just kept my eyes shut and my ears on full alert. The footsteps sounded like they took two rapid steps up the deck stairs all of a sudden, but then turned around and sounded like they were sprinting away down the man-made path. After it sounded like the steps were long gone and a couple of minutes had passed, I woke up Tommy and asked him if he'd heard the steps. We both sat up and were startled by Ryan walking out of his room and saying, We need to leave. Now. There was something very disturbing about his expression. I asked him why. He woke up Kevin in the other room. Come on, get to the boat. It's time to go. What? Ryan, what the hell's wrong with you? Kevin asked. Ryan explained to us quickly while grabbing his stuff. I'll never forget what he told us. 
nor will my other friends. He said that when he was turning sides on his bed to get more comfortable, he saw someone peeking in at the top right corner of the window. The figure quickly shifted out of his view. He said all he saw was one eye, ghostly white skin, and long black hair down the window. When looking back at what he experienced, it chills us to the bone to realize that since this face was in the top right corner of the window in my friend's room, it was either damn near eight foot tall, standing on something like bricks trying to peek in, or was floating. Tommy and I told the others what we had heard outside the cabin, absolutely disturbed the hell out of our minds and feeling like we were going to be sick. We all packed up our stuff and booked it, not cleaning the cabin or anything. We locked up, and as we headed down the stairs, we saw bare footprints in the dirt, heading off along the path and all around the cabin. We picked up our pace, made it to the boat, not knowing what was watching us or around us, threw our stuff in the boat, untied it, and sped off. I didn't even think about the head in the water. My eyes were just glued to the island, trying to spot anything moving. I saw nothing. When we finally got our stuff packed in the car, we hopped inside and took off. We drove for about ten miles, when, out of the blue, Ryan all of a sudden broke down in the car, sobbing, saying things like, What was it, guys? What was it? Oh god, what did I see? We called to tell our parents what had happened on the way back, told them that Ryan was freaking out. They said to just get home safely and quickly. It was late, about four or five in the morning, but no one slept. It was a very quiet ride home. My friend's dad, who owns the cabin, went up that following weekend. Said he didn't experience anything weird while there, but did mention that the bare footprints were still lingering about. That bugged him badly. What Ryan saw in the window really hit him hard. After his breakdown, he had trouble sleeping for multiple nights, and ended up having to seek help for a couple of weeks and hop on some sleeping medicine. As time went on, he ended up being fine, but isn't too comfortable sleeping next to a window without a curtain. To this day, I can't explain what happened, nor why it seemed to happen to us. Nothing has ever happened at that cabin since that night, so we're told by Kevin's dad at least. I personally have never gone back to the cabin, which really makes me sad, because I have some great childhood memories from there. Tommy and Kevin have both been back and been fine, but Ryan refuses to ever set foot there again, and I'm with him. A lot of people have cabins on that island, so it could have been a prank in the making, and Ryan busted it when he saw the person in the window. It could also have been a person wanting to do something worse to us. I'll never be able to explain what was floating in the lake, but the fact that that incident, along with the footprints and someone looking in at Ryan, all happened in the same night, seems like more than a coincidence to me. I was out hiking in Morgan Monroe State Forest with my girlfriend one afternoon. It was a nice day, and the insects and birds were chirping away. Out of nowhere, the pair of us heard what sounded like three gunshots, one after another. They went off not too far down the trail. We looked at each other. A few seconds of silence. Then another three shots. Is that gunfire? My girlfriend asked me. I nodded, unable to think what else it could be out here. We decided to turn back, not wanting to chance running into some hillbilly nutjob or whatever. What struck me at that moment was the lack of any kind of sound coming from the woods. After the shots rang out, there wasn't any kind of nature sound at all. I mean, I get that the birds might have been scared away, but even the insects had fallen silent. We were both getting some weird vibes. The situation just felt unnatural. In amongst all the surreal silence, we heard one thing just behind us. Footsteps snapping on twigs. We turned to see who was following us. I half expected to see a hunter with a rifle. I was wrong. Moving down the trail towards us was this thing. A humanoid figure that obviously wasn't human. It was like looking at a living silhouette. 
Even in the light, it looked like it was hiding in the darkness. The thing just looked like a shadow. That's the best way I can describe it. The sunlight just wasn't hitting it for some reason. From its outline, it looked to just be skin and bones. And it was tall. Real tall. At least a foot larger than me, and I'm not a small dude. I'd scarcely believe I'd even seen the thing had my girlfriend not been there as well. It was walking in long strides, gaining a lot of distance with each step. Needless to say, we bolted back the way we came. I've no idea if that thing pursued us or not. We were both too terrified to turn back and look. We made it back to our vehicle and hightailed it home, not stopping for anything. We've never been back to Morgan Monroe since. Unless the both of us momentarily lost our minds at the exact same time, then there's something out in those woods, and neither of us plan on going back to find out what it is. So, near where I live, but a little farther out in the sticks, there's a glorified gravel path in the woods called Rube Hill. It runs maybe three miles long, and only half a mile of it's paved. On the south end is the pavement, with a few old but otherwise normal houses dotted around it. Deceptively average at that point. Then the houses end, the pavement ends, and the gravel road shoots up a steep hill. It's not taken care of at all. The gravel's piled up in potholes and berms, so unless you're driving a nice off-road vehicle, you'd want to take it easy. Since you'd need to drive slowly, you'd get a nice view of the handmade signs nailed to trees with messages like, No Trespassing, and We're Watching You, scrawled in Sharpie. At the top of the hill, the road winds lazily for a little under a mile before diving back down the other side of the hill. The gravel is in equally crappy condition on this side. After you reach the bottom of the hill, the road cuts straight for about a mile through cornfields before intersecting with another road. The reason I'm so familiar with the layout is that I've taken friends out on late night drives along this road to scare the bejesus out of them. Never an elaborate prank. I'd just drive slowly and play creepy music to get them amped up and paranoid. I always made sure to tell them about the meth heads and their labs out there, and how the sheriffs try to avoid going there because it's dangerous. I figured it was all hogwash. Just stories, you know. But now I think there's an element of truth to some of those rumours. I was with my friend Aaron one night, and we decided to go on a late night drive along Rube Hill to freak ourselves out. We took off, drove down the various country highways and backroads, and turned onto Rube Hill. I made sure to play extra creepy music, since Aaron and I had made the trip many times before. It honestly lost a lot of its creepy luster on me, but I still enjoyed the long drives and scaring my friends. Of course, the drive mostly went by uneventful, and we were almost across the hill, about to descend the other side. That's when Aaron started freaking out. I checked my mirrors to see what had spooked him so much, and saw truck headlights down the road behind us. They seemed to be back where the road first topped the hill. The truck made it under the only street light on the top of the hill, a really dim orange light, and I could see it was kicking up a ton of dirt. It was speeding towards us. I paused the music we were playing, and sure enough, with the windows down, I could hear the gravel crunching and flying, like the vehicle was speeding. Keep in mind that I've driven this road dozens of times, both during the day and at night, and not once have I ever encountered another vehicle. So, having a truck speeding to seemingly catch up to us at midnight on a road supposedly filled with rumoured junkheads was pretty jarring. Usually, I don't relinquish my brakes driving down that hill. This time, I didn't even touch them. Thankfully, we got home safe and sound. The next day, I'm hanging out with one of my other friends, Chris. Chris and I are lounging around, playing video games, talking about quantum physics, Chris's favourite thing, and Chipotle, my favourite thing. I of course told him about Aaron and I being chased, and I kind of hammed it up, made it come across more harrowing than it really was. Now Chris wanted to go to the road, so we waited until late at night, about 2am, and drove out to Rube Hill. This time I wasn't playing any music. I wanted to be alert. It was all going quite normally, just like usual, when I slammed on my brakes. 
I threw the car in park and turned to Chris. Oh, dude, you can see that too, right? Chris was just as confused as me. He looked at me and nodded. My headlights were clearly illuminating a thick metal cable stretched across the road in front of us. On the right, it was wrapped around a tree at roughly head height for an adult, and it was pulled taut across the road, anchored to a fence post on the left at roughly chest height. We were both sitting there, wondering what to make of it, when we heard gravel being thrown by tires behind us. I checked my mirrors, and sure enough, truck headlights were tearing arse down the road. I started freaking out. My breathing and heart rate were out of control, and I began sweating. Chris just swore quietly under his breath. I threw it into drive, pulled as far to the right as I could, and my low-sitting car slid under the cable with a loud metal-on-metal -metal scraping noise. I cringed as I heard the scrape, but I wasn't about to sit there and get deliveranced. So again, I flew down the hill, and this is the creepy cherry on the Sunday for me personally, because Chris didn't see it. As we left the tree line and entered the cornfields, I glanced to my right, past Chris, and briefly caught a glimpse of somebody standing about three or four feet back in the corn. I just felt my stomach scrunch up, and I floored the accelerator. I glanced in my rearview mirror and could see a man standing in the road behind us, illuminated by the moon and my taillights. He had a long object slung over his shoulder. I couldn't tell if it was a cane or maybe a rifle, but I didn't stay to find out. Before I could even tell Chris about it, we were around a bend and out of sight. That car had a scrape mark on the roof the rest of the time I owned it. It was a good reminder of why I never went out to that road again. I used to live in a pretty old house in Wichita. A lot of strange happenings went on there, and I'm not sure if they're related to this incident or not. Sometimes, especially at night, we'd hear what sounded like static voices whispering down the hallway, creaking footsteps in the rooms above us, and see brief shadowy outlines of people moving in the corners of our eyes. We chalked it up to the house just being old, and our paranoid brains making us see things that weren't really there. In said house, there was a spare bedroom in the attic that we never really used. My wife and I didn't have any kids, still don't, and we never had any guests who needed to come and spend the night, so the room remained mostly empty. We didn't have much stuff at the time, so we didn't need to store anything up there either. My wife always talked about turning the space into a little hobby room. Now that might sound like a good decision to most of you, but I personally was against that idea. You see, the attic always had a weird effect on me. I never liked to go up there. Every time I did, I'd get these weird, electric sensations, like the air around me was static, if that makes sense. It's hard to properly articulate, but there was something really off about the whole space, and I'd get uncomfortable just being up there. There was a small crawl space at the bottom of the leftmost wall, and that crawl space always freaked me out in particular. It was only a small hole that went back into the wall, barely enough space for a human to squeeze into it, but whenever I'd go near it, the strange static sensations would intensify. Just looking at the thing gave me a headache. My wife, on the other hand, never noticed anything strange about the attic. And, unfortunately for me, in this relationship, what she says goes. So I guess I was going to have to turn it into a hobby room. One night, I went up into the attic alone to start clearing some things out of it. Get it ready for the transformation, so to speak. The air up there felt static and unsettling as always. It was past sundown by that point, so the one small roof window wasn't letting in any light. I flicked the light switch, and for a brief moment, the room illuminated. It stayed light just long enough for me to get fully up into the room. Then, the light bulb started to dim. I mean, the brightness of the light just became lesser and lesser, to the point where I couldn't see anything at all. After a few seconds, the bulb went completely out. Ah, damn. Gonna have to replace that, I thought. That could wait. I clambered back down the ladder, back down from the darkness of the attic, 
rummaged through a drawer in my bedroom and pulled out a flashlight. I climbed back up into the blackness and switched the device on. Bright light came shining out of it. Then the strangest thing happened. After maybe two or three seconds of being on full beam, the flashlight too began to fade. Its light became dimmer and dimmer, and within a matter of seconds, the batteries had completely run out of juice. That was a strange coincidence, but nothing more than that, I thought. Back down the ladder I scampered. I rummaged through my drawers again and pulled out four fresh batteries. I reloaded the flashlight with two of them and stuck the other two in my pocket. I climbed back up into the attic. Blick. I switched on the flashlight again, and again it lit up the room in front of me in a cone of light. After maybe two or three seconds, that light started to get weaker. After ten seconds, the flashlight was dead again, leaving me in total darkness. Now, up in the attic all by myself, completely blind, I became more aware of that oppressive, electrical quality. I quickly fumbled with the bottom of the flashlight, unscrewing it until it finally came loose. The two batteries inside fell out onto my hand. God damn, they were boiling hot, to the point where they actually felt like small blocks of fire on my palm. I dropped them instantly and began stuffing in the other two batteries I brought along. I managed to get them in without too much hassle and flipped the switch on the device once again. Out poured the light and I did a quick 360 to check my surroundings. I soon calmed myself down, seeing that everything was as it should be, and shone my flashlight at the ground where the two hot batteries had fallen. They were lying right next to the crawl space. The static sensation became more noticeable as I bent down to pick them up. And, lo and behold, the damn flashlight in my hand began to lose power once again. That was it, I thought. I was just going to scoop up the fried batteries if they weren't too hot and get the hell down from there. As I got to the ground, the light from my flashlight was at about half strength. Now, at eye level with the crawl space, the electricity in the air felt stronger than it ever had before. A strange compulsion took me, and I turned to look into the crawl space and shone the fading light of my torch into it. Staring back at me were two black eyes. I only caught sight of whatever it was for a moment, but it was human-shaped and lying on its stomach twitching, with long, black hair running down the sides of its chalk-white base. It looked both human and non-human at the same time. It wore no clothes, but I couldn't tell you if it was male or female. Terror and disgust hit me all at once as my flashlight ran out of power again, leaving me once again in darkness, only this time with this thing right next to me. I jumped up and hurried back down the ladder, back out of the attic. Above me, I could hear it moving, first from what sounded like within the walls of the attic, and then from what sounded like the roof. That didn't make any sense. The crawl space didn't lead to the roof. Soon, the noises were gone. I ran downstairs to tell my wife we needed to leave at once. She looked at me in total confusion. She hadn't heard a damn thing. I explained to her as best I could, told her what I'd seen in the crawl space. She just laughed at me, told me I'd just seen a rat. That thing was no rat. After that incident, I never had the same strange static feeling when I went into the attic. The electricity in the air that I'd noticed for so long disappeared overnight. All the weird happenings around my home stopped as well. There were no more weird noises, no unusual shadows or creaks, and that crawl space, it returned to just being a regular hole in the wall. Nothing strange or unexplainable happened for the rest of the time I lived in that house. Maybe the whole incident was simply a brain spasm. You know, I could accept that. Maybe I just lost my mind for a few minutes. Sure, it's possible. But I know my wife's suggestion that it was just an animal is complete baloney. I may have only looked at the thing for a second or two, but I'll never forget what it looked like. It was damn near human. I have no idea what the static quality in the air was, nor why I was the only person who ever noticed it. But whatever that creature was in the crawl space, it took the static with it when it left. I live in a rural part of Colorado, 
on a farm close to the infamous Riverdale Road. A lot of strange goings on along that road, let me tell you. People have claimed to have seen all kinds of apparitions while travelling down it. One part of the road even leads off to a mansion that was once the headquarters of a satanic cult. Some folks say that the gates to hell are located there by the chicken coop, but that doesn't really have anything to do with this story. At least, I hope it doesn't. I must have been 14 years old at the time, doing some schoolwork at home, when, all of a sudden, my brother came running in, hollering, said that a mangy dog had wandered onto our property. My dad and I went out to take a look with him. Lo and behold, there was a humongous Doberman standing about 20 yards from our house, completely motionless. It didn't look healthy at all. Dobermans are almost always black, with patches of brown. This one was off-color, gray, and covered in blisters. It looked as if it was decomposing, despite still being alive, if only barely. Its eyes, they weren't like alive creatures. They were stark white, like it was blind or something. No pupils or color at all. It was panting heavily, and just looked at us, begging to be put out of its misery. We had no idea where it could have come from. There wasn't another house near ours for as far as the eye could see. And of the houses that were nearby, well, none of them had a Doberman. My dad didn't want the thing to suffer, and he certainly didn't want it spreading disease to our livestock. So he got his rifle and told us to go back inside. We knew what he meant. We went back and switched on the TV. No more than a few seconds later, we heard a shot ring out from the outside. My dad then dug a grave and buried the poor creature in a patch of unused land away from our house. That night, we all woke up to the sound of aggressive barking from outside. That was odd. We got up to check what it was. Outside our house was another Doberman, looking identical to the one that had wandered onto our property in the day. This one, too, was diseased-looking, missing half its fur and covered in lumps. Where were these dogs coming from? Like the one before, this one was just standing motionless, waiting in the exact same place. What were different this time, though, were the eyes. They were still stark white, but they weren't like before. They were shiny, the color of the moon, like they were glowing. They stood out against the darkness of the night. Where are you poor creatures coming from? My dad asked it, rhetorically. Look away, boys, he said. We ignored his command. After staring at the beast for a few moments, my dad raised his rifle again and fired at the animal's head. It collapsed to the ground. Uh, get back to bed, he told us. We did as he said this time, but couldn't get much sleep. Dad went to dig another grave beside the one that he had made earlier. But that's the thing. The grave he'd dug for the other dog was empty. It had been dug out from the inside. The dog he'd just shot, it was the same dog as before. He placed the strange animal back in the empty hole, filled it back up with earth, and retired to bed. We all put it down to the creature's will to live. Next morning, when we all woke up, we went to check on the grave. The damn thing was empty, dug out from the inside again tracks leading off to the woodland near our house. After that, we never saw the dog again, though to this day, about once every three months, we hear that same barking coming from the woods near our house. Occasionally when we do, we'll look outside the window and see one of our farm animals standing in the exact same place that dog stood, just watching us, waiting for the gun. Sometimes it's a pig, sometimes just a hen. But no matter what, they always look decomposed. They never move. And, at night, they all have those bright, moon-like eyes. Had to put down at least a dozen of them over the years. I don't know what that dog brought to our farm, but it ain't going away. 
I live on the outskirts of Sapporo, in Hokkaido, Japan. It's an extraordinarily safe place to live, albeit a little freezing cold. This story just so happened to take place during a particularly cold winter there. The whole area was covered in snow, and the sun was beginning to set. I was power walking along the Ishikari River, desperately trying to get home. Even after living here for the past ten years, I still haven't gotten used to that damn cold. As I made my way along the riverside, I noticed a man up ahead, standing with his back to me. He had his hood up over his head, and despite all the snow, he was barefoot. I scanned the area, and there was absolutely nobody else around. Now, as I mentioned, I lived in an extremely safe part of the world. But even still, I felt a little uneasy. There was just a weird atmosphere about the guy. The way he was standing completely still, with his back turned to me. Well, he obviously wasn't looking at the river. Was he just standing there, staring at the ground? Not to mention, I'm a five foot two, petite woman, and this guy appeared to be at least six foot, very tall by Japanese standards. Still, I put all those worries to the back of my mind. The man remained perfectly still as I came to pass him. I muttered a quiet, good evening, under my breath, in a vain attempt to ease my unease, I suppose. He didn't reply as I walked past. All I could hear were the sounds of my footsteps, rhythmic and predictable. After ten or fifteen steps, though, something interrupted the flow of their beat. I turned around and saw that the barefoot man was following behind me now. But his face, the best way I can describe it is like a mannequin, or one of those wooden figures that artists use. Don't get me wrong, his face was fleshy, but there were no features. His head was faceless, just like an operabo from Japanese folklore. As I picked up my pace, he did as well. Now, extremely frightened, I broke out into a sprint, desperate to get away from the faceless man. Looking back over my shoulder, I could see that the man was running at full speed as well, no longer just keeping pace, but actually gaining on me. I had never felt such fear in my life. I managed to make it to a corner with a bridge. From it, passing cars could see me. If this was the end, there'd at least be witnesses. I turned around one final time to see how close the man was to me now. But that's the thing. He was just standing there, frozen in place once again. He stood, facing me, if you want to call it that, and remained motionless as I fled into the distance. I ran all the way back to my home, unsure of what to do. Should I call the police? What should I tell them? That I saw a noperabo? As the night went on, I continued to deliberate. By midnight, I decided to sleep on it. I fell into a deep slumber, exhausted by the events of the evening. I was awoken by a series of loud, melodic notes. It was my front doorbell. I rubbed my eyes and checked the clock next to my bed. 3 a.m. What the hell? To say I was surprised would be an understatement. I have an app on my phone with a camera that's linked to my doorbell. That way, I can see who's standing at my front door without ever having to get up and check. I opened the app to see who in God's name was ringing my doorbell at 3 in the morning. The live footage from the camera popped up. Standing at my front door, with his head close up to the camera, was that same faceless figure I had seen by the river. It had somehow followed me. I dropped my phone in a state of pure shock. In a panic, I immediately ran into my bathroom and locked the door. My mind was racing, and I knew I had to call somebody for help. The police, my parents, my friends or my neighbours, I didn't care. Just anybody who could make this faceless man disappear. Stupidly, I had left my phone on my bed after I dropped it, 
but I was far too scared to leave the safety of my locked on suite. After twenty minutes, I finally worked up the courage to go and get it. I lifted my device, and with my eyes half covered by my hands, reopened the app to see if he was still standing in my doorway. The live feed popped up again. The faceless man was nowhere to be seen. I took the opportunity to call my father. I told him some strange man had stalked me to my house, that he had come for me in the night. Needless to say, he rushed over and arrived only a few moments before a police car. He had taken the liberty of calling them for me. I explained the situation to them all, told them about bumping into a faceless man by the river. I showed them my app, which confirmed my doorbell had indeed been activated at three in the morning. Frustratingly, the app didn't have a record function, so I had no definitive evidence to show them. Okay, said one of the cops. Be on the lookout for a man with no face. Got it. I thought he was mocking me, so I insisted I was being serious. Oh, believe me, I'm taking this seriously, ma'am, he said. You're not the first one around here to report this guy. As of right now, nothing's come of their investigation. I don't know how many people in my town have claimed to have seen this guy, but from what the cop said, I at least know I'm not the only one. There's one final detail I have to share. When the police searched the area, they found a set of footprints in the snow, mud and grass around my house. They led from my front doorstep all the way around the perimeter of my house. Whoever had left them had stopped outside every one of my ground floor windows. The prints had obviously been made by somebody walking barefoot. No DNA could be extracted from them. I live in a remote, rural part of East Oklahoma. Nothing but farmland, wide empty fields or forests all around, depending on which direction you're looking. The nearest town is a solid ten minute drive away from here, and before that, there's barely any signs of life at all. Oftentimes, I feel a little isolated here, especially since I live by myself. I arrived home from town one evening, just before sunset. It had been a long day at work, and to be honest, I was exhausted. I fed my little dog Curly, a Jack Russell Terrier, and then set about fixing up some dinner for myself. After that, I eased myself down into my armchair and flicked on the TV, put on some mindless show to zone out to. Ah, oh, just what the doctor ordered, I thought. A nice, relaxing evening. As I watched TV, my eyelids became heavier and heavier. At some point, I drifted off to sleep. I woke up in my armchair a couple of hours later to the sound of Curly barking. Damn dog, I said, frustrated. Oh, shut up, would you? With that, Curly obediently fell silent. Good boy. It was pitch black outside now. The TV was the only thing lighting the room. Oh, I felt groggy and dazed, the way one does when they're suddenly woken up mid-nap. I stood up and made my way towards the kitchen to get a glass of water. I walked through to the hallway. Like I said, I was in a tired frame of mind, which is probably why it took me a moment to process that my front door was wide open. I always leave my front door locked. Living alone in the sticks can make a guy paranoid, and I never take any chances. My first thought was that some animal had wandered into my house while I slept, but that of course didn't make any sense. As far as I knew, there weren't any animals in this part of the country that could unlock a door. My thoughts went to Curly. He never usually barked for no reason. Confused, I walked back into the living room. There, hiding under the coffee table, was Curly. I'd never seen him like this before. He was looking directly into the dark dining room ahead of him, staring at something with surgical focus, absolutely transfixed. Had he not been shaking, you'd have probably thought he was a small statue. 
he knew something I didn't, namely what was in the dining room. All I could see through the doorway was darkness. The sound of a commercial played in the background from my TV. I inched closer to the dining room entrance, and Curly began to squeak, as if to warn me not to go in. I must have only been about six or seven steps from the doorway when I heard creaking from my dining room floorboards. My throat began to feel tight as the reality of the situation dawned on me. Then, through the blackness of the entrance, a huge, hunched-over figure stepped out towards me. It walked through into the living room and stood up in front of me. It was the tallest man I had ever seen in my life. He must have been seven feet tall, and he looked to be well-dressed. His upper body was immensely broad, but his lower body and limbs were long and stick-thin, like an emaciated skeleton. Its head, I wanted to vomit when I looked at it. It was far too small for its huge body, half the size of a normal human head. The light from my TV lit up its face. I thought I was going to pass out, but I couldn't help but stare at it. The best way I can describe it was like the face of a porcelain doll. Its skin was extremely pale and had absolutely no blemishes or markings, with a sheen like it was made of china. The shape of a human face was there, but the features were like a child's and looked as if they had been painted on. It was like a giant living doll. The expression remained frozen on its face as it just stood there, looking down at me, six steps away from me. Hell, maybe only three steps for him. We just stood, looking at each other for what could have been five seconds or five minutes. Curly was going wild. It was surreal. That's when it let out the most disturbing, distorted wail I have ever heard. The tall man then stepped awkwardly towards me, the expression on its baby face unchanged. I ran to escape it, but it pushed past me and made for the front door. It ran out of my house, its thin legs struggling to hold up its body. I dashed upstairs to get my rifle, terrified it might return. I checked it was loaded, and then looked out my bedroom window. I watched from my window as the man-thing sprinted from my house. It leapt over the fence separating my property from the field next door and began running through the empty plains. It was a dark night, but there was just enough moonlight for me to make out one final disturbing detail. Without stopping, it twisted its head around until it was on backwards, so those soulless, empty doll eyes could look back at me as it ran away. My stomach almost hit the floor. It kept its porcelain face turned towards me as it faded into the tree line at the end of the field. I knew I should call somebody and tell them what just happened, but who? Hello, police. A huge doll man thing just broke into my home and he took nothing. You know, what could I say? I confided in friends and family who, guess what, told me I was going nuts. Hence why I'm sharing my story here. I wanted to get this off my chest, share it with people who might actually have something more constructive to say about my experience, people who won't just call me mad. I've done some research, and it seems like there have been some similar sightings in Hawaii. I don't think I can be alone in my experience. If anyone else knows what these things are, or has any other information to share, please let me know. I was having a drunken heart-to-heart -heart with my dad the other night, and we were sharing some stories from the past. He told me an experience he had back in the late 1980s, which he described as the luckiest escape of his life. After hearing the story, I'm inclined to agree. He was about 25 years old, and going through a rough patch in his life. Him and my future mum had just broken up, and they would later get back together, but that's a different story. Anyway, he needed to get away for a while. As such, he decided to rent out a cabin for the weekend. Just him, 
the bird song, and a few beers. He booked one in this really remote, wooded area. He goes and collects the keys from the cabin's owner, a really nice guy in his thirties. Friendly, helpful, no trouble whatsoever. He gives him a quick tour of all the rooms, asks if there's anything more he can do, and then leaves my dad to it. My dad spends his first day there, relaxing and recharging, enjoying the beautiful scenery and trying to take his mind off his crummy situation. On that first evening there, he heads out on a long walk through the nearby woods. He wants to clear his head outside before the sun sets. He gets a little bit lost, however. By the time he gets back to the cabin, it's already dark. He enters the cabin, and immediately, something strikes him as weird. The curtains at the back of the cabin were drawn closed. Strange, he didn't remember closing them before he went out on the walk. Then again, his head was all over the place that weekend. Hello? He calls out. No response. Shaking it off as a mistaken memory, he walks into the bedroom to go to sleep. Again, something seems off inside. It wasn't the curtains again. There weren't any windows in the bedroom area. He says there was just a strange atmosphere in the room. He felt tense and ill at ease. Something in the back of his mind, in his subconscious, told him that there was a threat nearby. He grabbed his car keys and jacket, walked out the front door, got into his car, and drove to a hotel. For whatever reason, he refused to stay in that cabin. At the end of the weekend, he returns to the cabin at around 4pm to drop the keys back to the owner. To his surprise, the owner's already there, along with several police officers. They're all astonished to see my dad. You see, the cabin's owner had come by a little earlier than he and my dad had agreed to collect the keys. Obviously, my dad wasn't there, so the owner had a look around the cabin to check that everything was alright. On the couch in the living room, there was a large, muddy shovel. That was a little weird, he thought. Then, he entered the bedroom. Inside, he found several Polaroid pictures laid out neatly on the bed. They were of my dad taken at various points throughout the day. One of him drinking a beer outside, one of him looking out the window, one was even of the cabin owner handing him the keys. They had all been taken from within the tree line. On the back of the last picture, someone had left a handwritten message. So close. Realizing that someone had been stalking my dad from the very beginning of his trip, and that my dad was now missing, the owner immediately called the police. When they arrived, they scoured the woods in search of my dad. Not too deep in, they found a freshly dug hole, four foot deep, seven foot in length. My dad arrived an hour later. The brain's a funny thing. Sometimes the subconscious takes in information that we aren't fully aware of. Perhaps something else was slightly out of place in the bedroom, or just different to how we left it. Whatever the case, the warning signals went off, and he listened. If this story has taught me anything, it's to always listen to my gut. Instinct probably saved my dad's life that night. This didn't just happen to me, but my friends, Macy, Eric, and Dorian too while we were all out on a trip in northwest Montana. Macy's parents had a cottage out by Flathead Lake. One weekend, we all decided to head over there and do a spot of fishing. In this digital age, it's very easy to lose touch with nature. Personally, I was starting to feel like a caged animal that summer, trapped indoors with no reason to go outside. Well, no reason other than my crappy part-time job. I guess we all just wanted to reconnect with the great outdoors. They say that when you're around old friends, you act the same age that you were when you met them. That was definitely true for us. We were a bunch of 19 year olds, goofing around like we'd just hit puberty. Some things never change. We get to the cabin, and it's absolutely beautiful. A serene little log cabin, far out in the middle of nowhere. It was nice to get away from the bustle of our town. 
I mean, the cabin still had internet and everything, so it's not like we were totally living off the grid. But for us, this was going to be a taste of what it felt like to be a real outdoorsman. We all unpack and get to fishing as planned. Not many bites that day, sadly. Dorian wandered off by himself, looking for a better fishing spot. When he finally came back a while later, he seemed a little agitated. He told us that while out fishing a ways away, he heard what he thought was rustling in the tree line to his right. A little concerned about what it might be, he kept an eye on the area. Most of his attention was still focused on his rod in the water, when he heard what he thought was a bell ringing from the same spot in the trees. He swore that he saw a figure watching him from the bushes. Not that he could make out many features, he was still a fair distance away, but it looked like he was wearing a hoodie and crouching. That's when he grabbed his gear and hightailed it back to us. This put us all on edge. The closest cabin to ours was far, far away. We weren't expecting to see another soul this whole weekend. Still, it was probably nothing. We called it a day and headed back to the cabin early. We ate dinner and joked around until sunset, though we all kept occasionally glancing out the window. None of us said what we were looking for, but it was obvious that Dorian's story had made us all a little paranoid. Being the dumb kids we were at heart though, we decided to stick around for the night. When you're deep in nature, the nights are particularly dark. No light pollution. Looking out the window was like looking into the abyss unless you pressed your face right up to the glass. Then you could just about make out the outlines of the trees that surrounded us. To us, the slight fear we were all feeling was kind of fun. You know when you're with your buddies and you get spooked by something, but for whatever reason, you all kind of stick around and try to spook each other as well. Well, it was kind of like that. If any of us were by ourselves, we'd have been freaking out. But since we were all together, it was a sort of mini rush. Eventually, it starts getting late and we hit the hay. We're all sleeping in separate areas of the cabin. I'm in the living space on the couch. I'm exhausted from the long day, and the sound of the wind outside is sending me off to sleep. I'm almost out cold, when I hear the distinct sound of a bell ringing. It was coming from just outside the front of the cabin. It sounds off once, and then again, and again, sometimes quick and loud, sometimes slow and faint. I'm sitting upright in a heartbeat, and I don't have to call for my friends. They're all congregating in the living space now, keeping their voices low. It's the guy from the bushes, Dorian whispered to us all. He's outside the cabin. Pressing my eyes close to the window, I could see that he wasn't wrong. Out in front of the cabin, facing us, was a figure in a goddamn rocking chair. He was sitting stiff, rocking back and forth in the breeze. We have no idea how to react. After a while of watching in fear, Macy, the bravest of the group, opens up the window and shouts to the guy to go away that his prank wasn't funny. The guy in the chair doesn't react, and just sits there, rocking gently, the sound of the bell ringing out. We grab a few knives and cautiously walk out the front door of the cabin, staying in a tight group. I was just following Macy at this point to be honest hoping that he knew what he was doing. Get out of here, Macy shouts, as we slowly get closer to the guy. Again, he doesn't react, and for good reason. The guy in the chair isn't alive. It's an old, dead man. We panic. Eric made a break for the tree line before coming to his senses and running back to the cabin with the rest of us. We locked the door and made sure all of the windows were sealed tight. Then we called the authorities. It took what felt like a lifetime for them to finally find us. They were just as weirded out by the dead old man as we were. Examining him in greater detail, they said that whoever he was, he'd been dead for a long time. They could tell from the decomposition. He was most likely disinterred from his grave. Namely, some sicko had dug this poor guy up and put him in that damn rocking chair. 
Whoever had done this had also tied a small bell around the man's neck, which rang out as the chair rocked back and forth. A very light set of footprints could be made out in the dirt, leading up to the chair from the tree line. The authorities couldn't find a set leading back though, so God knows what direction the perpetrator walked off in. To our knowledge, the investigation never came to anything. Whoever was watching Dorian from the woods that day remains at large. Why they dug up the old man and used him to terrorize us, I have no idea. The year was 1937. The setting? Beijing, then known as Peking. 19-year-old Pamela Werner was the adopted daughter of an established British diplomat and had spent the vast majority of her life in the Chinese capital. She was fluent in Mandarin, knew her way around the city well, and had many friends who she socialized with frequently. On a cold evening in January, Pamela went ice skating with her friends. She was due to leave for London in a few days to further her education, and wanted to spend some quality time with the people she cared about the most. At around 7pm, Pamela said goodbye to her friends. This would be the last time they'd ever see her alive. The next morning, Pamela's mutilated corpse was discovered by the last surviving section of Peking's Ming Dynasty Wall, only a short walk from her home. Her ribs were broken, and many of her organs had been cut out, her heart, kidneys, liver, and bladder were missing. Her throat had been slashed open so deeply that her head was almost severed. Her right arm was barely still connected to her torso. The frozen ground around her was stained red. The expensive watch on her wrist had stopped a few minutes after midnight. It remains unclear what happened to Pamela after she left the ice rink that night. There's no concrete evidence to tell us where she went what she may or may not have got up to, or who she may or may not have bumped into. With all that said, two prominent theories do exist. Paul French and Graham Shepard have both published books about the murder mystery of Miss Werner, but the authors paint two very different pictures. In fact, the only thing they both seem to agree on is that Pamela's life came to an end with a blow to the head. I'll start with French's version of events, which he presents in his book, Midnight in Peking. After researching the case extensively, French believes it's most likely that after skating with her friends, Pamela met up with another group of females to go to a party. The party was being hosted by an American dentist in the city, Wentworth Prentice. Prentice and his friends were known for not being the nicest of people, put it like that. Not the kind of guys you'd bring back home to mother. Pamela was a patient of the bad boy dentist, and so likely didn't feel intimidated by him or his mates. Their party eventually moved on to another place, a seedy club in a place known as the Badlands. You can imagine what kind of things went on in that neighborhood. French claims that it's here Pamela was separated from her friends. There she stood, in a room with only a bed in it, surrounded by a group of men. From there, a number of things could have happened. Maybe she resisted, maybe she screamed. Maybe one of the men panicked and hit her over the head with something hard to shut her up. Either way, that was both the end of the party and the end of Pamela. The men then drained her body of all her blood to make her lighter and easier to move. They took her to where she was discovered the next morning, a place with no street lights and few passers-by. Their plan was to chop up her body, make her unrecognizable, dispose of the pieces in predominantly Chinese areas, and passed the blame on to a non-existent local psychopath. 
The dentist and his friends were all hunting buddies, and all knew their way around a blade. They were likely interrupted when someone came by, and left Pamela where she was found. Graham Shepard's hypothesis about what happened that night is much different. The writer himself was a former police detective, and he claims that French's version of events doesn't make sense from a policing perspective. No, his version is much more simple, and goes like this. Pamela was not the kind of girl who'd go along with a group of men to the infamous Badlands. That would have been completely out of character for her. Even if the party actually happened, it's likely that she never went to it. It's more likely that she met up with one of her old Chinese schoolmates, a man called Han Su Ching. This man would be the one to end her life after she broke his heart sometime before. He probably dumped her body in the street late that night, and then some random passers-by harvested her organs to sell for some superstitious Chinese medicine practices. A dark theory indeed. Both writers have problems with each other's version of events, but in all likelihood, we'll never know which one, if either, is correct. In 1943, the Japanese army took control of Peking, and the investigation into Pamela's demise came to an end. After the war, all interest in the case faded, Whatever evidence had been collected was already lost. We know as much now as 82 years ago. Although the circumstances of Pamela's untimely demise remain a mystery, and probably will forevermore, at least these two books have shone a light on her case, and ensure that she won't be forgotten to history. I am a private investigator in a small town in central Ukraine. For the sake of my business, I can't reveal which town exactly. Heck, I probably shouldn't even be sharing this story to begin with, yet here we are. Most of the cases I've worked over the years have been unremarkable to say the least. I specialize in infidelity, and spend most of my working days spying on cheating husbands and wives, then reporting back to my client letting them know whether their partner is innocent or guilty of a double dipping, so to speak. A few years back, though, I worked an unusual case, one that ended up being much darker than I anticipated. It all started when a husband and wife entered my office. They hadn't even booked an appointment. They didn't need to. Just from glancing up at them, I instantly knew who they were. The Roschers, by far the richest people in our area. They had the biggest house, nicest car. Everybody knew they were hot stuff. I asked them to take a seat and tell me how I could help them. Sir, they explained to me. It's our daughter, Sophia. She's run away with her new boyfriend, and we have no idea where she is. They've only known each other for a couple of weeks. They left two days ago. Look, she left us a note. The father handed me a crumpled up piece of paper. It read as follows. Dear mother and father, I've decided to elope with my boyfriend, Andre. He's won my heart, and I wish to start a new life with him across the border. I don't know when I'll be back, if ever. Don't cry for me, for he makes me happier than anyone deserves to be. Forever yours, Sophia Roscha. They told me this was completely out of character. Not to mention, the handwriting didn't look like hers at all, and the words didn't sound like something she had put. It was all too formal. They tried calling Sophia, but she never answered. The family immediately went to the police, begging them to help find their daughter. The authorities were strangely unhelpful. They said there was no reason to be suspicious, and that the girl had just left on her own terms. The family even offered to pay the cops, seeing how rich they were and all, but even still, they refused to look into the case. That's why they came to me. I was the only person who'd be willing to help them look for her. I asked if there was anything they could give me to help me get started. They gave me several pictures of Sophia and her new boyfriend, Andre, a very handsome young man in his late twenties. Apparently they had to snap the pictures secretly. Andre really hated being on camera. So, that's not all, they told me. You see, the reason we came to you specifically. This morning we received an anonymous letter in the mail. We have no idea who it came from. Here. I opened the precisely folded letter and read it. 
to the Roscha family. Your daughter Sophia is in grave danger. Andre is not who he claims to be. The police won't help you. It may already be too late. Go to this man for help. It's your best chance. Signed, a friend. The man he named in the letter was me. The plot thickened. I agreed to help the family, told them I'd make the case my priority. They told me to do whatever I had to do. Money wasn't a factor. Problem was, with zero leads, it was hard to know where to start looking. Turns out, a lead came to me. An hour after Sophia's parents left my office, I received a call from a private number. An unknown male voice spoke. Listen closely. Andre will be at this location at 8 p.m. He won't be alone. It could be dangerous. If you go, be careful. I jotted down the location the stranger told me. A restaurant in the nearest city. Maybe a 45-minute drive away. I then asked him the obvious question. Who am I talking to? A friend. Whatever you do, don't tell the parents. How do I know I can trust you? I've already said too much. Good luck. The line went cold. No doubt it was the same guy who sent the letter to the Roschers. I thought about calling them, but decided to heed the stranger's warning. Instead, I grabbed my camera and hopped in my car outside, drove to the restaurant the guy mentioned. I made it there around 8.15. I entered and made my way to the bar, ordered a soft drink. I subtly scanned the room. There, on the corner table, was Andre, the supposed boyfriend. So much for running and eloping to another country. He was sat with a girl. It wasn't Sophia. What the hell was this guy up to? I kept an eye on them, biding my time. They paid their bill. I paid mine. They left together. I followed behind at a distance. They both got into a car outside. I got into mine. They had no idea I was tailing them as they drove off. After about 20 minutes of driving, I was startled when I saw them turn off into what looked like an abandoned factory complex. Not exactly a romantic spot. I pretended to continue on down the road, straight, then quietly pulled off to the side and switched off my headlights. I decided to get out of my car and walk into the factory grounds, not wanting Andre to know I was there too. I sneaked through the gate and into the complex. I watched as Andre switched off his engine outside the old factory. To my surprise, two other men emerged from the abandoned building. They were large and skin-headed, with a look of cruelty about them. That's when I heard muffled female screaming coming from inside Andre's vehicle, which only got louder as the two men opened the passenger side door and dragged Andre's date out. She was kicking and struggling as they dragged her into a black van waiting nearby. God damn it, human traffickers. I couldn't sit there and do nothing, but what could I do? I was unarmed. The only thing I had to hand was my camera. I lifted up the device and covertly snapped several images of the men and their license plates. The engine of the black van roared and began to make its way towards the gate I was next to. Christ, if the headlights shine on me, I'm toast. I turned and sprinted towards my car down the road on the left, the sound of the van getting louder as it approached me. I made it inside my car. The van pulled out of the complex. Please turn right. Please turn right. Damn it, it turned left. As it came to pass me, the driver turned his head. and There was no doubt he saw me huddled down in my seat. He continued on a little further down the road before I saw the van's brake lights flare. Next thing I knew, Andre's car pulled up right beside me. This was it. This was the end. Andre looked me straight in the eyes, gave me the most sinister smile I've ever seen in my life, and raised up his hand with his fingers in the shape of a gun. He pretended to shoot me, then gave me a wink and drove off behind the black van. I drove off in the opposite direction. I of course passed on all the information and evidence I'd collected to the police. 
They paid it absolutely no attention, and I immediately knew why. They were almost certainly in the pocket of whatever syndicate was behind the trafficking. You see, from what I know about this sort of thing, Andre was likely a recruiter for their organization, hired because of his good looks, charisma, and total lack of conscience. His job was probably to travel around to different towns and cities. His boss would give him money to wine and dine the girls, buy them expensive gifts, etc. He was the stereotype of what women look for in a man, at least on the surface, so it was easy for him to win their hearts. Then, once his prey was head over heels for him, he'd lure them to their doom, just like a human Venus flytrap. He'd lead them to wherever their organization had set up their temporary base of operations. As soon as they got into the car with him, it was already too late for them. They'd be forced into trucks, carted off to some secret location, and then auctioned off to the highest bidder. Their friends and family would likely never see them again. Andre was just one small cog in the machine. Unfortunately, the capturing and selling of other humans is the most profitable crime there is, so even if the police were after Andre, it wouldn't change much. The world keeps on spinning, and for as long as it does, there's going to be evil living on it. I never did find out who the so-called friend was who sent the letter to the Roshchaz and called me with the tip-off. My guess would be one of the local cops who knew something was going on. He knew he couldn't intervene, but felt the need to help out with the case anyway. He was right though. It was already too late for Sophia. Sadly, the corruption just ran too deep. In the end, I never asked Sophia's parents for any money. Ultimately, I decided to tell them that Sophia really did run off with Andre. I wanted to save them from heartbreak, from knowing that their daughter suffered the worst fate imaginable. I still ask myself whether I should have told them or not. Keeps me up some nights. For quite some time now, the US and Cuba have had a... let's call it a tumultuous relationship. Back in 2015, however, the United States government officially reopened their embassy in Havana and sent some of their finest agents and officials to work there. Even though there was still a lot of tension between the two nations, everything appeared to be hunky-dory over at the embassy. That is, until late 2016, when an American CIA operative started hearing a strange buzzing noise in his apartment. The buzzing caused an uncomfortable feeling of pressure in his head. At first he figured it was cicadas or crickets outside his window but that turned out not to be the case. The mysterious, insect-like buzzing wouldn't let up, and the agent began suffering from dizziness and chronic headaches. Things got so bad that he sought medical attention. A report was sent to Washington. Since this was just a one-off case, nobody paid it much attention. No investigation was launched into the matter, and business continued as usual. In February 2017, though, Two more agents reported hearing the same strange buzzing. This time, it caused more serious symptoms. They not only suffered from headaches and dizziness, but also motor issues and tinnitus. Whatever this strange sound was, it only seemed to be affecting US personnel stationed at the Havana Embassy, and it was seriously doing a number on their brains. The symptoms were the same as impatience with damaged inner ears. When confronted by the head of the US Embassy, the Cuban government denied any wrongdoing. The Americans launched an investigation into both the Cubans and the Russians, but didn't find any evidence to link them to the buzzing sound. By March, even more American personnel came forward with similar symptoms. Motor issues, extreme migraines, vertigo and tinnitus. Some of these personnel didn't even report hearing the buzzing sound at all, and they'd just fallen sick out of the blue. They called it Havana Syndrome. As the months went by, more and more Americans stationed in the Cuban capital began to fall prey to it. By September of that same year, 16 CIA agents alone had been affected, along with many other civil servants. A doctor was sent to treat them. He too fell sick. Those affected by Havana Syndrome soon began developing other symptoms. Insomnia, nausea, 
fainting, vision loss, frequent nosebleeds, and most worryingly, signs of brain damage. They were struggling with severe memory loss and became unable to concentrate on anything. These cognitive issues were making it difficult for them to complete even simple tasks and lasted for months after being exposed to the mysterious buzzing sound. Due to the secrecy of the CIA's investigation, we don't know exactly how many staff members were affected by the syndrome, but we do know that at least 40 personnel fell sick. Their brains were examined using advanced imaging techniques. The results of these tests were then compared with the control group. In July of this year, the report was published. The 40 staff members affected by Havana Syndrome had significantly less brain matter than the control group. They also had problems with functional connectivity in their brains. It then came to light that Canadian officials in Havana were being affected too, 14 of them in total. Both the US and Canadian governments were convinced that some sort of radio or electromagnetic weapon was being used to attack their workers, but couldn't pinpoint exactly who was responsible or what sort of device was being used. Both governments withdrew all their non-essential personnel from Havana. The 14 affected Canadians sued their government for $28 million for failing to address the Havana Syndrome problem. Their lawsuit is still ongoing. As of right now, we still don't know who or what was responsible for the buzzing. Some people think that the syndrome was the result of some environmental issue, and that it really was just the constant sound of crickets or cicadas that affected the workers' brains. And that doesn't explain why only US and Canadian government officials were affected though. The whole thing's very suspicious, and theories range from Cuban, Russian or Chinese sabotage, to the whole thing simply being an unidentified virus that spread around the embassies. Since it's such a recent phenomenon, we might actually uncover the truth on this one. If the American and Canadian governments don't keep the whole thing secret, that is. It seems they're doing their utmost to keep their investigations under wraps. Understandable, I suppose. For anyone wondering what this mysterious buzzing sounded like, I'm about to play a short recording taken by one of the US agents. Don't worry, the clip isn't long enough to fry your brain. Probably. If you don't want to hear it, Pause the video now and use the timestamp in the description to skip to the next entry. For the curious amongst you though, here it is. I'm not sure how well known this one is, but it's one that's always tickled my fancy. The Bath Game, sometimes known as Daruma-san, is a game that dates back a long way. The game itself carries with it huge risk, but also the potential for huge reward. According to legend, by conducting a simple ritual, you can summon an entity known as Daruma-san, who will play a game of cat and mouse with you. The reward for winning is that you'll be blessed with amazing fortune. This one's not for the light-hearted amongst you, though as a lot of bad things can happen to you if you decide to play the game, including death. Here are the rules. To play, you'll need a bathroom with a bathtub. Only one person can play this game at a time, but don't worry, you won't really be playing alone. Step 1. Wait until night time, just before bed. Step 2. Fill up your bath with water and turn off all the lights. Step 3. Take off your clothes and get into the bath. Make sure your body is facing the faucet. Step 4. Close your eyes and begin to wash your hair. Step 5. As you wash your hair, repeat the phrase, Daruma-san fell down. Daruma-san fell down. Make sure to keep repeating this the whole time you wash. Under no circumstances should you open your eyes. Step 6. If everything's gone according to plan, your head will be filled with the mental image of a woman standing in the bathtub. In this mental image, she'll slip and fall face first onto the tap, gouging out her right eye. She'll die in the process. Step 7. If, after this mental image, you feel a presence in the water behind you, do not turn around or open your eyes. 
Instead, ask aloud, why did you fall? Step 8. There'll be no answer to your question. Just let it linger in the air for a moment. Then, with your eyes still firmly shut, step out of the bath and dry yourself off. And this can be dangerous, so be careful not to slip as you get out. Step 9. You can now open your eyes. Head to your bedroom. It's time for bed. Do not turn on the bathroom lights. Do not drain the bath water until morning. Do not re-enter the bathroom after you leave, and make sure to close the door behind you. Step 10. Go to sleep. The ritual is now complete. As soon as you wake up in the morning, the game will begin. The ghostly figure of Daruma-san will follow you all day. You can tell who she is by her stained white clothes, her long black hair, and the fact that she's missing her right eye. Her left one is open and bloodshot. Throughout the day, you'll occasionally feel her presence creeping up behind you. When you do, quickly look over your right shoulder. When you turn to look, you probably won't see her. As the day goes on though, she'll get closer and closer. Do not let her touch you. If you sense that she's getting too close, shout, Tomare, meaning stop. Shout this while swinging your arm in a chopping motion. Then, run. You've just stalled her and bought yourself some time. Put as much distance between you and her as possible. Use this Tomare command sparingly though. It'll become less effective with every use, so only say it when you really feel the need to. The game will only end when you manage to catch a glimpse of Daruma over your right shoulder. When you finally do see her, immediately shout, Kita, meaning, I cut you loose. Say this while swinging your arm like before. If you manage to do that before midnight, congratulations, you've won the bath game, and good fortune should be yours, for a time at least. Should you fail to spot her by midnight and cut her loose though, then I'm afraid you've lost the bath game. Daruma will never stop following you. You can run as much as you like, but she'll always be close behind, and eventually you'll need to sleep, giving her the opportunity to catch you, either in person or in your dreams. When she catches you, well, that's the end. Don't try to play this game more than once. On the second playthrough, she'll start at the same distance you caught sight of her last time, and you won't have enough time in the morning to get away. This was back in the 80s. I lived in Australia and was driving from Brisbane to Sydney. I had a Jimi Hendrix bobblehead on the dashboard of my truck. We'd recently had a secret Santa at the new company I was working at, and a co-worker bought it for me as a gift. Why she'd picked that out for me was anyone's guess. I guess I was a newbie, and she didn't really know me that well, so maybe she thought it might be a funny present. I don't know. I wasn't actually a Hendrix fan. I was more into disco music myself, but obviously I didn't tell her that. She was cute though, and on the off chance that she might one day get inside my vehicle, I decided to put the bobblehead on my dashboard. On that drive to Sydney, I noticed a hitchhiker on the side of the road. Well, this was the 80s, when this sort of thing was more acceptable and viewed as less of a big deal, so I decided to help the guy out and give him a ride. He looked normal enough. The guy hops in and thanks me, says that he's heading in the same direction. As we made our way towards Sydney, the guy points out to the Hendrix bobblehead on my dash. Hey man, you're a fan of Jimi Hendrix, huh? He's the greatest guitarist of all time, am I right? The dude starts getting seriously passionate about Jimi Hendrix, and starts going off about him so much that I can't get a word in edgeways. He seemed like such a big fan of Jimi Hendrix, that when he asked me, So you're really into his music too, huh? I just replied with, Yeah, I'm a big fan. Didn't want to ruin the guy's buzz, you know? Wow, that's awesome, man. Which songs? Oh, you know... All of them, man. Couldn't pick one in particular. 
In all honesty, I couldn't actually think of a single song title. The hitchhiker gives me a big smile. Right on, he says. He spent the rest of the journey smiling and looking out of the window, as if he was contemplating something. We start to get close to Sydney. That's when he says that we're near where he needs to be dropped off. He points me down some side road that took us off the beaten track. I pull up where he tells me. The place looks deserted. No buildings around, no people, real nowheresville. Why did he want to be dropped off here of all places? He hopped out of my vehicle. Thanks for the ride, man, he says to me. Yeah, don't mention it. It was good to have some company. Hey, I'm going to be honest with you, he said. He dipped his hand into his waistband and pulled out a pistol. I was going to end you, man. Right here, right now. Just take your money and run, you know. But I can't do that to a Hendrix fan, man. Not to a Hendrix fan. I had no idea if this was some kind of sick joke or what, but his weapon looked real enough to me. I knew I had to say something, but all I could muster was, Oh, uh, thanks for not going through with it, I guess. With that, he strolled off to who knows where. Didn't wait around to see. Just floored it out of there. Not too long after that, the guy's face showed up in a newspaper I was reading. He was facing charges for slaying a middle-aged man that had picked him up while he was hitchhiking. Could have easily been me, had my co-worker not picked me a secret Santa, and not bought me that stupid bobblehead. This isn't my story, but my friend's. His name is Morita, and though he's not the purest of people, I don't think he deserved what happened to him. Still, I won't sugarcoat things, and I'll let you guys judge for yourselves. This all happened five years ago. Morita and I both lived in Osaka, Kansai. We met at university, though at the time of this story, Morita had already been working at an accounting firm for the past two years. He'd done well for himself. I was stuck making okonomiyaki for tourists. Not an awful job per se, but I always thought I'd be working for a big firm like him. I envied him a little. Anyway, Morita had to go away for a week to audit some company in Hiroshima, a good six hour drive away from Osaka. As such, his company paid for him to stay in a hotel there for a week. When he came back, we met up for dinner. Hey man, he told me, I have a crazy story to share with you. Oh yeah? I said, urging him to spill the beans. Yeah, I met a girl down in Hiroshima on my first night. Had myself a little holiday romance, if you know what I mean. Yumi, her name was. He proceeded to show me pictures of this Yumi woman on his phone. She's an accountant too, at the company I was auditing. Dude, I replied, you already have a girlfriend. I know, it's a pretty bad thing to do, but it's okay. My girlfriend will never find out. He could tell from my reaction that I was both surprised and disappointed in his behavior. Man, relax. This was only a one-week fling. I made sure Yumi knew this was nothing serious, and I won't do anything like this again, believe me. In the end, I promised to keep his secret. A few weeks passed, and I'd arranged to meet up with Morita again for dinner in town. I arrived a little early. When Morita finally arrived, I was shocked by his appearance. He looked pale and disheveled. I knew instantly that something was the matter. Hey, everything okay, bud? I asked him. You'll never believe what's happened, he said, looking like he was about to be sick. He was right. After he told me, I genuinely couldn't believe my ears. It turns out that that very day, a new employee had started working at his company. It was the same girl he'd had a fling with in Hiroshima, the Yumi woman. She'd moved all the way to Osaka, transferred her job to his company, and completely uprooted her whole life just so she could be with him. She'd become obsessed, totally obsessed. Yumi, what on earth are you doing here? He asked her. I came to be with you, silly. 
I know you said you weren't looking for anything serious, but I know in your heart you didn't mean that. When you stopped replying to my messages, I knew I had to prove to you how serious I was about this relationship. Relationship? Morita gasped. Yumi, I only saw you for a week. We only had a holiday romance. No big deal, you know? He did his best to try and convince her that he didn't have any true feelings for her, but she didn't seem to get the message. Yumi would follow Morita around the office, constantly talking to him and trying to get close to him. When it was time to go home, Morita would quickly run out of the office and out of her view. He knew he couldn't let her find out where he lived. If she'd followed him all the way to where he worked, she'd most certainly turn up at his apartment. She was, after all, a total yandere. Who knows what she might do? After days of trying to get her to leave him alone, he finally confessed to her. Yumi, I'm sorry, but I already have a girlfriend. Oh, I see. Her eyes became extremely wide and flared with a sort of fiery intensity. The rest of her face remained neutral. I understand. With that, she turned her back to him and scurried away into her cubicle. Didn't speak to him for the rest of the day. Well, his actions up until now had been stone cold, but I guess there wasn't really any other way to deal with the situation. At least he'd come clean. Maybe this crazy girl would finally go back home now. That was for the best, both for Morita and for her. When Morita arrived at work the next morning, Yumi was nowhere to be seen. Excellent. She'd gotten the message. Morita approached his desk and noticed something unusual. There was a chocolate cake next to his computer. Beside it was a post-it note. Keep up the good work, Morita. Signed, Mr. Ishiguro. Ishiguro was the head of the department. Wow, Morita felt pretty good about himself. He had obviously impressed his boss and was seen as a major asset to the company. Strange, though, he thought. There was a single slice missing from the cake. Had his boss forgotten to eat breakfast and taken a slice of the cake? Who knew? Whatever the case, he was ecstatic. After lunch, Morita planned on eating a slice of the cake, but the tempura he had 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 filled him up more than he expected. He decided to save the cake for after dinner instead. Before leaving work that day, he happened to bump into his boss. With a bow, he thanked Mr. Ishiguro for the cake. Cake? What on earth are you talking about, Morita? I've never bought cake for an employee in my life. If I was going to start now, I certainly wouldn't give you the first one. What? But if the cake wasn't from Ishiguro, then... Yeah, you already guessed it, right? Morita guessed it too. Yumi had come into the office earlier than anyone else that morning and planted the cake on Morita's desk. She had left the forged note from his boss. She had cut out a piece of the cake for herself to enjoy at home. Here's the crazy part. The icing in the cake had been poisoned. Morita figured that she had probably tampered with the cake in some way, so he disposed of it quickly after he figured it out, but he didn't suspect that she'd have done something so extreme. He only found out what she had actually done with the cake after she didn't turn up to work for several days. People were sent to her apartment to check on her. They found Yumi, lifeless on her sofa. She had eaten her piece of the cake, and the icing had done its job. She had left a love note for Morita. It was several pages long. It closed with the lines. So, if I can't have you in this life, I'll have you in the next. See you there soon, my love. Forever yours, Yumi. If he had still been hungry after lunch that day, he really would have been hers forever. Our actions have consequences. Sometimes bigger consequences than we can foresee. Obviously, the story got relayed to Morita's girlfriend, and she dumped him then and there. I hope he'll think twice before doing something so rotten and selfish again. For the past 15 years, I've been delivering groceries in Nebraska. 
A lot of our customers have been using us for a long time, though this story has to do with one household in particular. For the sake of privacy, we'll call them the Wilson family. For almost the entire time I've worked this job, the Wilson family have been using our delivery service. Once, or sometimes twice a week, I'll drop by their place to deliver their groceries. The mummer of the house is called Marie. Her husband was called Tex. I ain't sure if that was his real name or not, but that's what he went by, and the guy was a real modern day cowboy. Wore the whole get up, and always addressed me as cowboy. Morning cowboy, he'd say as he saw me coming up his driveway. Catch you later cowboy, he'd say as I bid him farewell. He always said this while bringing two of his fingers to his head, like a real cowboy would if he was lifting his hat or something. I always returned the gesture. We bonded over the years, and would sometimes get lost in conversation with each other. Real nice guy, Tex was. Didn't have the healthiest of diets, though. I could tell by his shopping cart. Seemed like the guy was living off bacon, sausage, and steak. Sadly, the old man's diet caught up with him in the end, and Tex kicked the bucket five years after I started delivering to him. I shed a few tears for the guy the evening I heard the news, and had a drink to his memory. Marie kept on ordering from us after that. For nine or so years, I kept dropping by her place as usual, this time with a smaller haul of groceries than when Tex was still with us. A lot can change over nine years, let me tell you. I got to watch as their two young sons grew up into teenagers, and as their house changed with the times, as Marie sold Tex's beloved motor car, and as her life went on, and she got married to another guy called Phil. Their haul increased after that, as did the number of deliveries I had to make to their house every week. Recently, though, something strange happened when I made one of those deliveries. I came by their house as usual, only to see Tex's old car outside their home, looking just how it had years before, same paint job and everything. Marie must have tracked down the buyer and bought the car back of him. Maybe she was feeling sentimental and wanted to hold on to that piece of Tex after spending so many years without him. Who knows? I knocked on the door, and Marie answered. Strange, I thought. Her face seemed distinctly less wrinkled than I remembered. Mrs. Wilson, I said, you're positively glowing. She blushed a little and thanked me, then invited me inside to drop the groceries in the kitchen. Got old Tex's car back, I see, I said to her. She let out a little laugh. Did he tell you he sold it then? That ugly thing will be with us until he kicks the bucket. I was a tad confused by her reply, but brushed it off and put it down to the old woman's brain going a little gaga with years. Something else seemed a little weird though. The decor of the house. It was like it had been years ago. Old photos were strung up on the wall of the kids when they were much younger. All of the furniture was like the stuff they used to have in the past. My mind started darting around. Had she dumped Phil? Gone a little doolally or something? Was she trying to relive the old days when she was with Tex? I daren't ask. Didn't want to cause any drama. I walked into the kitchen to put down the groceries. Sitting at the table, eating their breakfast, were Marie's two sons. But that's the thing. They weren't teenagers. They were just kids again. Like how they looked in all the old photos on the wall. Impossible, I thought. They must just be her nephews or something. She was just babysitting some relative's kids. But they looked so identical. They could have been clones of her children from the past. I put down the groceries and immediately made my way to the front door, not stopping to chat with Marie. Something felt off about the house. I didn't like it. I needed some air. Leaving so quickly? She said as I speed walked to the front door. Yes, I managed to spurt out. Sorry, I'm in a rush today. Have a good one, Mrs. Wilson. I reached the front door, which was still open, but something made me stop. I can't describe the feeling, but I knew I had to turn and look over my right shoulder, past it into the living room behind me. I trusted my instinct and turned my head. Sat there in an old, familiar armchair was an old, familiar man. Catch you next time, cowboy he said to me, raising two fingers to his head. A strange feeling came over me. Not fear. 
warmth. I'd recognize that face anywhere. I gave Dex a smile and raised my two fingers out of respect. I then walked out the front door and closed it behind me. I looked out onto their driveway. Texas' old car was nowhere to be seen. Nothing seemed out of place or old-fashioned. Everything was as it should be. Back to normal. Back like it was in my time. I continued on with the rest of my deliveries for the day. I've made many deliveries to Marie since then, and nothing else weird has ever happened to me at that house. I decided not to tell her about the incident, fearing that she'd think I was making fun of her or insulting Tex's memory in some way. I've told my wife and friends about it. They all called me crazy. So, I'm sharing my story here. Does anyone have any ideas about what this could have been? I've been racking my head for months now, and still can't think of a rational explanation. Did I experience a time warp? A brain spasm? Some sort of glitch in the Matrix? I have no idea, but I was completely lucid. Didn't have anything weird in my system, and saw and heard everything plain as day. I don't know what to make of all of this, but I will say, Tex, it was good to see you again, cowboy. It was summer in small town New Mexico. I was about 15 years old at the time, and since school was out, I was doing a few odd jobs around town to earn some money. Mowing lawns, walking dogs, anything that could make me a few bucks, you know. There was this one guy who lived in my town, an older gentleman in his early 70s, Mr. Lesnar. He used to be a teacher at my school, but I hadn't seen him for at least a year. He was bald, with a big white beard. Put a red suit on the guy and he could have passed as a mall Santa. I always remembered him as being a nice, friendly guy, so when I bumped into him in town, I asked if there was anything he needed help with. He said there was. He needed help reorganizing a few parts of his house, said that he'd pay me 50 bucks if I helped him. When you're 15 years old, having $50 in your pocket feels like being a millionaire. I took him up on it. The next day rolled around, and I went over to Mr. Lesnar's house and knocked on the door. He answered with a smile on his face and invited me inside. First thing that struck me was the stench. His house had that old person smell about it. I didn't know much about the guy to be honest. I mean, yeah, he used to teach at my school, but all I really remembered about him was how he always wore socks with sandals, and how he always spent every school vacation down in Mexico. I started off by cleaning up in the kitchen. Once I'd finished, Mr. Lesnar told me that he wanted help boxing up some things in the basement. Said he had too much junk down there, and that he wanted to reorganize and get rid of a load of it. Told me to start boxing things up, and to come and tell him when I'd finished. There must have been a set of twelve stairs that led down into this strangely large, stale-smelling basement. Mr. Lesnar flicked the light switch. Alone dusty light bulb illuminated the basement. I grabbed a few folded up cardboard boxes and made my way down. So, there I was, just boxing all sorts of things up in this grungy basement. Must have spent about 45 minutes down there by myself. While I was working, I happened to lean against a particular spot on the wall. When I leant on it, I came across something odd. A loose panel in the basement wall. Not a broken part of the wall, mind you. I mean, this panel was intentionally loose. Well, curiosity got the better of me, and I started fumbling with it. It came right off. Behind the panel was a small compartment. Hidden inside that compartment was a box. It felt like finding a hidden treasure chest. I checked to see if Mr. Lesnar was standing behind me at the top of the stairs. The coast was clear. I knew I probably shouldn't, but I pulled out the box. I lifted off the top, curious to see what the old man was hiding inside. At first, it didn't look like there was much in it. A journal, a few knickknacks, and a small pile of photographs, maybe ten or twelve in total. I took out the photos. 
My heart immediately sank after looking at the top one. At first, I could hardly believe the image. It showed Mr. Lesnar with a pistol in his hand, kneeling down next to a dead woman lying in the dirt. Her lifeless eyes were staring into the camera lens. She was clearly Mexican and had obviously been shot. The second photo was almost identical, only this time it was a male who stared lifelessly at the camera. No, no, this can't be real, I thought. I flicked through all the pictures, every damn one, each one telling the same story. They all showed Lesnar, knelt down next to some bloody, human game, sprawled out on the ground in front of him. All of the victims varied wildly in age. There was writing on the backs of all the photos, but it was all in Spanish, and I couldn't make it out. Still, I knew instantly what this was. A box full of sick mementos from Lesnar's trips to Mexico, hidden away from the world in a small wall compartment. In some photos, Lesnar looked younger. In others, he appeared to be in his mid-sixties. In all of them, he was kneeling down next to his victims, with the same disturbing grin on his face, posing like a hunter with his trophies. I was overcome by this weird mixture of shock, disgust, anger, and most of all, fear. Fear that I was in the basement of the monster in these photos. Without thinking, I shoved the images back inside the box and slid the container back into the wall. I desperately fumbled with the wall panel, trying to put it back in the exact same way it was, not wanting the old man to realize that I'd discovered his horrible secret. I just about got the damn thing back in place when I heard a creaking at the top of the basement stairs behind me. I turned to see old man Lesnar standing by the basement door, looking down at me. I have never felt more like a rat in a cage. Looks like you're doing a good job, he said. My heart skipped a beat. I just mumbled something and tried to act like nothing was wrong. Oh, don't mind me. I'm just going upstairs for a nap. You keep on going down there. With that, he slowly turned and walked off through the hallway. There was maybe twenty seconds of silence before I heard his footsteps making their way up the stairs to his bedroom. My mind was racing. Had he seen me fiddling with the panel? Did he know that I'd found his photos? Oh god, was I in danger? I was only a scrawny kid. I decided not to stay down there wondering. I waited for a few moments before bolting up the basement staircase. I dashed towards the front door, grabbed the handle and twisted. No good. The damn thing had been locked from the inside. I figured the old man had just locked it before he went upstairs. I scanned the door to see if there was a way to quickly open it. No time. I could hear movements above me. The old man was walking back out of his bedroom and towards the stairs. I sprinted through the hallway and into the kitchen. I knew from the cleaning earlier there was a back door there. I grabbed the handle and prayed. With a twist, it flung open. It felt like winning the lottery. I flew out of that house, ran around the property and back onto the main street. I looked back only once. When I did, I saw the old man's face in one of the downstairs windows. He looked to be holding something. I was too far away to make out what it was exactly, but I bet you can guess what I thought it was. From there, I kept on running until I got home. Thankful that the old man lived in a cul-de-sac and not in the middle of nowhere. If he did, I'm certain he'd have taken a shot at me. It goes without saying that I told my parents what I'd found. We notified the authorities about it, and I told them about the secret panel and the sick mementos in the box. When they checked the place out, they did indeed find the secret compartment. Predictably, it was totally empty. There was no box hidden inside. No evidence of any wrongdoing whatsoever. They figured I was just messing with the old guy or something, and decided not to look into him any further. I don't know what Lesnar did with the pictures, whether he destroyed them or hid them elsewhere, but he got away with it all regardless. Old man Lesnar lived another eight years after that. In that time, I graduated high school, went off to college, and moved out of town. My parents always lived in that same place, however. For all the time I lived there after that incident, and whenever I'd go back to visit my parents, 
I'd always be looking over my shoulder. I knew that Mr. Lesnar wanted to take his secret to the grave, and I always worried that he'd try and silence me to do so. It's hard to believe there are people like this, who, to the outside world, are leading seemingly ordinary lives. I'm glad I didn't become his last trophy. Lenny Derrickson was your typical 39-year-old family man living in Oklahoma. One Saturday morning in 1998, he was eating breakfast with his son. Suddenly, an unknown man pulled up outside their farm in a white pickup truck. Lenny went out to greet the man. His son, Jared, remained inside and watched as his father chatted with the stranger. According to Jared, the unknown man was about 40 years old, stood over six feet tall, was white with a full red beard, and was wearing a t-shirt with the slogan, No Fear, printed on it. He couldn't hear what the two of them were talking about, but their conversation appeared to be friendly, and it didn't set off any alarm bells. When Lenny came back into the house, he told his son that the man wanted to buy one of his family's stud horses that he'd advertised in the paper. Lenny told his son that he was going to go and show the man the horse, which he kept on a separate property, and that Jared should stay behind and feed the cows said that he'd be back in the afternoon. Well, afternoon rolled around, and Lenny still hadn't returned home. He never would. Lenny was reported missing the next day. Investigators found that Lenny had left an uncashed paycheck at home. They also learned that Lenny had never placed an ad for his horse in the paper after all. He had lied to his son. But why? They searched the property where Lenny kept his stud horses, he had never arrived there on the day he went missing. There was no evidence of foul play, no body, nothing else to go on. So, what happened to Lenny? Well, there are two possibilities. Either the mysterious stranger was responsible for his disappearance in some way, or he ran off on his own accord. His family are adamant that Lenny would have never abandoned them. Lenny was extremely close with his son, Jared, and they spent almost all of their time together. There's no way that he just tapped and left him behind. With that being said, Lenny was struggling financially at the time he vanished. It's possible he decided to start a new life somewhere else. If he did, what did the mysterious stranger have to do with it all? There have been two reported sightings of Lenny since he disappeared. At 9am on the morning he went missing, a waitress at a local coffee shop saw Lenny talking with an unknown man. According to her, Lenny sat there drinking coffee while he just listened to the man talk. All efforts to track down this unknown man have failed. The second supposed sighting happened six months later in a bar in Amarillo, Texas. An anonymous caller phoned the cops and told them that Lenny was at the bar with him. By the time the authorities arrived to investigate, both Lenny and the unknown caller were gone. So, did Lenny run away to start a new life elsewhere? Had he been living a double life the entire time? Did he get involved with some sort of criminal network as a way to dig himself out of his financial debt? Did he disappear to protect his family? Does he want to be found or not? Did something more sinister happen to him after all? All questions that remain unanswered. The speed painting visuals used in this episode were created by Victoria Skeller. Links to her YouTube channel and Instagram can be found in the description. I'm from Asheville, North Carolina, born and raised, and I have my own story to share here. One that's equal parts bizarre and disturbing. Around four years ago, I was walking through one of the local parks early in the morning, well before anyone else was up and awake. I had just broken up with my long-term girlfriend and was having difficulty sleeping. As I strolled through the empty park, I heard something that caught my attention. A soft whimpering. Sheltered under a tree on my left was a dog. A black Labrador to be precise. The poor thing must have gotten lost, I thought. I leant down to pet the little guy, 
and his tail immediately started wagging like crazy. He licked my hand and made it clear that, like me, he was in need of a friend. No collar, nor anything else to suggest he had an owner. What was he doing out here all by himself? Had somebody kicked him out? Was he a stray? I stood up and walked a few steps to look around for his owner, but the dog wouldn't leave me alone. He was like my shadow. Wherever I walked, he followed. Together, we walked the length and breadth of that park. Occasionally, I called out, Hello? Hello? I have your dog here. But there was nobody around at all. No one was looking for the poor fella. I looked down at him and stared into his big brown eyes. A pair that said, Please, take me with you. It seemed like the universe had thrown the two of us together. This dog was the answer to my newfound loneliness, and I was the answer to his. I took him home with me. For a long time, I did my best to track down his owner. I reported the dog as missing and put up flyers around town, but nobody ever got in contact with me. It looked like I'd found myself a new canine housemaid. I named him Scooby. Creative, I know. Every morning, I'd take Scooby for a long walk. The first week I had him, we walked the exact same route around town. Thing is, every time we came to pass this one particular house, Scooby would stop and start crying. I'd try and pull him away, try to get him to keep going, but he'd just stare at the house and whine like crazy. Each time we came to pass that house, it'd take me a good ten minutes to get him to continue on with me tugging on his leash the entire time. After the sixth or seventh time we passed that house, it became clear to me that he was going to do this every time. So, in the end, I just decided to switch up our walking route. I had no idea what got into him, or why that house seemed to bother him so much. It wasn't like he was crying to go inside. He never tugged on his leash to get closer. It was more like he was afraid of something in there, but couldn't bring himself to leave like a human who can't look away from a deadly accident. He had some sort of strange, doggy fascination with the place. Anyway, for the next six months I owned Scooby, I took him on several different walking routes, making sure that we never passed that damn house that freaked him out so much. One day though, I had an early morning errand to run, which took me past that house. I decided to take Scooby along with me, get his daily walk out of the way, completely forgetting about how he acted six months earlier. Well, Scooby hadn't forgotten about that house. Not by a long shot. As we came to pass it, he once again froze in place and refused to move. He whimpered loudly, refusing to take his eyes off the place. Come on, Scoob, there's a good boy, I said to him, trying to calm him down and coax him along a bit. It didn't work. He seemed more unsettled by that house than he ever had been before. Hey, what's gotten into you, boy? I asked him rhetorically. He must have stayed like that for a good 15 minutes this time, and just staring and crying, refusing to budge. Then, without warning, he bolted towards the house, pulling his leash right out of my hands. Scooby! I shouted. Get back here! It was no use. Whatever fear had consumed him before, he had conquered it. He rushed to that house, ran around the corner and into the backyard. God damn it, Scooby, I thought. The owners must have a cat or something. That's why he always acts crazy around here. I chased Scooby into the house's backyard, completely embarrassed, praying that I could get him out of there before the owners woke up and started cussing me out. I got back there and found Scooby frantically digging a hole in the grass. I'd never seen him acting like this before. He never dug holes in my backyard. I tried to pull him away, but he just shook me off and kept digging, his little paws throwing up earth left, right, and center. I was furious with him. But, you see, Scooby knew something I didn't. Knew a secret that nobody else knew. He knew what was buried in that yard. His former owner. Scooby's digging unearthed the largely decomposed corpse of a 32-year-old man, shallowly buried in the garden of your average suburban house in North Carolina. 
the man had been down there for as long as I'd had Scooby. The authorities were alerted, and an investigation began. Turns out, the house was a rental. The dead man had been living there with his girlfriend and their dog. All their neighbors and their friends in the area knew them as Jim and Charlotte. These turned out to be fake identities. Everything people thought they knew about their lives and their pasts were a lie. The inside of their house remained untouched. Nothing appeared to have been taken. As of right now, the police still haven't been able to track down the so-called Charlotte. She remains the prime suspect for his killing, though nobody's really sure if she was behind it all and went on the run, or if she herself was a victim too, buried somewhere else by somebody else. If she was responsible, then she left in a damn hurry, as pretty much all her personal possessions were still inside the house. Her wallet, her fake ID, everything but her cell phone. Whatever the case, no one has ever come forward to reveal either Jim or Charlotte's real identities. No friends, no family, no one. As such, Jim was reburied here in Asheville and given an unnamed headstone. The strangest part in my eyes is that the house's rent was still being paid when the body was found, despite the fact it had been empty for six months. The landlord had always been paid in cash, which arrived in an envelope through the mail. It was always addressed from Jim, even after his demise. So, the question is, who was still paying the rent? Charlotte, the girlfriend? Someone else who didn't want the new tenants to be digging around in the garden? That all remains unclear. I'm sure there are details the cops haven't revealed to the public, but still, it's a little weird. Scooby is still around to this day. He still cries whenever we go past that house, but he doesn't stop and stare anymore. In his own way, I like to think he found a little closure. I don't know how his last owner treated him or what he was like, but Scooby didn't want to leave him down there in the ground. He's a good boy. I'll update you all if they ever find the woman. At the time of this story, I was a 23-year-old woman living in Charleston, South Carolina. I know the way I phrase that makes it sound like I'm not a woman anymore. I am. But anyway, this is my story. I worked as a paralegal at one of the small law firms in town, and five days a week during my lunch hour, I'd head off to the same Starbucks near my workplace to grab a coffee. My job was actually pretty repetitive, and so was my lunchtime routine. Most people's are, I suppose. That's why I'd always see the same faces in the coffee shop, day in and day out. It was like a little microcosm. The same baristas were always there too, there was this one guy who worked there every weekday. According to his tag, his name was Randall. He was about six foot tall, average build, had very short ginger hair, a crew cut I guess you'd call it. No Prince Charming, but not entirely unattractive either. Just a guy who kind of blended in. You know how at Starbucks they ask for your name to write on the cups? Well, the first few times Randall took my order, he asked me for mine. Stephanie, I'd say. He saw me so frequently that I guess he just committed my name to memory after that. Every day I'd approach the counter, and every day Randall would take my order. No name required. He'd just jot it down on the cup without asking. After a couple of weeks of this, however, Randall started flirting with me, I suppose. Not verbally, but through his writing on the cup. He started drawing little hearts over the eye in my name, and sometimes even drew some after my name as well. Bear in mind, I'd never actually spoken to this guy. Well, other than giving him my order. No friendly chit-chat or anything. I mean, I was flattered and all, but I wasn't interested. The strange part is every time I went in there, he'd never tried to talk to me more than just taking my order, and never addressed the fact that he was adding these flirty touches to his writing. In fact, he never showed any kind of emotion on his face whatsoever. No smiles, no eyebrow movement, kind of a robotic guy. You'd have thought this was his build-up to asking me out or something, but nope, 
He just acted professional at the counter, and never said anything apart from, what would you like, and that'll be X dollars fifty. Despite that, he kept on adding the little hearts every time he wrote my name down, and over time, he even started adding little kisses after my name. It made things a little uncomfortable for me, but maybe he was just a little odd in the head, and did this to regular customers too. I just accepted it and ignored it. That is, until the day he added his phone number to the cup, along with a little winky face drawn next to it, with a speech bubble saying, Call me. I immediately went back to Randall at the counter, and quietly and politely turned him down, letting him know that I was flattered, but that now wasn't really a good time for me. Just a little white lie. Like always, his face remained neutral. No emotional response at all. He simply said, Okay and averted his eyes. It was very awkward. I usually take my coffee to go, but that particular day, I really speed walked out of there. From then on, I considered going somewhere else for my coffee, but to be honest, I really liked what I got from Starbucks, and the only other one nearby was an extra 10 minute walk away. I figured we were both adults, and the situation didn't need to be awkward, so I kept going back there. Randall remained stony faced as always. Luckily, the love hearts on the coffee cup stopped after that, and things went back to being normal. Time passed, and one weekend, I agreed to go on a lunch date with another guy I met. We both had super busy schedules, but worked near each other, and had the same time slots for lunch, so it made sense for us to have a mini one-hour coffee and conversation. We agreed that the Starbucks would be a nice, casual spot. I forgot to consider the whole Randall situation entirely. I got there, and the guy I'm meeting's already found a table. I go over and give him a hug. He asks me what I'd like to drink, and, like a gentleman, goes up to the counter to order. I sit, waiting at the table. When he comes back with the coffees, my date says to me, Damn, the guy who took my order has a real attitude problem. I turn to see who he's talking about. Standing by the register, glaring at the both of us, was Randall. He had a look of intense anger on his face, like a person who's just been betrayed. This was the only time I'd ever seen any kind of emotion from the guy at all. Yeah, he didn't even ask me what I wanted, just stared at me angrily and snatched the money right out of my hand. Some people, huh? Annoyingly, we couldn't take our coffees to go, as they came in mugs and not takeout cups. We just sat there, trying to have a normal date. All the while, Randall continued to glare at us from the counter only looking away briefly when someone came up to order. After the most awkward date of my life thanks to Randall, the two of us got up, said that we'd be in contact, and went back to our respective workplaces. I'd like to say that Randall was just an awkward and harmless guy. I'd like to say that this is where the story ends. But, on both counts, I'd be lying. That same night, I was sat alone in my apartment, watching TV, thinking about work, my awkward date, the bills I had to pay, and life in general. All of a sudden, there's a frantic knocking on my front door. I got up and peered through the peephole. On the other side was Randall. Is he in there with you? What the hell? What was he doing here? Better question, how did he know where I lived? I know you're in there. I know he's there too. Well, answer me. I was terrified and confused. Randall, what on earth are you talking about? Go away! The door handle rattled as he tested it from the other side. Luckily, I'd locked the thing when I got home. Then, slam, he threw the full weight of his body against my door. The damn psycho was trying to break in. Another slam, and then another. My door bounced with every thud against it. From there, Autopilot took over me. I grabbed a knife from my kitchen area and ran into the bathroom at the other end of my apartment. I locked myself in there and called the cops. From all the noise he was making, I'm sure a few of my neighbors did too. None of them came out to stop him though, and I can't say I blame them. Randall was slamming on my front door for a good ten minutes before it gave way. Luckily it was quite sturdy and he was no superstar athlete. I could hear him in my apartment though, and I tried to muffle my fear as I hid in my locked bathroom. 
Thankfully, the police arrived shortly after he broke in. I could hear them telling him to freeze. But when my heart really sank, when it really hit the floor, was when I heard one of the officers shout something I didn't expect to hear. Drop the weapon. As it turns out, Randall had come with a gun in his hand. Before coming to my place, he'd broken into another house in a different part of Charleston. Namely, the house of my date from earlier. He'd smashed a window, crawled inside, and trashed the place. Didn't take anything, but he didn't go there to steal. Luckily, my date wasn't home that night. He was out with his buddies. Randall then came to my place, thinking that was where my date was. He figured we were an item. Turns out Randall had been stalking me for months, always keeping his distance, watching from the shadows. He'd become obsessed. Because I lived such a routine existence and I was so predictable, it was easy for him to track me. He followed me on his time off, and, by his own admission, would stand outside my apartment complex at night, looking up at my window, thinking about coming up to surprise me. Before that night, he decided that would be too creepy. At least he had some sense, I guess. Randall got time. Five years for his threatening behavior. Not long enough in my book, but at least I won't be seeing him at Starbucks anymore. I also got a restraining order for when he gets out, and switched firms and apartments to keep him from finding me. Still, what if my date had been home that night? What if the police didn't arrive as quickly as they did? I'm not sure I want to know the answers to those questions. He never actually hurt anyone, and the prosecutors couldn't prove that he had evil intent, so I can kind of understand why the judge gave him such a short sentence. But I know in my heart that he came to kill. Now all I want is to never see Randall again. It was the 18th of June, 1982. The setting was the Imperial Gas Station in Harrisonburg. On the graveyard shift that night was 20-year-old Kelly Berg Dove, a loving mother, daughter, wife and friend by all accounts. Kelly was very family-oriented, and since her family was a little strapped for cash, she took the job at the gas station to help pay the bills. Her three sisters also worked at the same gas station, and on that fateful night, she agreed to trade shifts with one of them. Little did she realize in doing so, she had just sealed her own fate. At around 11pm, Kelly's mother called her daughter to check everything was going okay. At that point, everything was peachy. That would all change in the next few hours. The whole incident played out in two-minute segments. At 2.27am, Kelly made a call to the Harrisonburg Police Department. She said that she was being harassed by a customer, a man who she described as improperly dressed. What she meant by that remains unclear. Two minutes passed, and at 2.29, Kelly made another call to the police, this time asking for an officer to come to the gas station. She said that the man was now somewhere outside the station, and that he was calling her and making obscene remarks. At 2.31, Kelly made her third and final call to the cops, this time pleading that they send somebody. She said that the man was now outside the gas station, lurking in a silver or grey vehicle. Finally, at 2.33, the authorities arrived. Despite arriving a mere two minutes after Kelly's third and final call, they were still too late. Kelly was gone. There was no sign of a struggle, and nothing had been taken. Kelly's purse and a magazine that she was reading were still on the counter. It was like she had disappeared into thin air. Unfortunately, the police did a terrible job at securing the crime scene. They failed to dust for fingerprints, or even search for any possible evidence. The store wasn't even close to the public. Theories about what happened to Kelly abound. One thing to note is that Harrisonburg is located along the I-81, a route infamous for human trafficking due to it being a more rural alternative to the heavily monitored I-95. As such, this could have been a crime of opportunity. Some lowlife may have spotted the vulnerable Kelly all by herself and decided to strike. Kelly has since been declared dead by her family, 
despite nobody being found and her case remaining unsolved. Nobody knows exactly what happened to her that night, nor do they know the location of her final resting place. The only thing that is certain is that the police really messed up on this one, and as a result, her abductor will likely never be known or brought to justice. This is an allegedly true story that happened to my friend in Japan. He told me this story a long time ago, and the exact location escapes my mind, but he relayed this story to me with so much conviction that I can't help but believe he was telling me the truth. What I do know is this incident definitely resulted in two deaths, and he himself had to be questioned by police over and over. It all happened when my friend and six of his co-workers at his part-time job were driving in the Chugoku region, the westernmost region of Japan's main island, Honshu. They were driving out to see a suspension bridge. The seven of them were split up into two cars. My friend was the driver of the second car and had four passengers with him. In the first car, which was driving ahead of them, were the manager and a couple. Although they set off in the morning, Due to the many stops they had to make along the way, the sun was already setting by the time they made it to the bridge. The suspension bridge ran across a very deep valley in the middle of a mountain. As they approached it, the sky began to drizzle, and fog began swirling around them. There was an open space just in front of the bridge. If the weather had been good, they would have just parked their cars there and crossed the bridge by foot. Then they would have come back. The other side of the bridge was a dead end, and the structure had simply been left there for sightseeing purposes. The moment the first car reached the open space, however, it came to an abrupt stop. Seeing this, my friend hit the brakes, and the second car came to a screeching halt about ten meters behind the first. What are they doing? my friend asked his co-workers in the second car. They had no clue as to why the manager had stopped. For some time, those in the second car just sat there, looking on. A few minutes passed, and the first car made no attempt to move, so my friend reached for his door handle. He was going to hop out and see what was going on. Right at the same time, the couple who were in the back seat of the first car suddenly jumped out in unison. Something wasn't right about their expressions. Alarmed, my friend too got out of his car and tried to walk over to them and ask what had happened. But the couple, with their hands joined, started sprinting, and in a flash, they climbed over the guardrail at the edge of the open space and threw themselves over the other side, down into the valley. The four of them in the second car were completely astounded. They all rushed to the guardrail and looked down into the valley below, but because of all the fog, they couldn't see anything at the bottom. None of them could believe what had just happened, and they all stood there in a daze. Soon, they remembered that the manager was still in the car, and they rushed to check on him. The manager was still sat in the driver's seat, his hands grasping the steering wheel so tightly that his knuckles were white. Under his breath, he kept muttering the same phrase over and over. Mustn't go. Mustn't go. Mustn't go. He wouldn't respond to them. There was nothing else they could do but call the police. The authorities soon arrived on the scene, and the delirious manager was taken away in an ambulance. As you can imagine, the couple who jumped over the side of the mountain were later found dead at the bottom. The rest of the group had to endure a seemingly endless interrogation by the police. In the end, with no evidence of foul play and nothing to go on, the police concluded that the pair had simply decided to end their lives together. My friend later paid a visit to the manager at the hospital. Fortunately, he seemed to be back to normal. He asked him what happened that day at the suspension bridge. Why did he stop the car so suddenly? The manager told him that as they drew near the bridge, a girl dressed in an old-fashioned kimono appeared out of the fog in front of their vehicle. The startled manager immediately hit the brakes. The girl wore her hair short, and was dressed like somebody from a historical drama, or maybe even someone from the Meiji period. 
Of course, this creeped him out, and he wondered if maybe she needed help. But before he could react, he noticed that his car was now surrounded by a whole group of children, all dressed in a similar fashion to the girl. Being a superstitious man, the manager sensed that he was in danger, and quickly began chanting a mantra. According to him, the children who surrounded the car all joined their hands together and started singing, Kagome, Kagome, the bird in the cage. At the same time, the manager heard the children's voices in his head, saying, Come with us, come with us. The manager gripped the steering wheel and began chanting, Mustn't go, mustn't go. Next thing he knew, the couple in the back seat behind him flew out of the car, joined their hands with the children, and together they all started running towards the guardrails. Of course, the police didn't believe my story, the manager told my friend. Hell, I'm not even sure I believe it myself. You don't have to believe my manager's experience, my friend told me. But one thing's for certain, that was indeed how that couple died, and I for one do believe him. An interesting thing to point out is about the song, Kagome, that the children were allegedly singing. Kagome is a children's game in which a group of children hold hands and walk in a circle around another child in the center. While doing so, they chant the Kagome song. Everyone in Japan knows it. When the song stops, the child in the middle tries to name the person standing directly behind them. The song itself has been a subject of much interest due to its mysterious lyrics and ominous tune, and several disturbing theories exist about it. One theory states that in olden times, it wasn't uncommon for poor families to sell their children in order to survive. According to the theory, they would use the Kagome game as a type of ritual to decide which child should be sold. At the end, when the players finish singing the line, Who stands behind you now? Whichever child stood behind the person at the center would be the one to go. Since this was considered the will of the gods, nobody could dispute the decision. Recently, something crazy happened here in Anchorage, Alaska. A USB was found lying in the street by some woman. No idea how it got there, but it probably fell out of someone's pocket. Didn't look to be placed there intentionally. The USB was labelled Homicide at Midtown Marriott. The label wasn't kidding. The USB contained numerous images and videos of a woman's murder. According to the authorities, most of the 39 images showed the lady being beaten and strangled in a hotel room somewhere, then lying face down in a pickup truck. One of the 12 videos on the device showed her being strangled. Using this information, the authorities were able to link the remains of a woman found by the side of the road to the woman in the photos and videos. Though they're very confident that they're the same person, her identity still remains unknown. No one's come forward to ID her. What they were able to find out for sure, though, was the identity of the guy who took her life. The guy who did all this appeared in several of the pictures he took. I guess he was confident he wouldn't be caught out. Not a smart play when you're clumsy with your USB. They were able to link the man in the picture to a guy involved in another investigation. South African Brian Stephen Smith. He was quickly taken into custody. Like I said... This all happened very recently, so we'll see how things pan out from here. I grew up in England, in a small southern town. Lived there my entire life. It's a sleepy place, far from the bustle of London or any other big cities. When I turned 18, however... Something bizarre started happening there, and seemingly only happened to me. I started seeing a new face around town, a man who looked to be in his early forties. His skin was pasty and grey-looking, 
big, dark bags hung under his eyes. Even from a distance, I could see that those eyes had a sickly, yellow tinge to them. Honestly, it looked like the guy hadn't slept in years. You know how some people just have that unsettling vibe about them? Well, this guy certainly had it in spades. Now, when I say I started seeing him around town, I mean I encountered him everywhere, all the time, at least once every day or two. Sometimes I'd get on a bus, and he'd be there, sat at the back. Sometimes I'd be in a store, only to look out the window and see him looking in at me. No matter where I saw him, he'd always be staring at me with those wide, sickly, tired eyes. He never came up to me or said anything. He'd just stay at a distance, examining me, I guess. After staring at me for a few seconds or so, he'd always just walk off along the street. I ignored him as best as I could at the start, assuming he was just some new loony who'd moved to my town. We have more than our fair share of weirdos here, believe me. Over time, his presence became more persistent. I'd start seeing the guy twice a day, and he'd stand there, gazing at me for longer and longer periods of time. Eventually, I'd had enough, and decided I was going to tell him to leave me alone. Whenever I'd go to approach him, though, he'd just quickly walk away, usually keeping his eyes on me as he did. Sometimes he'd even walk backwards away from me, keeping his eyes on me the entire time as he disappeared into the crowd. Even on the rare occasions that I'd run after him, I'd always lose him. He'd turned down a side street or an alleyway, and when I went to follow him in, he would already have vanished out of view. It freaked me out that nobody else ever seemed to react to this creepy man in my town. I mean, aside from the tired appearance, he looked ordinary enough, but you'd have thought that a guy staring wide-eyed at a much younger person would have drawn some attention. It never did. It was like he was invisible to everyone except me. I asked my family if they'd ever seen a pale, weird man around town. They never had. After a while, I tried my best to ignore the guy. He was just some harmless old man with a social disability. That's why he always stares at me ominously, I thought. I never saw him around town staring at anyone else, though. I only ever saw the guy when he was staring at me. As the months went by, I started seeing the man less and less. The sightings went from nine or ten times a week, down to only five or six times. Then only every other week, every other month. Eventually I stopped seeing him altogether. I figured he'd gotten bored of his little game or whatever he was up to. After not seeing him for a while, I forgot all about him. A few years passed. I was in my early twenties, and I hadn't encountered the man for a long, long time. Well, one night, after I'd been out drinking with my friends at a local pub, I found myself walking home alone. It was sometime around midnight, maybe a little before, maybe a little after. When, out of the blue, the heavens opened, and it started to rain extremely heavily. I rushed to a nearby bus shelter, seeking cover from the rainfall. This was a secluded part of my small town, right on the very edge, so everything was silent, apart from the pounding of raindrops on the ground, and the quiet buzz of the electric orange streetlights that lit my path back home. I sat there in the bus stop, waiting for the rain to ease up, when... From down the path that led to my house, I heard a single set of footsteps thumping against the pavement, kicking up water that had pooled on the ground. Whoever was approaching me was humming a quiet, slow-paced song to themselves. I didn't recognize the tune. Just another person on their way home from a night out, I thought. Probably drunk. Wayne, there aren't any pubs or bars in that direction. The soaked figure stepped under the orange light near my bus shelter, and I could finally make out his face. It was the man I had seen years before, the same dark bags hanging under his eyes. He moved under the same shelter as me, stopped right in front of me, and turned to face me. I was overcome by a strange sense of calm that I've never felt before, as I heard him speak for the first time. I'm sorry about before. I made a mistake. The timing wasn't right. I sat there, listening intently. 
It's never happened before, so I thought about taking you out of term for my ego's sake. But that wouldn't have been right. So, I just wanted to tell you. I'll be waiting. What will you be waiting for? I asked. Next time, we'll meet under different circumstances. You'll be older. I'll be younger. I'm not sure if you'll recognize me. I stared at him with a blank expression, not sure how to interpret his words. He just smirked at me. It's okay. You won't see me coming anyway. With that, his face softened for the first time. He dug his hands deep into his pockets, stepped out from under the shelter, back into the pouring rain, and continued on down the street in the opposite direction he approached me from. He kept walking until he was out of sight. The rain stopped two minutes later. The strangeness of the encounter finally struck me. I don't know why it hadn't before. I rushed home and double-locked all my doors. Since that night, I've yet to see the man around my town again. I still live there, though I've been planning on moving for a while now. The place just has this weird aura about it ever since that night. I have no idea if this guy was just some lunatic who likes to play sick games on people, or if he's something even more sinister. To this day, I'm still waiting for him. Recently, a buddy of mine was clearing out some old house that had been abandoned for years. While inside the attic, he came across a USB which really stood out to him. Everything else in the house was old and decrepit, but the USB was obviously modern, not from the same time as all the other stuff in there, like somebody other than the previous homeowners had come in and left it there. Hammerman, or one word, was written on it. Nothing else seemed out of place or unordinary. For whatever reason, he decided to pocket the thing and take it home with him. After he looked at what was on the flash drive, he called me up and invited me around to his place. Said he had something I had to see. Now, together, we sat looking at his computer screen as he opened up the USB drive. There was just one large file stored on it. A video. I need your opinion about what to do, man. I can hardly believe what's on this thing, my friend said to me. I could tell from his tone and expression that although he wanted to show me what was on it, he was also nervous and uncomfortable. Go ahead, click on it, I said. He obliged. I'll describe what I saw now, but believe me, it's not for the faint of heart. Almost made me lose my damn faith in humanity. The video looked to have been filmed on a phone camera. It was actually several videos, all taken at different times and edited together, like a compilation or highlights reel. It started with a man in the back of a truck. He wore a mask to cover his face. In his hand was a hammer. He's laughing with the guy who's holding the camera, but they were speaking in a language I couldn't understand. It sounded like Russian, but I can't be sure. The vehicle they're traveling in comes to a screeching halt. The masked man quickly opens up the truck's sliding door and jumps out. The cameraman follows closely behind him. Walking alone down some lonely country road was a man, maybe in his early thirties I'd say. He looked shocked and confused as the masked man ran up to him. Before he even realized what was about to happen, the guy with the hammer lifts it up and slams it down on the guy's head. It was as graphic as you can imagine. The unsuspecting guy drops to the ground and starts twitching. There's a big dent in his head, captured by the cameraman. It was all over in seconds, and the masked man and the camera holder quickly jump back inside their truck, which starts driving off immediately. They laugh along with the driver. The video quickly cuts to another scene of the masked man, again jumping out the back of a truck, this time, there was a middle-aged woman walking along some woody country path. The masked man runs up to her at full speed. 
she has time to scream, but nothing more. Before she can even raise her arm to protect herself, she's hit in the head by the hammer. She hits the ground. No movement. The men, again, run back to their vehicle and drive off, laughing and joking. There were seven more clips like that. In each of them, the masked man lunged from the van at some single person who had no idea what was in store for them. He hits them all in the head, and they all drop to the ground, pools of red spurting out of them. The sound of all the thumps from the hammer were enough to make you want to puke. To think that these people just woke up one morning and figured it was just going to be an ordinary day, only for this to happen to them out of the blue, makes you realize how unpredictable life can be when there's maniacs like this out there. Anyway, I don't know exactly what this video was, when it was made, or where it came from, but it seemed to me like a group of madmen who just drove around lonely country roads, looking for innocent people to strike with a hammer. No rhyme or reason to it. I have no idea how it came to be in that abandoned house, nor do I know the fate of all the people in the video. From what I saw, I wouldn't say any of them survived. My friend agreed to call the authorities and give them the USB. As far as I know, nothing's come of it yet. Hope they catch the guy and his accomplices who filmed it and drove him around. My uncle used to run with some bad guys back in the day. Essentially, him and his pals were aspiring Yakuza, hoping to get a slice of the action. One of these guys was called Haru. Now Haru had a taste for the more seedy things in life. If something was considered bad by society standards, then he probably indulged in it regularly. Well, there was one particular place that Haru liked to go in his free time. Let's call it a lady bar. One of the women who worked there was a particular favorite of his. Her name was Miu. Whenever he went to the place, he'd always ask for Miu. In the end, they actually ended up becoming pretty close. So much so, in fact, that Miu started to fall for Haru and his bad boy ways. She was young and naive, I suppose. Not to mention, a little unhinged. That's what Haru used to say anyway, but he liked that about her. Now Miu had a boyfriend, but it wasn't long before she started telling Haru that she wanted to be with him instead. Haru wasn't looking for Mrs. Wright though. He only wanted Mrs. Wright now. No strings attached kind of fun. As such, he flat out told her no. He wanted to keep their relationship strictly business. He was a customer, she a professional. Well, she didn't take kindly to the rejection. One day, Haru went back to the place to see Miu again. He sat down in a private room, and from behind a curtain, Miu appeared. She was brandishing a blade. So ungrateful, she screamed at him. Am I not pretty enough for you? She took the sharp blade and brought it up to her face. She started to drag it down the side of her cheek, slicing it like a thin piece of Kobe beef. How about now? Or well, now? Again, she brought the blade down the side of her face, scraping it along, making long, deep, crimson streaks. She did this over and over, constantly approaching him as he backed away in fear. Soon, her face was almost entirely red. She had lost her damn mind. Haru ran outside and back to his home in shock. The next day, Haru was out with my uncle and a few of his other friends. They were walking down a back alley, minding their own business. When they were at the end of the alleyway, a van pulled up just in front of them. Several large men, dressed like gangsters, hopped out, each of them holding a metal pole as a weapon. So, which one of you morons is Haru? They all looked at each other. Hesitantly, Haru raised his hand. One of the men slammed a metal pole across Haru's legs, bringing him down to his knees in pain. The rest of the men began wailing on him with their poles as he lied on the floor. They struck him over and over. My uncle and his other friends ran back down the alley. 
The men from the van let them run. They weren't there for them. My uncle watched from the other end of the alleyway as Harry was picked up, still half-conscious and screaming, and thrown into the back of the van. The men drove off, taking Haru with them. Like I said before, Miu had a boyfriend. What Haru didn't know was that he was one of the most prominent Yakuza in the area. She had told her boyfriend her version of events, and he sent some of his goons to go and take care of this Haru fella, the guy who'd supposedly messed up his girlfriend's face. Nobody knows for sure what happened to Haru, but rumors started to spread quickly. The most prominent theory was that he was taken to some disused warehouse, tied to a chair, and had his face cut off without the use of any anesthetic. The Yakuza would have seen this as a fitting revenge for something that, in all honesty, wasn't even Haru's fault. Ultimately, nobody knows what they did with him after they threw him in the van, but that was the last time my uncle ever saw Haru. It was also the end of his foolish dream to become a Yakuza. This next entry actually comes from one of my earliest videos, but I've always considered it to be one of my favourite stories, and I've wanted to redo it for a long time. Here it goes. During the midsummer, usually around the middle of July, me and a few of my good friends, Ryan, Kevin and Tommy, always made time to go up to Kev's family cabin, located on Vermilion Lake, way up north in the forests of Minnesota. Throughout all of our young years, we would always be accompanied by Kevin's dad, and sometimes a few of our dads as well. Once we were juniors in high school, however, we felt mature enough to go to the cabin on our own, finally without Kevin's dad or any other adult supervision. My friend's cabin was very remote and very little, based upon a large island. Other cabins were on the island, but the next one closest to us was a solid half mile away at least, and you could only get to it by taking a man-made path around the island. I want to mention that to get to my friend's cabin, you had to park on a gravel road on the opposite side of the island and take his boat across the lake about a half mile. Vermilion Lake is huge. My mind always had a tendency to run around while I was sleeping there. The cabin was all on one level, with only two bedrooms next to one another, a kitchen and living room area connected to them, and a bathroom in the back of the cabin. There was always one window in each of the rooms with no curtains to them at all, so it was very easy to see outside to the woods and lake. And this is where my mind would run, as I always thought about someone peering in. They never were, of course. I had been to the cabin about a dozen times during my lifespan, and nothing bad ever happened there. So the older I got, the easier it was to sleep. Now for the event. On this particular trip, we planned to stay around five nights. On the third night during the trip, when we were finally on our own, we had set up a campfire and had been drinking beers all night. I don't condone underage drinking, but being the rebels we were, we just so happened to sneak some. We went out to the dock to stare up at the magnificent stars and enjoy our buzz, when all of a sudden, we heard something out on the water that sounded like a fish jumping out to catch a bug. We quickly looked over at the lake, wondering where the splash came from, our fishing poles at the ready. Thankfully, the moon was out that night, which lit up the lake. Without it, it would have been pitch black, what with there being no city lights for miles upon miles. Ryan began to point out to something. Um, guys, what the hell's that? After looking closely, and finally spotting what he was pointing at, the only way I can describe it is it simply looked like a head floating out in the middle of the lake, staring at us directly. It was about three quarters worth of a football field out in the lake from the dock. It had long, black hair, and a very pale, skin-like face, but I couldn't make out the eyes, mouth, nose, or chin, as if it was just a blob of pale skin with long black hair over it. I'll never forget that feeling that came over me. The hairs on my legs, neck, and arms all stood up, and I felt paralyzed on the inside, and ready to go home at that moment. 
We told ourselves it was just a loon. Those birds are very popular night drifters on the lake, and they do their hunting late. I mean, it was possible that a loon all of a sudden popped up in the water after hunting for a bit. At least, we tried to convince ourselves of that scenario. All of us had the creeps. That damn thing wasn't moving one bit, just treading water in the same place. We went back to our campfire, lit it even brighter, and headed inside to drink more. We soon forgot about the head-like thing with the help of the beer. That is, until I had to use the bathroom really bad, and the one inside was preoccupied. I went outside to do my business, seeing how we were in the great outdoors. Whilst taking a pee and glancing at the beautiful moonlit lake, I noticed that the black, circular object was still there, but about thirty yards closer now, still looking as if it was staring right up at me. I could easily see the nose on this thing's face. Again, it was very pale, like it hadn't seen the sun for years. A very, very uneasy feeling came over me, and I immediately went back inside and told my friends to come and look. They all came outside to see it still there, looking at us as if the head was corked up and its chin was in the air. Nobody dared go down to the dock anymore, and we immediately went back inside, deciding it probably wasn't a loon. For a loon to stay in the same spot for almost an hour or two made no sense to any of us. This head-like object was stiff as a board and not moving a single muscle, just staring up at us from the deck. And there was no ripple effect from it at all. We said it was just a log and went back inside. I could tell everyone else felt uneasy too. A few hours passed. It was super late into the night at this point, and we all knew we needed sleep. Being my curious self, I looked back outside one last time, and the black object had completely vanished. I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief, thinking the log must have floated off or just hit shore somewhere else. There was no AC in the cabin, and we had to open the windows, or else we'd fry in the middle of summer. Me and Tommy slept in the living room, while my two other friends slept in the two bedrooms with their doors open. Not being able to sleep, but keeping my eyes shut, I began to hear someone walking around outside at the bottom of the stairs to the cabin. I thought I was about to have a heart attack. No question that whoever or whatever I heard down there was on the deck, pacing back and forth, their feet clicking on the wood. It was as if they weren't sure what to do with themselves. It lasted for about three minutes. I wanted to whisper to my buddy, but was frozen in fear. I just kept my eyes shut and my ears on full alert. The footsteps sounded like they took two rapid steps up the deck stairs all of a sudden, but then turned around and sounded like they were sprinting away down the man-made path. After it sounded like the steps were long gone and a couple of minutes had passed, I woke up Tommy and asked him if he'd heard the steps. We both sat up and were startled by Ryan walking out of his room and saying, We need to leave. Now. There was something very disturbing about his expression. I asked him why. He woke up Kevin in the other room. Come on, get to the boat. It's time to go. What? Ryan, what the hell's wrong with you? Kevin asked. Ryan explained to us quickly while grabbing his stuff. I'll never forget what he told us, nor will my other friends. He said that when he was turning sides on his bed to get more comfortable, he saw someone peeking in at the top right corner of the window. The figure quickly shifted out of his view. He said all he saw was one eye, ghostly white skin, and long black hair down the window. When looking back at what he experienced, it chills us to the bone to realize that since this face was in the top right corner of the window in my friend's room, it was either damn near eight foot tall, standing on something like bricks trying to peek in, or was floating. Tommy and I told the others what we had heard outside the cabin, absolutely disturbed the hell out of our minds and feeling like we were going to be sick. We all packed up our stuff and booked it, not cleaning the cabin or anything. We locked up, and as we headed down the stairs, we saw bare footprints in the dirt, heading off along the path and all around the cabin. We picked up our pace, made it to the boat, not knowing what was watching us or around us, threw our stuff in the boat untied it, and sped off. I didn't even think about the head in the water. 
My eyes were just glued to the island, trying to spot anything moving. I saw nothing. When we finally got our stuff packed in the car, we hopped inside and took off. We drove for about ten miles, when, out of the blue, Ryan all of a sudden broke down in the car, sobbing, saying things like, What was it, guys? What was it? Oh god, what did I see? We called to tell our parents what had happened on the way back, told them that Ryan was freaking out. They said to just get home safely and quickly. It was late, about four or five in the morning, but no one slept. It was a very quiet ride home. My friend's dad, who owns the cabin, went up that following weekend. Said he didn't experience anything weird while there, but did mention that the bare footprints were still lingering about. That bugged him badly. What Ryan saw in the window really hit him hard. After his breakdown, he had trouble sleeping for multiple nights, and ended up having to seek help for a couple of weeks and hop on some sleeping medicine. As time went on, he ended up being fine, but isn't too comfortable sleeping next to a window without a curtain. To this day, I can't explain what happened, nor why it seemed to happen to us. Nothing has ever happened at that cabin since that night, so we're told by Kevin's dad at least. I personally have never gone back to the cabin, which really makes me sad, because I have some great childhood memories from there. Tommy and Kevin have both been back and been fine, but Ryan refuses to ever set foot there again, and I'm with him. A lot of people have cabins on that island, so it could have been a prank in the making, and Ryan busted it when he saw the person in the window. It could also have been a person wanting to do something worse to us. I'll never be able to explain what was floating in the lake, but the fact that that incident, along with the footprints and someone looking in at Ryan, all happened in the same night, seems like more than a coincidence to me. This is a rather creepy encounter I had while camping with my older brother a few years back. He's two years older than I am, and this happened when we were in college. I was 20, he was 22. When I was a kid, both me and my older brother were in the Boy Scouts. We dropped out due to our time being taken up by sports and other activities. Nevertheless, we both enjoyed camping a lot, and as we got older, we planned weekend camping trips together. We lived in New Jersey and we were always exploring the Pine Barrens, a one million plus acre pine forest that covers a large area in the south of NJ. Much of it's deserted, with a lot of unmarked dirt roads that crisscross the state. During the summer, people usually go off-roading, mudding, or dirt biking in the backwoods area, which both my brother and I did quite often. There are a number of state parks and campgrounds in the area, plus a few other more shady campgrounds where people squat for the night and make a home for a while. We tried to avoid the non-legit campsites, as there were usually some shady people around there. There are also quite a few abandoned ghost towns and sites here as well. Early 1800 settlements, iron and paper mills. Anyway, I was on this particular camping trip with my brother, and we decided to make a short drive and make a trip out to a few of our favourite ghost towns. This was during our Easter break from college, so we had a long weekend to go and explore. It had been raining the day before, so we didn't really want to venture too deep into the woods. Some of the dirt roads flood easily, and we didn't want to get stranded. We visited two of the towns before the weather started to look like it was going to turn bad again. We decided to find a place to pick up some food, and headed off to a spot called Friendship, one of the old ghost towns. Now it's just open cellar holes where some buildings used to be. This ghost town is about three or four miles off the paved road down a long, narrow dirt road we call Washboard Avenue. We call it that because the ruts in the road make it feel like you're driving over a washboard or rumble strips. The old town is located at an intersection where you can only turn left or right. If you turn right, you cross an old wooden bridge that takes you to the monument, and then back to the main road. If you turn left, you pass the front of the ghost town and go further into the woods. When we arrived at the town, we parked the truck off the side of the road and quickly set up our tents as the rain was starting to come down. After about a half hour, we finally settled into our tent and ate dinner. 
We were sharing stories and catching up on old times for a while. We turned in for the night around 9.30 and both fell asleep very quickly. A few hours later, I heard my brother stirring and I woke up. I had to take a leak, so I got up out of my sleeping bag, unzipped the tent flap and stood up. When I turned to walk across the trail, I looked to my left across the dirt road. There was an opening in the woods, and it looked like there was a figure of a person standing there. It looked like a rather large man, not fat, but tall and big. It looked like he was wearing a black trench coat, black pants, and a black hat. I didn't want to think too much into it since it was dark out there, and I was still half asleep. It could have just been a tree that had fallen, or just something that looked like a person. I stood there, kind of creeped out, finished my business, and went back inside the tent. I took one more look at the figure before I zipped up the tent flap. The figure was still there, and it looked like it was now much further into the road. It was just creepy. As I got back into my sleeping bag, my brother asked me what I was looking at. I told him I saw something across the road that looked strange. What was it? He asked me in a whisper. I don't know. I think it was just a tree stump, but it looks like a person, I whispered back. Jesus, he said. I think I saw that too when I got up to take a leak. I was creeped the hell out. Yeah, me too. It was just standing there, right across the street. Very creepy. It's probably nothing, just our imaginations, he said. We both fell back asleep. Some more time went by, and I was awoken suddenly by the sound of the tent flapping. I thought it was just the wind at first, but as I gained my senses, it seemed too odd of a noise rubbing on the side of the tent. It was as if someone, maybe even two people, were trying to find the zipper to the tent, rubbing their hands up and down the side of it frantically. It creeped the hell out of me. I finally grabbed the flashlight, shined it in the direction of the noise, and saw a pair of hands pressed into the side of the tent from the outside. I let out a loud yell and threw the flashlight, which landed on my brother. He woke up and quickly sat up to see what was going on. As he did, I swear I heard footsteps walking, thudding, but not running away from the tent. What the hell? What's going on? My brother asked me angrily. People. There are people out there. What people? He asked me, still in a daze. There was someone, maybe two people out there. One of them was trying to get into the tent. Okay, just calm down, he told me. Stay here. I'm going to take a look outside and see what's there. Don't move. I want to see too, I told him as I sat up. He could see that I was shaken, and I usually don't make jokes like this. He started unzipping the front flap of the tent, and we both poked our heads out. We looked to the left where the truck was parked. Didn't see anything. Looked ahead to the clearing where the mysterious figure was standing before. Nothing. On the right, also nothing. At least, nothing we could see in the dark. Grab the flashlight, I whispered to him. I want to see what that thing was earlier when I took a leak. My brother went back into the tent, grabbed the flashlight, and turned it on. Where did you see it? He asked. Over there, right in front of us. He flashes the light around the opening in the woods, but there was nothing there, just a few tall trees and a few cinder blocks. Are you sure it was across the street? My brother asked. Yeah, straight out across the road from us. I don't see anything, he says, flashing the light some more. You mean on the other side of the street, near the bridge, right? No, right across from us, I said pointing in the direction. Huh? Really? The figure I saw was on the other side, right next to the bridge, he said. Needless to say, we didn't see anything. After the initial shock wore off, we decided to get out of our tent and look around one last time before going back to sleep. We both got out and slowly walked around the tent, using our flashlights to look for anything out of place. We walked across the road to the opening, then down to the bridge, and finally back to the ghost town, looking into all of the open pits. Didn't see anything. We were both very creeped out at this point. We both got back into our tent and decided to try and sleep, agreeing to leave first thing in the morning. I couldn't sleep. Forty-five minutes passed, just lying awake, 
hearing more rain coming down, hitting the tent, while my brother snored. After twenty minutes passed, the rain slowed down to just a light drizzle. I was just dozing off when I heard the heavy footsteps again. This time, it sounded like they were running. I was freaked out, but trying to play it off like it was just a deer running through the sight. But those footsteps, they were way too heavy. It had to be something larger. I listened for a while. I heard steps, then nothing, then more steps, and nothing, as if people were walking past our tent. Then it got louder. This time, it almost sounded like tap shoes crossing the old wooden bridge nearby. I wasn't taking any chances. I shook my brother awake so he could listen too. He got up and poked his head out of the tent to listen. He said he definitely heard something that sounded like heavy footsteps, almost like whatever it was was trying to lure us out. He grabbed his flashlight and shined it out of the tent, looking across the road, then down to the bridge. All of a sudden, he yells out, Oh God! Oh God! As he dropped the flashlight outside on the ground, he came back into the tent and shuffled through his duffel bag. I grabbed the flashlight. Don't go out there, he told me as he grabbed something from his bag. It was a handgun. Before I knew it, he was firing off shots into the darkness in the direction of the bridge. He ended up firing off all the rounds before he zipped up the tent. What the hell was that? What's out there? I asked. People, he yelled back. Four of them, in black suits. He was almost hyperventilating. That's what I saw. A man in a black suit, just standing there when I went out before. I told him. We both sat there for a good fifteen minutes, trying to process what was happening. Who were these guys? What were they doing there? Why were they screwing with us? Did they follow us? Once we'd calmed down, I wanted to go back out there with the flashlight and see if the guys were still there. Ultimately, we decided to stay in the tent. Needless to say, neither of us slept for the rest of the night, and we packed up as soon as the sun came up. We both got out of the tent at the same time once it was bright enough. There were no footsteps in the dirt, no handprints on the tent, no sign of the men in black near the bridge, or anywhere for that matter. We packed up as quickly as we could. As my brother closed the back of his truck, I looked into the clearing and saw something black on a stack of old cinder blocks. It could have been a hat or one of the trench coats, one that those men were wearing. I didn't know, and I didn't want to know. We got into the truck and sped off. We didn't say much the whole ride home. I was too freaked out to even ask where he got the handgun, or why he brought it with him in the first place. Both of us haven't spoken about this event since, not to each other and not to anyone else. That is, until now. All the way back in 1989, I was on a round-the-world trip. I'd been traveling through Australia, Southeast Asia, and China. To get back to Europe, I decided to take the Trans-Siberian Railway through Mongolia, and also what was then the Soviet Union. In pre-internet days, and with China and the Soviet Union not exactly tourist-friendly countries at the time, this wasn't a super easy thing to do. I had to organize all of my own visas, train tickets, and everything. When I got to Beijing, the hotel I stayed at had free lone bicycles. I grabbed one and made my way around the city to try and find the Mongolian embassy to get my visa. There was only one train running each week, so I was desperate to get this organized as soon as possible. Partially because I was low on money, but I was also quite homesick by now. I'd already gotten a train ticket and a Soviet visa in Hong Kong, but I still needed that visa for Mongolia. Again, this was in pre-internet pre-Google Maps days. I had a street map, but just couldn't find that bloody embassy. At long last, I got lucky and found it, but by then, they were just shutting the gates. Business hours were already over for the day. It was only 3pm. If I couldn't get a visa, I'd not be able to get on that week's train. My train ticket would be worthless, and I'd have to wait a full week for the next train. Plus, I'd need to get a new Soviet visa too. So pleaded with the guard. Eventually, he relented and let me in. 
there was still someone in the office, and because they were keen to finish off for the day, they pretty much just put the sticker on my passport and shuffled me out the door. All set, I got on the train the next day and had an amazing time, going through Mongolia, the Soviet Union, even spent a few days in Moscow, and then headed via Finland and Scandinavia back home. The week after I'd been on the Trans-Siberian train, this happened. A massive gas explosion caused by a leaking gas pipeline and triggered by a passing train killed over 500 people. If the Mongolian embassy guard hadn't let me through, I definitely would have ended up being on that train. This one isn't for the weak of stomach amongst you. I'll describe the incident and all its details, but be warned, this wasn't a pretty sight. A few years back, I worked as a first responder out in Oklahoma. A call came through one night about a traffic incident, a hit and run. Apparently, a cyclist had been struck by a vehicle, and things looked pretty bad. Somebody had seen the whole thing and called it in, but said it was probably too late already for the guy. If it wasn't, then it would be real soon. They were doing what they could at the scene. We rushed to their location, knowing that time was of the essence. We came down a quiet country road, trees lining both sides, and sure enough, up ahead in our headlights, we could see two distressed people and a third person lying in the road by a mangled bicycle. I rushed out to help, but instantly I knew the guy in the road was gone. He wasn't wearing a helmet, and blood and brain juices had leaked out all over the road. His limbs were broken and contorted at unnatural angles. There was a long smear of dark red where his torso had slid along the ground, turning the front of his shirt into a bloody rag and completely tearing off all the skin on his body and face. He must have been hit at some speed. I knelt down to see what I could do though it was obvious to both me and my partner that this was not a survivable accident. I checked for a pulse, just to be sure, but really this was all just procedure. Just as everyone expected, I couldn't find a pulse. I got up to face my partner, who was doing his best to calm the two people who had stopped to help. My back was to the man lying lifeless in the road. I told my partner that there was nothing we could do for the guy, even though I'm sure he already knew that. He says something back to me, but mid-sentence, he abruptly stopped talking. His eyes got real large, as if he had just had the shock of his life. He was looking at something behind me. I turned to look too. Standing there was the injured man, though I have no idea how he was still breathing or able to stand. His head was split open, his face was gone, it was all just red. The only thing distinguishing him as human were the two wide, white eyes. They were filled with confusion and fear. Before anyone had a chance to help him or even speak to him, the injured man ran off the road into the woods at full speed. We couldn't catch up with him. We called the incident in, and a search for the injured man got underway immediately. They never found him. His body was never discovered in the woods, and never has been. He was never reported by any of the hospitals. Nobody in the local community said that they'd seen a severely injured man running around town. For all intents and purposes, he simply vanished somewhere in those woods. Judging by his injuries, there was no way he could have gotten far. Still, he was never seen again. Never reported missing by his family, wherever they were. I know this must all have a logical explanation, and the man just ran off because he was dazed and confused from his injuries. Still, to this day, I have no idea where he went, where his body disappeared off to, or why he was never found. The fact that he was able to regain consciousness and run after the damage he sustained defies belief. And then again, adrenaline's a hell of a thing. Gave me the shock of my life.
This story takes place in Wilmington, Delaware. I'll start by saying I'm a female. At the time, I was 26 years old, and I lived by myself in a small house. My boyfriend had just dumped me, and left me stranded paying all the rent. As such, I had to moonlight at a bar a few nights a week just to pay the bills. The bar itself was pretty great, definitely a job worth doing while you're still young. Most of our customers were just friendly Wilmington people, but occasionally you get the odd creep or drunk ruffian. Drink can bring out the devil in some folks. There was this one customer who seemed to come in every time I had a shift. A man in his mid-forties, stood around six foot one I'd say, went by the name of Dennis. He had a handsome face, but it was all wrinkled, and his obviously once athletic body was now a bit out of shape. He had a small beer belly and dark bags under his eyes, drove an old, once white van, the colour of which had obviously faded over the years and turned cream. Always parked it right outside. I figured I knew this guy's story pretty well. Probably a bit of a lady killer back in his youth, but was now past his prime and couldn't get over it. Didn't know any other way to live. While all his old buddies that he used to party with got older and settled down, he never got out of the cycle. Kept on partying half the week. Some people can never let the past go. Dennis would always sit at the counter and chat with me. I worked there, and it was part of my job to be nice to the customers, so I of course let him. The first few times he talked to me, he seemed really friendly and a nice guy. As time went on though, he became a little more... creepy. He started making uncomfortable remarks, and would grab at me inappropriately. I never made a big deal out of it, but made it clear that he couldn't do what he was doing. He always smiled and apologized, vowing to never do anything weird again. He never kept those promises. One night after closing time, I was walking back home by myself. It was dark, and the streets were empty. Plenty of side alleys lined the path that I was walking down. I only lived about ten minutes away, so I wasn't too unnerved about traveling home alone. As I made my way down the dimly lit streets, I realized I could hear footsteps behind me. I looked over my shoulder, and, sure enough, there was Dennis, keeping pace with me, with his hands in his pockets. I picked up my pace, and he picked up his. It was obvious he wasn't just keeping pace with me now, he was actively gaining on me. What his intentions were, I didn't know. I began sprinting down the road, with Dennis hot on my heels. I turned the corner, and lucked out. Another passerby. I ran quickly over to them, and Dennis turned down one of the side alleys and disappeared. I told my manager about it the next time I had a shift at the bar. Dennis wasn't allowed back in after that. My next door neighbor, Jim, just so happened to be a police officer. He was a real nice guy, still is, and we sometimes chatted outside our houses when we met each other at the front doors. When I saw him outside his place one day, I happened to mention my new bar job. I ended up telling him all about my creepy customer, Dennis. Sounds like a loser, Jim said. You gotta shut guys like that down real quick. Make sure they get the message. Otherwise, they might never leave you alone. Yeah, I told him. I'm starting to get that now. He really spooked me, though. I just didn't want to be rude to customers since I'd just started working at the bar. I really need that job, you know. Well, I'm sure he gets the message now. I'll keep an eye out for you just in case. We said our goodbyes, and I headed back inside my house to enjoy another lonely evening in front of the TV. About two weeks went by. I, of course, hadn't seen Dennis at the bar in all that time, seeing how he was banned from entering. I'd just finished a late night shift, and I'd made it back to my place safe and sound. I went inside, threw on my jammies, and hopped into bed. I'd had a couple of drinks while chatting with some customers there, so I drifted off to sleep pretty quickly. Next thing I knew, I was awoken by a loud commotion in my hallway, just outside my bedroom. It sounded like fighting. After honing my ears for a moment, I snapped out of my sleepy haze and jumped out of bed. I ran out into the hallway. It was my neighbor, Jim. Underneath him was Dennis. Jim was pinning him down on the floor. Call the police, now, Jim shouted. I didn't stop to ask questions. I just did as he told me. 
You see, Dennis had broken into my home while I was asleep that night. He had used a quiet, glass-cutting tool on one of my downstairs windows. And that's how he had entered the place. He had brought a sort of club with him, and a chloroformed rag was found in his pocket. My neighbor Jim just so happened to be awake late that night. He noticed a cream-colored van outside my house, which he had never seen before. I never usually have visitors over, especially not that late at night. Remembering the story I'd told him, Jim became suspicious and wanted to make sure everything was okay. He checked the perimeter of my house and found that one of the windows had been breached. He climbed in after Dennis and caught him off guard. Thanks to his training, he was able to overpower Dennis. They searched the van outside my house. In the back was a mattress, along with four sets of handcuffs to restrain my limbs. Dennis wanted to drag me out to that van, and he didn't want any kind of screaming or resistance. You can guess his intentions. What I don't like to think about is where he was planning on taking me, or what he planned to do with me once he was finished. In all likelihood, the only reason I'm here to retell this story is because I happen to live next to a policeman, and that I also happen to tell him about Dennis and his van. The best things happen in the dark.